Casanova at Dux, from the introduction to the memoirs of Jacques Casanova, volume one, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Icy Jumbo. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, volume one. THE VENETIAN YEARS by Giacomo Casanova Casanova at Dux An Unpublished Chapter of History by Arthur Simons Part 1 The memoirs of Casanova, though they have enjoyed the popularity of a bad reputation, have never had justice done to them by serious students of literature, of life, and of history. One English writer, indeed, Mr. Havelock Ellis, has realised that there are few more delightful books in the world, and he has analysed them in an essay on Casanova, published in Affirmations, with extreme care and remarkable subtlety. But this essay stands alone, at all events in English, as an attempt to take Casanova seriously, to show him in his relation to his time and in his relation to human problems. And yet these memoirs are perhaps the most valuable document which we possess on the society of the eighteenth century. They are the history of a unique life, a unique personality, one of the greatest of autobiographies. As a record of adventures, they are more entertaining than Gil Blas, or Monte Cristo, or any of the imaginary travels and escapes and masquerades in life which have been written in imitation of them. They tell the story of a man who loved life passionately for its own sake, one to whom woman was, indeed, the most important thing in the world, but to whom nothing in the world was indifferent. The bust which gives us the most lively notion of him shows us a great, vivid, intellectual face, full of fiery energy and calm resource, the face of a thinker and a fighter in one. A scholar, an adventurer, perhaps a cabalist, a busy stirrer in politics, a gamester, one born of the fairer sex, as he tells us, and born also to be a vagabond. This man, who is remembered now for his written account of his own life, was that rarest kind of autobiographer, one who did not live to write, but wrote because he had lived, and when he could live no longer and his memoirs take one all over Europe, giving sidelights, all the more valuable in being almost accidental, upon many of the affairs and people most interesting to us during two-thirds of the eighteenth century. Giacomo Casanova was born in Venice, of Spanish and Italian parentage, on April the 2nd, 1725. He died at the Chateau of Dux, in Bohemia, on June the 4th, 1798. In that lifetime of seventy-three years, he travelled, as his memoirs show us, in Italy, France, Germany, Austria, England, Switzerland, Belgium, Russia, Poland, Spain, Holland, Turkey. He met Voltaire at Ferney, Rousseau at Montmorency, Fontenelle, d'Alembert and Crébillon at Paris, George the Third in London, Louis the Fifteenth at Fontainebleau, Catherine the Great at St. Petersburg, Benedict the Twelfth at Rome, Joseph the Second at Vienna, Frederick the Great at Saint Souci. Imprisoned by the Inquisitors of State in the Piombi at Venice, he made in 1755 the most famous escape in history. His memoirs, as we have them, break off abruptly at the moment when he is expecting a safe conduct and the permission to return to Venice after twenty years' wanderings. He did return, as we know from documents in the Venetian archives. He returned as secret agent of the Inquisitors, and remained in their service from 1774 until 1782. At the end of 1782 he left Venice, and next year we find him in Paris, where, in 1784, he met Count Waldstein at the Venetian ambassadors, 
and was invited by him to become his librarian at Dux. He accepted, and for the fourteen remaining years of his life lived at Dux, where he wrote his memoirs. Casanova died in 1798, but nothing was heard of the memoirs, which the Prince de Ligne, in his own memoirs, tells us that Casanova had read to him, and in which he found du diématique, de la rapidité, du comique, de la philosophie, des choses neuves, sublimes, inimitables même, until the year 1820, when a certain Carlo Angiolini brought to the publishing house of Brockhaus, in Leipzig, a manuscript entitled Histoire de ma vie jusqu'à l'an 1797, in the handwriting of Casanova. This manuscript, which I have examined at Leipzig, is written on full-scat paper, rather rough and yellow. It is written on both sides of the page, and in sheets or quires. Here and there the paging shows that some pages have been omitted, and in their place are smaller sheets of thinner and whiter paper, all in Casanova's handsome, unmistakable handwriting. The manuscript is done up in twelve bundles, corresponding with the twelve volumes of the original edition, and only in one place is there a gap. The fourth and fifth chapters of the twelfth volume are missing, as the editor of the original edition points out, adding, It is not probable that these two chapters have been withdrawn from the manuscript of Casanova by a strange hand. Everything leads us to believe that the author himself suppressed them, in the intention, no doubt, of rewriting them, but without having found time to do so. The manuscript ends abruptly with the year 1774, and not with the year 1797, as the title would lead us to suppose. This manuscript, in its original state, has never been printed. Herr Brockhaus, on obtaining possession of the manuscript, had it translated into German by Wilhelm Schutz, but with many omissions and alterations, and published this translation, volume by volume, from 1822 to 1828, under the title Aus den Memoiren des Venetianes Jakob Casanova de Seingalt. While the German edition was in course of publication, Herr Brockhaus employed a certain Jean Laforgue, a professor of the French language at Dresden, to revise the original manuscript, correcting Casanova's vigorous, but at times incorrect and somewhat Italian, French, according to his own notions of elegant writing, suppressing passages which seemed too free-spoken from the point of view of morals and of politics, and altering the names of some of the persons referred to, or replacing those names by initials. This revised text was published in twelve volumes, the first two in 1826, the third and fourth in 1828, the fifth to the eighth in 1832, and the ninth to the twelfth in 1837, the first four bearing the imprint of Brockhaus at Leipzig and Pontieu Essy at Paris, the next four the imprint of Heideloff et Camp at Paris, and the last four nothing but à Bruxelles. The volumes are all uniform, and were all really printed for the firm of Brockhaus. This, however far from representing the real text, is the only authoritative edition, and my references throughout this article will always be to this edition. In turning over the manuscript at Leipzig, I read some of the suppressed passages, and regretted their suppression. But Herr Brockhaus, the present head of the firm, assured me that they are not really very considerable in number. The damage, however, to the vivacity of the whole narrative, by the persistent alterations of Monsieur Laforgue, is incalculable. I compared many passages, and found scarcely three consecutive sentences untouched. Herr Brockhaus, whose courtesy I cannot sufficiently acknowledge, was kind enough to have a passage copied out for me, which I afterwards read over, and checked word by word. In this passage, Casanova says, for instance, « Elle venoua presque tous les jours lui faire une belle visite. » This is altered into 
Cependant, chaque jour, Thérèse venait lui faire une visite. Casanova says that someone avoua comme de raison forme le projet d'allier Dieu avec le diable. This is made to read, qui, comme de raison, avait sentiment formé le projet d'allier les intérêts du ciel aux œuvres de ce monde. Casanova tells us that Thérèse would not commit a mortal sin pour devenir reine du monde, pour une couronne, correct the indefatigable Lafogue. Il ne savoit que lui dire becomes dans cet état de perplexité, and so forth. It must, therefore, be realized that the memoirs, as we have them, are only a kind of pale tracing of the vivid colors of the original. When Casanova's memoirs were first published, doubts were expressed as to their authenticity, first by Hugo Foscolo in the Westminster Review, 1827, then by Kera, supposed to be an authority in regard to anonymous and pseudonymous writings, finally by Paul Lacroix, le bibliophile Jacob, who suggested, or rather expressed, his certainty that the real author of the memoirs was Stondhal, whose mind, character, ideas and style he seemed to recognise on every page. This theory, as foolish and as unsupported as the Baconian theory of Shakespeare, has been carelessly accepted, or at all events accepted as possible, by many good scholars who have never taken the trouble to look into the matter for themselves. It was finally disproved by a series of articles of Armand Bachet, entitled Preuve curieuse de l'authenticité des mémoires de Jacques Casanova de Saint-Galt, in Le Livre, January, February, April and May 1881, and these proofs were further corroborated by two articles of Alessandro d'Ancona, entitled Un avventuriere del secolo XVIII, in the Nuovo Antologia, February the 1st and August the 1st, 1882. Bachet had never himself seen the manuscript of the memoir, but he had learnt all the facts about it from Messrs. Brockhouse, and he had himself examined the numerous papers relating to Casanova in the Venetian archives. A similar examination was made at the Frari at the same time by the Abbe Fulin, and I myself, in 1894, not knowing at the time that the discovery had been already made, made it over again for myself. There the arrest of Casanova, his imprisonment in the Piombi, the exact date of his escape, the name of the monk who accompanied him, are all authenticated by documents contained in the Riferte of the Inquisition of State. There are the bills for the repairs of the roof and walls of the cell from which he escaped, there are the reports of spies on whose information he was arrested for his too dangerous free-spokenness in matters of religion and morality. The same archives contain 48 letters of Casanova to the Inquisitors of State, dating from 1763 to 1782, among the Riferte dei Confidenti, or the reports of the secret agents, the earliest asking permission to return to Venice, the rest giving information in regard to the immoralities of the city after his return there, all in the same handwriting as the memoirs. Further proof could scarcely be needed, but Bachet has done more than prove the authenticity. He has proved the extraordinary veracity of the memoirs. F. W. Bartold, in Die Geschichtlichen Personlichkeiten in J. Casanova's Memoiren, two volumes, 1846, had already examined about a hundred of Casanova's allusions to well-known people, showing the perfect exactitude of all but six or seven, and out of these six or seven inexactitudes ascribing only a single one to the author's intention. Bachet and Ancona both carry on what Barthold had begun— other investigators in France, Italy, and Germany have followed them, and two things are now certain. 
first that Casanova himself wrote the memoirs published under his name, though not textually in the precise form in which we have them, and second that as their veracity becomes more and more evident, they are confronted with more and more independent witnesses. It is only fair to suppose that they are equally truthful where the facts are such as could only have been known to Casanova himself. Section 2 For more than two-thirds of a century, it has been known that Casanova spent the last fourteen years of his life at Dux, that he wrote his memoirs there, and that he died there. During all this time people have been discussing the authenticity and the truthfulness of the memoirs, they have been searching for information about Casanova in various directions, and yet hardly anyone has ever taken the trouble, or obtained the permission, to make a careful examination in precisely the one place where information was most likely to be found. The very existence of the manuscripts at Dux was known only to a few, and to most of these only on hearsay and thus the singular good fortune was reserved for me on my visit to Count Waldstein in September 1899 to be the first to discover the most interesting things contained in these manuscripts. Monsieur Octave Utzan, though he had not himself visited Dux, had indeed procured copies of some of the manuscripts, a few of which were published by him in Le Livre in 1887 and 1889. But with the death of Le Livre in 1889, the Casanova Inédit became to an end, and has never, so far as I know, been continued elsewhere. Beyond the publication of these fragments, nothing has been done with the manuscripts at Dux, nor has an account of them ever been given by anyone who has been allowed to examine them. For five years, ever since I had discovered the documents in the Venetian archives, I had wanted to go to Dux, and in 1899, when I was staying with Count Lutzau at Zampach in Bohemia, I found the way kindly opened for me. Count Waldstein, the present head of the family, with extreme courtesy, put all his manuscripts at my disposal, and invited me to stay with him. Unluckily, he was called away on the morning of the day that I reached Dux. He had left everything ready for me, and I was shown over the castle by a friend of his, Dr. Kittel, whose courtesy I should like also to acknowledge. After a hurried visit to the castle, we started on the long drive to Oberleutensdorf, a smaller schloss near Komotau, where the Waldstein family was then staying. The air was sharp and bracing. The two Russian horses flew like the wind. I was whirled along in an unfamiliar darkness, through a strange country, black with coal mines, through dark pine woods, where a wild peasantry dwelt in little mining towns. Here and there a few men and women passed us on the road, in their Sunday finery, then a long space of silence, and we were in the open country, galloping between broad fields, and always in a haze of lovely hills, which I saw more distinctly as we drove back next morning. The return to Dux was like a triumphal entry, as we dashed through the market-place filled with people come for the Monday market, pots and pans and vegetables strewn in heaps all over the ground, on the rough paving stones, up to the great gateway of the castle, leaving but just room for us to drive through their midst. I had the sensation of an enormous building. All Bohemian castles are big, but this one was like a royal palace. Set there, in the midst of the town, after the Bohemian fashion, it opens at the back upon great gardens, as if it were in the midst of the country. I walked through room after room, along corridor after corridor. Everywhere there were pictures, everywhere portraits of Wallenstein and battle scenes in which he led on his troops. The library, which was formed, or at least arranged by Casanova, and which remains as he left it, contained some 25,000 volumes, some of them of considerable value. One of the most famous books in Bohemian literature, 
Scala's History of the Church, exists in manuscript at Dux, and it is from this manuscript that the two published volumes of it were printed. The library forms part of the museum, which occupies a ground-floor wing of the castle. The first room is an armory, in which all kinds of arms are arranged in a decorative way, covering the ceiling and the walls with strange patterns. The second room contains pottery, collected by Casanova's Waldstein on his eastern travels. The third room is full of curious mechanical toys and cabinets and carvings in ivory. Finally, we come to the library, contained in the two innermost rooms. The bookshelves are painted white and reach to the low-vaulted ceilings, which are whitewashed. At the end of a bookcase, in the corner of one of the windows, hangs a fine engraved portrait of Casanova. After I had been all over the castle, so long Casanova's home, I was taken to Count Waldstein's study, and left there with the manuscripts. I found six huge cardboard cases, large enough to contain foolscap paper, lettered on the back, Grafle Waldstein Wartenbergische Real Fideikommiss Dux Oberleutensdorf Handschriftlicher Nachlass Casanova. The cases were arranged so as to stand like books. They opened at the side, and on opening them, one after another, I found series after series of manuscripts, roughly thrown together, after some pretense at arrangement, and lettered with a very generalised description of contents. The greater part of the manuscripts were in Casanova's handwriting, which I could see gradually beginning to get shaky with years. Most were written in French, a certain number in Italian. The beginning of a catalogue in the library, though said to be by him, was not in his handwriting. Perhaps it was taken down at his dictation. There were also some copies of Italian and Latin poems not written by him. Then there were many big bundles of letters addressed to him, dating over more than thirty years. Almost all the rest was in his own handwriting. I came first upon the smaller manuscripts, among which I found, jumbled together on the same and on separate scraps of paper, washing bills, accounts, hotel bills, lists of letters written, first drafts of letters with many erasures, notes on books, theological and mathematical notes, sums, Latin quotations, French and Italian verses with variants, a long list of classical names which have and have not been francisé, with reasons for and against, what I must wear at Dresden. Headings without anything to follow, such as Reflections on Respiration on the True Cause of Youth, the Crows. A new method of winning the lottery at Rome. Recipes, among which is a long printed list of perfumes sold at Spa. A newspaper cutting, dated Prague, 25th October, 1790, on the 37th balloon ascent of Blanchard. Thanks to some noble donor for the gift of a dog called Finette. A passport for Monsieur de Casanova, Venetian, allant d'ici en Hollande, October 13th, 1758. Ce passeport bon pour quinze jours together with an order for post-horses, gratis, from Paris to Bordeaux and Bayonne. Occasionally one gets a glimpse into his daily life at Dux, as in this note, scribbled on a fragment of paper. Here, and always, I translate the French literally. I beg you to tell my servant what the biscuits are that I like to eat, dipped in wine to fortify my stomach. I believe that they can all be found at Romans. Usually, however, these notes, though often suggested by something closely personal, branch off into more general considerations, or else begin with general considerations and end with a case in point. Thus, for instance, a fragment of three pages begins, A compliment which is only made to gild the pill is a positive impertinence and Monsieur Bailly is nothing but a charlatan. The monarch ought to have spit in his face, but the monarch trembled with fear. 
a manuscript entitled Essai d'Egoisme, dated Dux, this 27th June, 1769, contains in the midst of various reflections an offer to let his appartement in return for enough money to tranquilize for six months two Jew creditors at Prague. Another manuscript is headed Pride and Folly, and begins with a long series of antitheses such as All fools are not proud, and all proud men are fools. Many fools are happy, all proud men are unhappy. On the same sheet follows this instance or application. Whether it is possible to compose a Latin distich of the greatest beauty without knowing either the Latin language or prosody, we must examine the possibility and the impossibility, and afterwards see who is the man who says he is the author of the distich, for there are extraordinary people in the world. My brother, in short, ought to have composed the distich, because he says so, and because he confided it to me tete-a-tete. -tete. I had, it is true, difficulty in believing him, but what is one to do? Either one must believe, or suppose him capable of telling a lie which could only be told by a fool, and that is impossible, for all Europe knows that my brother is not a fool. Here, as so often in these manuscripts, we seem to see Casanova thinking on paper. He uses scraps of paper, sometimes the blank page of a letter, on the other side of which we see the address, as a kind of informal diary, and it is characteristic of him, of the man of infinitely curious mind, which this adventurer really was, that there are so few merely personal notes among these casual jottings. Often they are purely abstract, at times metaphysical jeu d'esprit, like the sheet of fourteen different wagers which begins, I wager that it is not true that a man who weighs a hundred pounds will weigh more if you kill him. I wager that if there is any difference he will weigh less. I wager that diamond powder has not sufficient force to kill a man. Side by side with these fanciful excursions into science come more serious ones, as in the note on algebra which traces its progress since the year 1494, before which it had only arrived at the solution of problems of the second degree inclusive. A scrap of paper tells us that Casanova did not like regular towns. I like, he says, Venice, Rome, Florence, Milan, Constantinople, Genoa. Then he becomes abstract and inquisitive again, and writes two pages full of curious out-of-the-way learning on the name of Paradise. The name of Paradise is a name in Genesis which indicates a place of pleasure, lieu voluptueux. This term is Persian. This place of pleasure was made by God before he had created man. It may be remembered that Casanova quarrelled with Voltaire, because Voltaire had told him frankly that his translation of L'Ecossaise was a bad translation. It is piquant to read another note written in this style of righteous indignation. Voltaire, the hardy Voltaire, whose pen is without bit or bridle. Voltaire, who devoured the Bible, and ridiculed our dogmas, doubts, and after having made proselytes to impiety, is not ashamed, being reduced to the extremity of life, to ask for the sacraments, and to cover his body with more relics than Saint Louis had at Amboise. Here is an argument more in keeping with the tone of the memoirs. A girl who is pretty and good, and as virtuous as you please, ought not to take it ill that a man, carried away by her charms, should set himself to the task of making their conquest. If this man cannot please her by any means, even if his passion be criminal, she ought never to take offence at it, nor treat him unkindly. She ought to be gentle and pity him, if she does not love him, and think it enough to keep invincibly hold upon her own duty. Occasionally he touches upon aesthetical matters, as in a fragment which begins with this liberal definition of beauty. Harmony makes beauty, says Monsieur de S. P. Bernardin de Saint-Pierre, 
But the definition is too short, if he thinks he has said everything. Here is mine. Remember that the subject is metaphysical. An object really beautiful ought to seem beautiful to all whose eyes fall upon it. That is all. There is nothing more to be said. At times we have an anecdote and its commentary, perhaps jotted down for use in that latter part of the memoirs which was never written, or which has been lost. Here is a single sheet dated this 2nd September 1791, and headed Souvenir. The Prince de Rosenberg said to me, as we went downstairs, that Madame de Rosenberg was dead, and asked me if the Comte de Waldstein had in the library the illustration of the Villa d'Altichiero, which the Emperor had asked for in vain at the city library of Prague, and when I answered yes, he gave an equivocal laugh. A moment afterwards he asked me if he might tell the Emperor. Why not, Monseigneur? It is not a secret. Is His Majesty coming to Dux? If he goes to the Oberleitensdorf, sick, he will go to Dux too, and he may ask you for it, for there is a monument there which relates to him when he was Grand Duke. In that case, His Majesty can also see my critical remarks on the Egyptian prince. The Emperor asked me this morning, 6th of October, how I employed my time at Dux, and I told him that I was making an Italian anthology. You have all the Italians, then? All, sire. See what a lie leads to. If I had not lied in saying that I was making an anthology, I should not have found myself obliged to lie again in saying that we have all the Italian poets. If the Emperor comes to Dux, I shall kill myself. They say that this Dux is a delightful spot, says Casanova, in one of the most personal of his notes, and I see that it might be for many, but not for me, for what delights me in my old age is independent of the place which I inhabit. When I do not sleep, I dream, and when I am tired of dreaming, I blacken paper, then I read, and most often reject all that my pen has vomited. Here we see him blackening paper on every occasion and for every purpose. In one bundle I found an unfinished story about Roland, and some adventure with women in a cave, then a meditation on arising from sleep, 19th of May, 1789, then a short reflection of a philosopher who finds himself thinking of procuring his own death. At Dux, on getting out of bed, on 13th October, 1793, day dedicated to St. Lucy, memorable in my too long life. A big budget, containing cryptograms, is headed Grammatical Lottery, and there is the title page of a treatise on the duplication of the hexahedron, demonstrated geometrically to all the universities and all the academies of Europe. See Charles Henry, Les Connaissances Mathématiques de Casanova, Rome, 1883. There are innumerable verses, French and Italian, in all stages, occasionally attaining the finality of these lines, which appear in half a dozen tentative forms. Sans mystère, point de plaisir, sans silence, point de mystère, charme divin de mes loisirs, solitude, que tu m'es cher. Then there are a number of more or less complete manuscripts of some extent, there is the manuscript of the translation of Homer's Iliad, Inota Varima, published in Venice, 1775-8, to of the Histoire de Venise, of the Icosomeron, a curious book published in 1787, purporting to be translated from the English, but really an original work of Casanova. Philocali sur les sorties des mortels a long manuscript never published, the sketch and beginning of Le Polmark ou la calomnie démasquée par la présence d'esprit, tragicomédie en trois actes, composée à Dux dans le mois de juin de l'année 1791, 
which recurs again under the form of the polemoscope, la lorgnette monteuse, ou la calomnie démasquée, acted before the princesse de Ligne at her chateau at Tuplitz, 1791. There is a treatise in Italian, Delle Passioni. There are long dialogues, such as Le Philosophe et le Théologien, and Rêve, Dieu moi. There is the Songe d'un quart d'heure, divided into minutes. There is the very lengthy criticism of Bernardin de Saint-Pierre. There is the Confutation d'une censure indiscrète qu'on lit dans la Gazette de Jena, 19 juin 1789. With another large manuscript, unfortunately imperfect, first called L'Insulte, and then Placé au public, dated Dux, the 2nd of March, 1790, referring to the same criticism on the Icosomeron and the Fuite des prisons, l'histoire de ma fuite des prisons de la République de Venise, qu'on appelle les plombes, which is the first draft of the most famous part of the memoirs, and was published at Leipzig in 1788, and, having read it in the Marcian Library at Venice, I am not surprised to learn from this indignant document that it was printed under the care of a young Swiss who had the talent to commit a hundred faults of orthography. Section 3 We now come to the documents directly relating to the memoirs, and among these are several attempts at a preface, in which we see the actual preface coming gradually into form. One is entitled Casanova au lecteur, another Histoire de mon existence, and a third Preface. There is also a brief and characteristic Précis de ma vie, dated November the 17th, 1797. Some of these have been printed in Le Livre, 1887. But by far the most important manuscript that I discovered, one which, apparently, I am the first to discover, is a manuscript entitled Extrait du chapitre 4 et 5. It is written on paper similar to that on which the memoirs are written. The pages are numbered 104 to 148, and though it is described as extrait, it seems to contain, at all events, the greater part of the missing chapters to which I have already referred, chapters 4 and 5 of the last volume of the memoirs. In this manuscript we find Armeline and Scholastica, whose story is interrupted by the abrupt ending of chapter 3. We find Mariuccia of volume 7, chapter 9, who married a hairdresser, and we find also Jaconine, whom Casanova recognises as his daughter, much prettier than Sophia, the daughter of Therese Pompiati, whom I had left at London. It is curious that this very important manuscript, which supplies the one missing link in the memoirs, should never have been discovered by any of the very few people who have had the opportunity of looking over the Dux manuscripts. I am inclined to explain it by the fact that the case in which I found this manuscript contains some papers not relating to Casanova. Probably, those who looked into this case looked no further. I have told Herr Brockhaus of my discovery, and I hope to see chapters 4 and 5 in their places when the long-looked-for edition of the complete text is at length given to the world. Another manuscript which I found tells with great piquancy the whole story of the Abbé de Brosse's ointment, the curing of the Princess de Conti's pimples, and the birth of the Duc de Montpensier, which is told very briefly and with much less point, in the Memoirs, Volume 3, page 327. Readers of the Memoirs will remember the duel at Warsaw with Count Branicki in 1766, Volume 10, pages 274 to 320, an affair which attracted a good deal of attention at the time, 
and of which there is an account in a letter from the Abbe Taruffi to the dramatist Francesco Alberati, dated Warsaw, March the 19th, 1766, quoted in Ernesto Masi's Life of Alberati, Bologna, 1878. A manuscript at Dux in Casanova's handwriting gives an account of this duel in the third person. It is entitled Description de l'affaire arrivée à Varsovie le 5 mars 1766. D'Ancona, in the Nuova Antologia, volume 67, page 412, referring to the Abbe Taruffi's account, mentions what he considers to be a slight discrepancy, that Taruffi refers to the danseurs about whom the duel was fought as la Casacci, while Casanova refers to as la Catai. In this manuscript, Casanova always refers to her as la Casacci. La Catai is evidently one of Monsieur Lafogue's arbitrary alterations of the text. In turning over another manuscript, I was caught by the name Charpillon, which every reader of the memoirs will remember as the name of the harpy by whom Casanova suffered so much in London in 1763-4. to This manuscript begins by saying, I have been in London for six months, and have been to see them, that is, the mother and daughter, in their own house, where he finds nothing but swindlers who cause all who go there to lose their money in gambling. This manuscript adds some details to the story told in the ninth and tenth volumes of the memoirs, and refers to the meeting with the Charpillon four and a half years before, described in volume five, pages 428 to 485. It is written in a tone of great indignation. Elsewhere, I found a letter written by Casanova, but not signed, referring to an anonymous letter which he had received in reference to the Charpillon, and ending, My handwriting is known. It was not until the last that I came upon great bundles of letters addressed to Casanova, and so carefully preserved that little scraps of paper, on which postscripts are written, are still in their places. One sees the seals on the backs of many of the letters, on paper which has slightly yellowed with age, leaving the ink, however, almost always fresh. They come from Venice, Paris, Rome, Prague, Bayreuth, The Hague, Genoa, Fiume, Trieste, etc., and are addressed to as many places, often post restante. Many are letters from women, some in beautiful handwriting, on thick paper, others on scraps of paper, in painful hands, ill-spelt. A countess writes pitifully, imploring help. One protests her love, in spite of the many chagrin he has caused her. Another asks how they are to live together. And another laments that a report has gone about that she is secretly living with him, which may harm his reputation. Some are in French, more in Italian. Mon cher Giacometto, writes one woman in French, Carissimo a Amatissimo, writes another, in Italian. These letters from women are in some confusion, and are in need of a good deal of sorting over and rearranging before their full extent can be realised. Thus I found letters in the same handwriting, separated by letters in other handwritings. Many are unsigned, or signed only by a single initial. Many are undated, or dated only with the day of the week or month. There are a great many letters, dating from 1779 to 1786, signed Francesca Buscini, a name which I cannot identify. They are written in Italian, and one of them begins, Unico mio vero amico, my only true friend. Others are signed Virginia B. One of these is dated Forli, October the 15th, 1773. There is also a Teresa B., who writes from Genoa. I was at first unable to identify the writer of a whole series of letters, in French, very affectionate and intimate letters, usually unsigned, occasionally signed B. 
she calls herself votre petite amie, or she ends with a half-smiling, half-reproachful, good night, and sleep better than I. In one letter, sent from Paris in 1759, she writes, Never believe me, but when I tell you that I love you, and that I shall love you always. In another letter, ill-spelt, as her letters often are, she writes, Be assured that evil tongues, vapours, calumny, nothing can change my heart, which is yours entirely, and has no will to change its master. Now it seems to me that these letters must be from Manon Baletti, and that they are the letters referred to in the sixth volume of the memoirs. We read there, page 60, how on Christmas Day, 1759, Casanova receives a letter from Manon in Paris, announcing her marriage with Monsieur Blondel, architect to the king and member of his academy. She returns him his letters, and begs him to return hers, or burn them. Instead of doing so, he allows Esther to read them, intending to burn them afterwards. Esther begs to be allowed to keep the letters, promising to preserve them religiously all her life. These letters, he says, numbered more than two hundred, and the shortest were of four pages. Certainly there are not two hundred of them at Dux, but it seems to me highly probable that Casanova made a final selection from Manon's letters, and it is these which I have found. But, however this may be, I was fortunate enough to find the set of letters which I was most anxious to find, the letters from Henriette, whose loss every writer on Casanova has lamented. Henriette, it will be remembered, makes her first appearance at Cesena in the year 1748. After their meeting at Geneva, she reappears, romantically apropos, twenty-two years later at Aix-en-Provence, and she writes to Casanova proposing un commerce epistolaire, asking him what he has done since his escape from prison, and promising to do her best to tell him all that has happened to her during the long interval. After quoting her letter, he adds, I replied to her, accepting the correspondence that she offered me, and telling her briefly all my vicissitudes. She related to me, in turn, in some forty letters, all the history of her life. If she dies before me, I shall add these letters to these memoirs, but today she is still alive, and always happy, though now old. It has never been known what became of these letters, and why they were not added to the memoirs. I have found a great quantity of them, some signed with her married name in full, Henriette de Schnetzmann, and I am inclined to think that she survived Casanova, for one of the letters is dated Bayreuth, 1798, the year of Casanova's death. They are remarkably charming, written with a mixture of piquancy and distinction, and I will quote the characteristic beginning and end of the last letter I was able to find. It begins, No, it is impossible to be sulky with you, and ends, If I become vicious, it is you, my mentor, who make me so, and I cast my sins upon you. Even if I were damned, I should still be your most devoted friend, Henriette de Schnetzmann. Casanova was twenty-three when he met Henriette. Now herself an old woman, she writes to him when he is seventy-three, as if the fifty years that had passed were blotted out in the faithful affection of her memory. How many more discreet and less changing lovers have had the quality of constancy in change to which this lifelong correspondence bears witness? Does it not suggest a view of Casanova not quite the view of all the world? To me, it shows the real man, who perhaps of all others best understood what Shelley meant when he said, True love in this differs from gold or clay, that to divide is not to take away. But though the letters from women naturally interested me the most, they were only a certain proportion of the great mass of correspondence which I turned over. There were letters from Carlo Angiolini, who was afterwards to bring the manuscript of the memoirs to Brockhaus, from Balbi, the monk with whom Casanova escaped from the Piombi, from the Marquis Galbegati, 
playwright, actor, and eccentric, of whom there is some account in the memoirs, from the Marquis Mosca, a distinguished man of letters who I was anxious to see, Casanova tells us in the same volume in which he describes his visit to the Moscas at Pizarro, from Zulian, the brother of the Duchess of Fiano, from Richard Lorraine, bel homme, ayant de l'esprit, le temps et le goût de la bonne société, who came to settle at Gorizia in 1773, while Casanova was there from the procurator Morosini, whom he speaks of in the memoirs as his protector, and as one of those through whom he obtained permission to return to Venice. His other protector, the avogador Zaguri, had, says Casanova, since the affair of the Marquis Albergati, carried on a most interesting correspondence with me. And in fact I found a bundle of no less than a hundred and thirty eight letters from him, dating from seventeen eighty four to seventeen ninety eight. Another bundle contains one hundred and seventy two letters from Count Lombert. In the memoirs Casanova says, referring to his visit at Augsburg at the end of seventeen sixty one, I used to spend my evenings in a very agreeable manner at the house of Count Max de Lombert who resided at the court of the prince-bishop with the title of Grand Marshal. What particularly attached me to Count Lomberg was his literary talent. A first-rate scholar, learned to a degree, he has published several much-esteemed works. I carried on an exchange of letters with him, which ended only with his death four years ago in 1792. Casanova tells us that, at his second visit to Augsburg, in the early part of 1767, he supped with Count Lomberg two or three times a week during the four months he was there. It is with this year that the letters I have found begin. They end with the year of his death, 1792. In his Memorial d'un Mondain, Lomberg refers to Casanova as a man known in literature, a man of profound knowledge. In the first edition of 1774, he laments that a man such as Monsieur de S. Galt should not yet have been taken back into favour by the Venetian government, and in the second edition, 1775, rejoices over Casanova's return to Venice. Then there are letters from da Ponte, who tells the story of Casanova's curious relations with Madame d'Urfe in his Memorie scritte da esso, 1829, from Pitone, Bonno, and others mentioned in different parts of the memoirs, and from some dozen others who are not mentioned in them. The only letters in the whole collection that have been published are those from the Prince de Ligne and from Count Koenig. Section 4 Casanova tells us in his memoirs that, during his later years at Dux, he had only been able to hinder black melancholy from devouring his poor existence or sending him out of his mind by writing ten or twelve hours a day. The copious manuscripts at Dux show us how persistently he was at work on a singular variety of subjects, in addition to the memoirs, and to the various books which he published during those years. We see him jotting down everything that comes into his head, for his own amusement, and certainly without any thought of publication, engaging in learned controversies, writing treatises on abstruse mathematical problems, composing comedies to be acted before Count Waldstein's neighbours, practising verse-writing in two languages, indeed with more patience than success, writing philosophical dialogues in which God and himself are the speakers, and keeping up an extensive correspondence both with distinguished men and with delightful women. His mental activity, up to the age of seventy-three, is as prodigious as the activity which he had expended in living a multiform and incalculable life. As in life, everything living had interested him, so in his retirement from life every idea makes its separate appeal to him, and he welcomes ideas with the same impartiality with which he had welcomed adventures. Passion has intellectualized itself, and remains not less passionate. 
He wishes to do everything, to compete with everyone, and it is only after having spent seven years in heaping up miscellaneous learning and exercising his faculties in many directions that he turns to look back over his own past life and to live it over again in memory as he writes down the narrative of what had interested him most in it. I write in the hope that my history will never see the broad daylight of publication, he tells us, scarcely meaning it, we may be sure, even in the moment of hesitancy which may naturally come to him. But if ever a book was written for the pleasure of writing it, it was this one, and an autobiography written for oneself is not likely to be anything but frank. Truth is the only God I have ever adored, he tells us, and we now know how truthful he was in saying so. I have only summarised in this article the most important confirmations of his exact accuracy in facts and dates. The number could be extended indefinitely. In the manuscripts we find innumerable further confirmations, and their chief value as testimony is that they tell us nothing which we should not already have known if we had merely taken Casanova at his word. But it is not always easy to take people at their own word when they are writing about themselves, and the world has been very loath to believe in Casanova as he represents himself. It has been specially loath to believe that he is telling the truth when he tells us about his adventures with women. But the letters contained among these manuscripts show us the women of Casanova writing to him with all the fervour and all the fidelity which he attributes to them, and they show him to us in the character of as fervid and faithful a lover. In every fact, every detail, and in the whole mental impression which they convey, these manuscripts bring before us the Casanova of the memoirs. As I seemed to come upon Casanova at home, it was as if I came upon old friend, already perfectly known to me, before I had made my pilgrimage to Dux. 1902 End of Casanova at Dux Recording by Icy Jumbo Translator's Preface, The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melody Martinez. Translator's Preface, The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Translator's Preface A series of adventures wilder and more fantastic than the wildest of romances, written down with the exactitude of a business diary, a view of men and cities, from Naples to Berlin, from Madrid and London, to Constantinople and St. Petersburg, the Vientine, of the eighteenth century depicted by a man who today sat with cardinals and saluted crowned heads and tomorrow lurked in dens of profligacy and crime a book of confessions penned without reticence and without penitence a record of forty years of occult charlatanism a collection of tales of successful imposture of bonne fortune of marvelous escapes, of transcendent audacity, told with the humor of Smollett and the delicate wit of Voltaire. Who is there interested in men and letters and in the life of the past who would not cry, Where can such a book as this be found? Yet the above catalogue is but a brief outline, a bare and meager summary of the book known as the Memoirs of Casanova, a work absolutely unique in literature. He who opens these wonderful pages is as one who sits in a theater 
and looks across the gloom, not on a stage play, but on another and a vanished world. The curtain draws up, and suddenly a hundred and fifty years are rolled away, and in bright light stands out before us the whole life of the past, the gay dresses, the polished wit, the careless morals, and all the revel and dancing of those merry years before the mighty deluge of the revolution. The palaces and marble stairs of old Venice are no longer desolate, but thronged with scarlet-robed senators, prisoners with the doom of the ten upon their heads, cross the bridge of sighs. At dead of night, the nun slips out of the convent gate to the dark canal where a gondola is waiting. We assist at the party's fines of cardinals, and we see the bank made at Faro. Venice gives place to the assembly rooms of Mrs. Cornelly and the fast taverns of the London of 1760. We pass from Versailles to the Winter Palace of St. Petersburg in the day of Catherine, from the policy of the great Frederick to the lewd mirth of the strolling players, and the presence chamber of the Vatican is succeeded by an intrigue in a garret. It is indeed a new experience to read this history of a man who, refraining from nothing, has concealed nothing, of one who stood in the courts of Louis the Magnificent before Madame de Pompadour, and of the nobles of the Ancien Regime, and had an affair with an adventuress of Denmark Street, Soho, and was bound over to keep the peace by fielding, and knew Cagliostro the friend of popes and kings and noblemen, and of all the male and female ruffians and vagabonds of Europe, abbey, soldier, charlatan, gamester, financier, diplomatist, viveur, philosopher, virtuoso, chemist, fiddler, and buffoon. Each of these, and all of these, was Giacomo Casanova. Chevalier de Singalt, Knight of the Golden Spur. And not only are the memoirs a literary curiosity, they are almost equally curious from a bibliographical point of view. The manuscript was written in French and came into the possession of the publisher Brockhaus of Leipzig, who had it translated into German and printed. From this German edition, M. Aubert de Vitry retranslated the work into French, but omitted about a fourth of the matter, and this mutilated and worthless version is frequently purchased by unwary bibliophiles. In the year 1826, however, Brockhaus, in order presumably to protect his property, printed the entire text of the original manuscript in French, for the first time and in this complete form, containing a large number of anecdotes and incidents not to be found in the spurious version. The work was not acceptable to the authorities and was consequently rigorously suppressed. Only a few copies sent out for presentation or for review are known to have escaped, and from one of these rare copies the present translation has been made, and solely for private circulation. In conclusion, both translator and editor have done their utmost Author's Preface of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashwin Jain. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova. Volume 1 
The Venetian Use by Giacomo Casanova Author's Preface I will begin with this confession. Whatever I have done in the course of my life, whether it be good or evil, has been done freely. I am a free agent. The doctrine of the Stoics or of any other sect as to the force of destiny is a bubble engendered by the imagination of man and is near akin to atheism. I not only believe in one God, but my faith as a Christian is also grafted upon that tree of philosophy which has never spoiled anything. I believe in the existence of an immaterial God the author and master of all beings and all things, and I feel that I never had any doubt of his existence from the fact that I have always relied upon his providence, prayed to him in my distress, and that he has always granted my prayers. Despair brings death, but prayer does away with despair. And when a man has prayed, he feels himself employed by the sovereign master of human beings to avoid impending dangers from those who beseech his assistance. I confess that the knowledge of them is above the intelligence of man who can but wonder and adore. Our ignorance becomes our only resource and happy, truly happy, are those who cherish their ignorance. Therefore, must we pray to God and believe that He has granted the favor we have been praying for, even when in appearance it seems the reverse. As to the position which our body ought to assume when we address ourselves to the Creator, a line of Petrarch settles it. Con le ginocchia della mente in cine. Man is free. But his freedom ceases when he has no faith in it. And the greater power he ascribes to faith, the more he deprives himself of that power which God has given to him when he endowed him with a gift of reason. Reason is a particle of the creator's divinity. When we use it with a spirit of humility and justice, we are certain to please the giver of that precious gift. God ceases to be God only for those who can admit the possibility of His non-existence. And that conception is in itself the most severe punishment they can suffer. Man is free, yet we must not suppose that he is at a liberty to do everything he pleases. For he becomes a slave the moment he allows his actions to be ruled by passion. The man who has sufficient power over himself to wait until his nature has recovered its even balance is a truly wise man. But such beings are seldom met with. The reader of this memoirs will discover that I have never had and he fixed aim before my eyes, and that my system, if it can be called a system, has been to glide away unconcernedly on the stream of life, trusting to the wind wherever it led. How many changes arise from such an independent mode of life? My success and my misfortunes the bright and the dark days I have gone through. Everything has provided to me that in this world, either physical or moral, good comes out of evil just as well as evil comes out of good. My errors will point to thinking men the various roads and will teach them the great art of treading on the brink of the precipice without falling into it. It is only necessary to have courage, for strength without self-confidence is useless. I have often met 
with happiness after some imprudent step which ought to have brought ruin upon me and although passing a word of censure upon myself i would thank god for his mercy but by way of compensation dire misfortune has befallen me in consequence of actions prompted by the most cautious wisdom this would humble me yet conscious that i had acted rightly i would easily derive comfort from that conviction in spite of a good foundation of sound morals the nature of spring of the divine principles which have been early rooted in my heart i have been throughout my life the victim of my senses i have found delight in losing the right path i have constantly lived in a mist of error with no consolation but the consciousness of my being mistaken therefore dear reader i trust that far from attaching to my history the character of impudent posting will find in my memoirs only the characteristic proper to a general confession and that my narratory style will be the manner neither of a repenting sinner nor of a man ashamed to acknowledge his faults they are the follies inherent to youth i make sport of them and if you are kind you will not yourself refuse them a good-natured smile you will be amused when you see that i have more than once deceived without the slightest form of conscience both knaves and fools and to the deceit perpetrated upon women let it pass for when love is in the way men and women in general rule dupe each other but on the score of fools it is a very different manner i always feel the greatest bliss when i recollect those i have caught in my snares for they generally are insolent and so self-conceited that they challenge wit we avenge intellect when we dupe a fool and it is a victory not to be despised for a fool is covered with steel and it is often very hard to find his vulnerable part in fact to gull a fool seems to me an exploit worthy of a witty man i have felt in my very blood ever since i was born a most unconquerable hatred towards the whole tribe of fools and it arises from the fact that i feel myself a blockhead whenever i am in their company i am very far from placing them in the same class with those men whom we call stupid for the latter are stupid only from deficient education and i rather like them i have met with some of them very honest fellows who with all their stupidity have a kind of intelligence and an upright good sense which cannot be the characteristics of fools they are like eyes veiled with a cataract which if the disease could be removed would be very beautiful dear reader examine the spirit of this preface and you will at once guess at my purpose i have written a preface because i wish you to know me thoroughly before you begin the reading of my memoirs it is only in a coffee room or at a table they hold that we like to converse with strangers i have written the history of my life and i have a perfect right to do so but am i wise in throwing it before a public of which i know nothing but evil no i am aware it is sheer folly 
but I want to be busy. I want to laugh. And why should I deny myself this gratification? Expulit elaboro morbum bilem chu mero. An ancient author tells us somewhere with the tone of a pedagogue if you have ever not done anything worthy of being recorded, at least write something worthy of being read. It is a percept as beautiful as a diamond or the forced water cut in England, but cannot be applied to me because I have not written either a novel or the life of an illustrious character. Worthy or not, my life is my subject and my subject is my life. I have lived without dreaming that I should ever take a fancy to write the history of my life and for that very reason my memoirs claim from the reader an interest and a sympathy which they would not have obtained. Had I always entertained the design to write them in my old age and still more to publish them. I have reached in 1797 the age of three score years and twelve. I cannot say weeksy and I could not procure a more agreeable pastime than to relate my own adventures and to cause pleasant laughter amongst the good company listening to me, from which I have received so many tokens of friendship, in the midst of which I have ever lived. To enable me to write well, I have only to think that my readers will belong to that polite society. To Sank Dixi, C. Pesurent, Tiktavet Auditor, Should there be a few intruders whom I cannot prevent from pursuing my memoirs, I must find comfort in the idea that my history was not written for them. By recollecting the pleasures I have had formerly, I renew them. I enjoy them a second time, while I laugh at the remembrance of troubles now past and which I no longer feel. A member of this great universe, I speak to the air, and I fancy myself rendering an account of my administration, as a steward is wont to do before leaving the situation. For my future, I have no concern, and as a true philosopher, I never would have any, for I know not what it may be. As a Christian, on the other hand, faith must believe without discussion, and the stronger it is, the more it keeps silent. I know that I have lived because I have felt, and feeling giving me the knowledge of my existence. I know likewise that I shall exist no more when I shall have ceased to feel. Should I perchance still feel after my death, I would no longer have any doubt, but I would most certainly give it the lie to anyone asserting before me that I was dead. The history of my life must begin by the earliest circumstance which my memory can evoke. It will therefore commence when I had attained the age of eight years and four months. Before that time, if to think is to live to be a true axiom, I did not live. I could only lay claim to a state of vegetation. The mind of a human being is formed only of comparisons made in order to examine analogies, and therefore cannot precede the existence of memory. The mnemonic organ, 
was developed in my head only eight years and four months after my birth. It is then that my soul began to be susceptible of receiving impressions. How is it possible for an immaterial substance which can neither touch nor be touched to receive impressions? It is a mystery which man cannot unravel. In a certain philosophy, full of consolation and in perfect accord with religion, pretends that the state of dependence in which the soul stands in relation to the senses and to the organs is only incidental and transient, and that it will reach a condition of freedom and happiness when the death of the body shall have delivered it from the state of tyrannic subjection. This is very fine, but apart from religion, which is the proof of it all, therefore, as I cannot, from my own information, have a perfect certainty of my being immortal until the dissolution of my body has actually taken place, people must kindly bear with me if I am in no hurry to obtain that certain knowledge, for, in my estimation, a knowledge to be gained at the cost of life is a rather expensive piece of information. In the meantime, I worship God, lay every wrong action under an interdict which I endeavor to respect, and I loathe the wicked without doing them any injury. I only abstain from doing them any good, in the full belief that we ought not to cherish serpents. As I must likewise say a few words respecting my nature and my temperament, I promise the most indulgent of my readers is not likely to be the most dishonest or the least gifted with intelligence. I have had, in turn, every temperament, phlegmatic in my infancy, sanguine in my youth, later on, bilious, and now I have a disposition which engenders melancholy, and most likely will never change. I have always made my food congenial to my constitution, and my health was always excellent. I learned very early that our health is always impaired by some excess either of food or abstinence, and I never had any physician except myself. I am bound to add that the excess in too little has ever proved in me more dangerous than the excess in too much. The last may cause indigestion, but the first causes death. Now, old as I am, and although enjoying good digestive organs, I must have only one meal every day, but I find a set off to the privation in my delightful sleep, and in the ease which I experience in writing down my thoughts without having recourse to paradox or sophism, which would be calculated to deceive myself even more than my readers. For I never could make up my mind to palm counterfeit coin upon them if I knew it to be such. The sanguine temperament rendered me very sensible to the attractions of voluptuousness. I always very cheerful and ever ready to pass from one enjoyment to another, and I was at the same time very skillful in inventing new pleasures. Thence, I suppose, my natural disposition to make fresh acquaintances and to break with them so readily, 
although always for a good reason, and never through mere fickleness. The errors caused by temperament are not to be corrected, because our temperament is perfectly independent of our strength. It is not the case with our character. Heart and head are the constituent parts of the character. Temperament has almost nothing to do with it, and therefore character is dependent upon education and is susceptible of being corrected and improved. I leave to others the decision as to the good or evil tendencies of my character, but such as it is, it shines upon my countenance, and there it can be easily detected by any physiognomist. It is only on the fact that character can be read, there it lies exposed to the view. It is worthy of remark that men who have no peculiar cast of countenance, and there are a great many of such men, are likewise totally deficient in peculiar characteristics, and we may establish the rule that the varieties in physiognomy are equal to the differences in character. I am aware that throughout my life my actions have received their impulse more from the force of feeling than from the wisdom of reason. And this has led me to acknowledge that my conduct has been dependent upon my nature more than upon my mind. Both are generally at war in the midst of their continual collisions. I have never found in me sufficient mind to balance my nature or enough strength in my nature to counteract the power of my mind. But enough of this, for there is truth in the old saying, Si brevis es volo, obscurus few. And I believe that, without offending against modesty, I can apply to myself the following words of my dear Virgil. Nexum adeo in formis, nu per me in lettore vidi, cum placidum ventis teret mare. The chief business of my life has always been to indulge my senses. I never knew anything of great importance. I felt myself born for the fair sex. I have ever loved it dearly, and I have been loved by it as often as much as I could. I have likewise always had a great weakness for good living, and I ever felt passionately fond of every object which excited my curiosity. I have had friends who have acted kindly towards me and it has been my good fortune to have it in my power to give them substantial proofs of my gratitude. I have had also bitter enemies who have persecuted me, and whom I have not crushed simply because I could not do it. I never would have forgiven them had I not lost the memory of all the injuries they had heaped upon me. The man who forgets does not forgive. He only loses the remembrance of the harm inflicted on him. Forgiveness is the offspring of a feeling of heroism, of a noble heart, of a generous mind, which forgetfulness is only the result of a weak memory or of an easy carelessness and still oftener of a natural desire for calm and quietness. Hatred, in the course of time, kills the unhappy wretch who delights in nursing it in his bosom. Should anyone bring against me 
an excitation of sensuality he would be wrong for all the fierceness of my senses never caused me to neglect any of my duties for the same excellent reason the accusation of drunkenness ought not to be brought against homer laudibus agutur vini venosus homerus I have always been fond of highly seasoned rich dishes such as marconi prepared by a skillful napolitan cook and the olla podrida of spaniards the gluttonous caught fish from newfoundland game with a strong flavor and cheese the perfect state of which is attained with a tiny immaculate formed with its very essence begin to show signs of life as for women i have always found the odor of my beloved once exceeding pleasant what depraved taste some people will exclaim are you not ashamed to confess such inclinations without blushing my dear critics you make me laugh heartily thanks to my coarse taste i believe myself happier than other men because i am convinced that they enhance my enjoyment happy are those who know how to obtain pleasures without injury to anyone insane are those who fancy that the almighty can enjoy the sufferings the pains the fasts and abstinences which they tax themselves so foolish god can only demand from his creatures the practice of virtues the seed of which he has sown in their soul and all he has given unto us has been intended for our happiness self love thirst for praise emulation strength courage and a power of which nothing can deprive us the power of self destruction if after due calculation whether false or just we unfortunately reckon it to be advantageous this is the strongest proof of our moral freedom so much attacked by sophists yet this power of self destruction is repugnant to nature and has been rightly opposed by every religion a so called free thinker told me at one time that i could not consider myself a philosopher if i have placed any faith in revelation but when we accept it readily in physics why should we reject it in religious matters the form alone is a point in question the spirit speaks to the spirit and not to the ears the principles of everything we are acquainted with must necessarily have been revealed to those from whom we have received them by the great supreme principle which contains them all the bee erecting its hive the swallow building its nest the ant constructing its cave and the spider warping its web would never have done anything but for a previous and everlasting revelation we must either believe that it is so or admit that the matter is endowed with thought but as we dare not pay such a compliment to matter let us stand by revelation the great philosopher who having deeply studied nature thought that he had found the truth because he acknowledged nature as god and died too soon had he lived a little while longer he would have gone much farther and yet his journey would have been a short one for finding himself in his altar he could not have denied him 
in short, we move and have our being. He would have found him inscrutable, and thus would have ended his journey. God, great principle of all minor principles, God, who is himself without a principle, could not conceive himself, if, in order to do it, he required to know his own principle. A oh, blissful ignorance, Spinoza, the virtuous Spinoza, died before he could possess it. He would have died a learned man, and with the right to the reward his virtue deserved, if he had only supposed his soul to be immortal. It is not true that the wish for reward is unworthy of real virtue and throws a blemish upon its purity. Such a pretension, on the contrary, helps to sustain virtue. Man being himself too weak to consent to be virtuous only for his own gratification. I hold as a myth that Amphirus prefer to be good than to seem good. In fact, I do not believe there is an honest man alive without some pretension. And here is mine. I pretend to the friendship, to the esteem, to the gratitude of my readers. I claim their gratitude, if my moils can give them instruction and pleasure. I claim their esteem if, rendering me justice, they find more good qualities in me than faults, and I claim their friendship as soon as they deem me worthy of it. By the candor and the good faith with which I abandon myself to their judgment, without disguise and exactly as I am in reality, they will find that I have always had sincere love for truth, that I have often begun by telling stories for the purpose of getting truth to enter the heads of those who could not appreciate its charms. They will not form a wrong opinion of me when they see one entering pose of my friends to satisfy my fancies. For those friends entertain idle schemes and by giving them the hope of success, I trusted to disappointment to cure them. I would deceive them to make them wiser, and I did not consider myself guilty, for I applied to my own enjoyment sums of money which would have been lost in the vain pursuit of possessions denied by nature. Therefore, I was not actuated by the avaricious rapacity. I might think myself guilty if I were rich now, but I have nothing. I have squandered everything. It is my comfort and my justification. The money was intended for extravagant follies, and by applying it to my own frolics, I did not turn it into a very different channel. If I were deceived in my hope to please, I candidly confess I would regret it, but not sufficiently so to repent having returned my memoirs, for, after all, writing them has given me pleasure. O oh, cruel ennui! It must be by mistake that those who have invented the torments of hell have forgotten to ascribe thee the first place among them. Yet I am bound to own that I entertain a great fear of hisses. It is too natural a fear for me to boast of being insensible to them, and I cannot find any solace in the idea that when these memoirs are published I shall be no more. I cannot think without a shudder of contracting any obligation towards death. I hate death, for, happy or miserable, 
Life is the only blessing which man possesses, and those who do not love it are unworthy of it. If we prefer honor to life, it is because life is blighted by infamy, and if, in the alternative, man sometimes throws away his life, philosophy must remain silent. Oh, death, cruel death, fatal law which nature necessarily rejects because thy very office is to destroy nature. Cicero says that death frees us from all pains and forests. But this great philosopher books all the expense without taking the receipts into account. I do not recollect if, when he wrote his Tusculan Disputations, his own Tulia was dead. Death is a monster which turns away from the great theatre an attentive hearer before the end of the play, which deeply interests him, and this is reason enough to hate it. All my adventures are not to be found in these memoirs, I have left out those which might have offended the persons who have played a sorrow part therein. In spite of this reserve, my readers will perhaps often think me indiscreet, and I am sorry for it. Should I perchance become wiser before I give up the ghost, I might burn every one of these sheets. But now I have not courage enough to do it. It may be that certain love scenes will be considered too explicit. But let no one blame me, unless it be for lack of skill. For I ought not to be scolded because, in my old age, I can find no other enjoyment but that which recollections of the past afforded me. After all, virtuous and prudish readers are at liberty to skip over any offensive pictures, and I think it my duty to give them this piece of advice, so much the worse for those who may not read my preface. It is no fault of mine if they do not, for everyone ought to know that a preface is to a book but a playbill is to a comedy. Both must be read. My memoirs are not written for young persons who, in order to avoid false steps and slippery roads, ought to spend their youth in blissful ignorance, but for those who, having thorough experience of life, are no longer exposed to temptation, and who, having but too often gone through the fire, are like salamanders, and can be scorched by it no more. True virtue is but a habit, and I have no hesitation in saying that the really virtuous are those persons who can practice virtue without the slightest trouble. Such persons are always full of toleration, and it is to them that my memoirs are addressed. I have written in French and not in Italian because the French language is more universal than mine. And the purists who may criticize in my style some Italian tunes will be quite right, but only in case it should prevent them from understanding me clearly. The Greeks admired Theophrastus in spite of his Eurasian style and the Romans delighted in their Livy, despite of his paternity. Provided I amuse my readers, it seems to me that I can claim the same indulgence. After all, every Italian reads Algarotti with pleasure, although his works are full of French idioms. There is one thing 
worthy of notice. Of all the living languages belonging to the Republic of Letters, the French tongue is the only one which has been condemned by its masters never to borrow in order to become richer. Whilst all other languages, although richer in words than the French, blunder from it words and constructions of sentences, whenever they find that by such robbery they add something to their own beauty. Yet those who borrow the most from the French are the most forward in trumpeting the poverty of that language, very likely thinking that such an accusation justifies their depredations. It is said that the French language has attained the apology of its beauty, and that the smallest foreign loan would spoil it. But I make bold to assert that this is prejudice, for although it certainly is the most clear, the most logical of all languages, it would be great temerity to affirm that it can never go farther or higher than it has gone. We all recollect that in the days of Lully there was but one opinion of his music, yet Ramu came and everything was changed. The new impulse given to the French nation may open new and unexpected horizons, and new beauties, fresh perfections, may spring up from new combinations and from new wants. The motto I have adopted justifies my discretions, and all the commentaries, perhaps too numerous, in which I indulge upon my various exploits, Nekvid kam sapit fi sibi non sapit. For the same reason, I have always felt a great desire to receive praise and applause from polite society. Excitat auditor stadum laudic virtus preset et immensum gloria calcar habit. I would willingly have displayed here the proud axiom Nemo le editur nisi esse ipso. Had I not feared to offend the immense number of persons who, whenever anything goes wrong with them, are wont to exclaim, It is no fault of mine, I cannot deprive them of the small particle of comfort, for, were it not for it, they would soon feel hatred for themselves, and self-hatred often leads to the fatal idea of self-destruction. As for myself, I always willingly acknowledge my own self as a principal cause of every good or of every evil which may befall me. Therefore, I have always found myself capable of being my own pupil and ready to love my teacher. End of Author's Preface Chapter One of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode One: Childhood. Chapter One. The illegitimate son of Don Francisco Casanova was a native of Saragossa, the capital of Aragon, and in the year fourteen twenty-eight, 
he carried off Donna Alla Palafax from a convent on the day after she had taken the veil. He was secretary to King Alfonso. He ran away with her to Rome, where, after one year of imprisonment, the Pope, Martin III, released Anna from her vows, and gave them the nuptial blessing at the insistence of Don Juan Casanova, Major Domo of the Vatican, and uncle of Don Jacob. All the children born from that marriage died in their infancy, with the exception of Don Juan, who, in 1475, married Donna Eleanor Albini, of whom he had a son, Marco Antonio. In 1481, Don Juan, having killed an officer of the King of Naples, was compelled to leave Rome, and escaped to Como with his wife and his son. But, having left the city to seek his fortune, he died while travelling with Christopher Columbus in the year 1493. Marco Antonio became a noted poet of the school of Martial, and was secretary to Cardinal Pompeo Colonna. The satire against Giulio de Medicis, which we found in his works, having made it necessary for him to leave Rome, he returned to Como, where he married a Bondia Razonica, the same Giulio de Medicis, having become pope under the name of Clement the Seventh, pardoned him and called him back to Rome with his wife. The city, having been taken and ransacked by the imperialists in 1526, Marco Antonio died there from an attack of the plague. Otherwise he would have died of misery, the soldiers of Charles V having taken all he possessed. Pierre Valerian speaks of him in his work, De Infelicitate Litatorium. Three months after his death, his wife gave birth to Jacques Casanova, who died in France at a great age, colonel in the army, commanded by Farnes, against Henry, king of Navarre, afterwards king of France. He had left in the city of Parma a son who married Teresa Conti, from whom he had Jacques, who in the year 1681 married Anna Rolli. Jacques had two sons, Jean-Baptiste and Gaetan joseph Jacques. The eldest left Palmer in 1712, and was never heard of. The other also went away in 1715, being only nineteen years old. This all I have found in my father's diary. From my mother's lips I have heard the following particulars. Gaetan joseph Jacques left his family, madly in love with an actress, named Fragoletta, who performed the chambermaids. In his poverty he determined to earn a living by making the most of his own person. At first he gave himself up to dancing, and five years afterwards became an actor, making himself conspicuous by his conduct still more than by his talent. Whether from fickleness or from jealousy, he abandoned the Fragoletta, and joined in Venice a troupe of comedians, then given performances at the St. Samuel Theatre. Opposite the house in which he had taken his lodging resided a shoemaker, by name Jerome Frafusi, with his wife Marzia, and Zanetta, their only daughter, a perfect beauty, sixteen years of age. The young actor fell in love with this girl, succeeded in gaining her affection, and in containing her consent to a runaway match. It was the only way to win her, for, being an actor, he never could have had Marzia's consent, still less Jerome's, as in their eyes a player was a most awful individual. The young lovers, provided with the necessary certificates and accompanied by two witnesses, presented themselves before the Patriarch of Venice, who performed over them the marriage ceremony. Marzia, Zanetta's mother, indulged in a good deal of exclamation, and her father died broken-hearted. I was born nine months afterwards, on the 2nd of April, 1725. The following April my mother left me under the care of her own mother, who had forgiven her as soon as she had heard that my father had promised never to compel her to appear on the stage. 
This is a promise which all actors make to the young girls they marry, and which they never fulfil, simply because their wives never care much about claiming from them the performance of it. Moreover, it turned out a very fortunate thing for my mother that she had studied for the stage, for nine years later, having been left a widow with six children, she could not have brought them up if it had not been for the resources she found in that profession. I was only one year old when my father left me to go to London, where he had an engagement. It was in that great city that my mother made her first appearance on the stage, and in that city likewise that she gave birth to my brother Francois, a celebrated painter of battles, now residing in Vienna, where he has followed his profession since 1783. Towards the end of the year 1728, my mother returned to Venice with her husband, and as she had become an actress, she continued her artistic life. In 1730 she was delivered of my brother Jean, who became director of the Academy of Painting in Dresden, and died there in 1795. And during the three following years she became the mother of two daughters, one of whom died at an early age, while the other married in Dresden, where she still lived in 1798. I had also a posthumous brother, who became a priest. He died in Rome fifteen years ago. Let us now come to the dawn of my existence, in the character of a thinking being. The organ of memory began to develop itself in me, at the beginning of August 1733. I had at that time reached the age of eight years and four months. Of what may have happened to me before that period, I have not the faintest recollection. This is the circumstance. I was standing in the corner of a room bending towards the wall, supporting my head, and my eyes fixed upon a stream of blood flowing from my nose to the ground. My grandmother Marzia, whose pet I was, came to me, bathed my face with cold water, and, unknown to everyone in the house, took me with her in a gondola as far as Muran, a thickly populated island only half a league distance from Venice. Alighting from the gondola, we entered a wretched hole, where we found an old woman sitting on a rickety bed, holding a black cat in her arms, with five or six more purring around her. The two old cronies held together a long discourse of which, most likely, I was the subject. At the end of the dialogue, which was carried on in the patios of Forley, the witch, having received a silver ducat from my grandmother, opened a box, took me in her arms, placed me in the box, and locked me in it, telling me not to be frightened. A piece of advice which would certainly have had the contrary effect— if I had had any wits about me, but I was stupefied. I kept myself quiet in a corner of the box, holding a handkerchief to my nose because it was still bleeding, and otherwise very indifferent to the uproar going on outside. I could hear in turn laughter, weeping, singing, screams, shrieks, and knocking against the box, but for all that I cared for naught. At last I am taken out of the box. The blood stops flowing. The wonderful old witch, after lavishing caresses upon me, takes off my clothes, lays me on the bed, burns some drugs, gathers the smoke in a sheet which she wraps around me, pronounces incantations, takes the sheets off me, and gives me five sugar plums of a very agreeable taste. Then she immediately rubs my temples and the nap of my neck, with an ointment exhaling a delightful perfume, and puts my clothes on me again. She told me that my hemorrhage would little by little leave me, provided I should never disclose to anyone what she had done to cure me, and she threatened me, on the other hand, with the loss of all my blood and with death, should I ever breathe a word concerning these mysteries. After having thus taught me my lesson, she informed me that a beautiful lady would pay me a visit during the following night, and that she would make me happy, on condition that I should have sufficient control over myself 
never to mention to any one having received such a visit. Upon this we left and returned home. I fell asleep almost as soon as I was in bed, without giving a thought to the beautiful visitor I was to receive. But, waking up a few hours afterwards, I saw, or fancied I saw, coming down the chimney, a dazzling woman with immense hoops, splendidly attired, and wearing on her head a crown set with precious stones, which seemed to me sparkling with fire. With slow steps, but with a majestic and sweet countenance, she came forward and sat on my bed. Then, taking several small boxes from a pocket, she emptied their contents over my head, softly whispering a few words, and, after giving utterance to a long speech, not a single word of which I understood, she kissed me, and disappeared the same way she had came. I soon went again to sleep. The next morning my grandmother came to dress me, and the moment she was near my bed she cautioned me to be silent, threatening me with death if I dared to say anything respecting my night's adventures. This command, laid upon me by the only woman who had complete authority over me, and whose orders I was accustomed to obey blindly, caused me to remember the vision and to store it, with the seal of secrecy, in the innermost corner of my dawning memory. I had not, however, the slightest inclination to mention the circumstances to any one. In the first place, because I did not suppose it would interest anybody, and in the second, because I would not have known whom to make a confidant of. My disease had rendered me dull and retired. Everybody pitied me, and left me to myself. My life was considerably likely to be but a short one, and as to my parents, they never spoke to me. After the journey to Moran, and the nocturnal visit of the fairy, I continued to have bleeding at the nose, but less from day to day, and my memory slowly developed itself. I learned to read in less than a month. It would be ridiculous, of course, to attribute this cure to such follies, but at the same time I think it would be wrong to assert that they did not in any way contribute to it. As far as the apparition of the beautiful queen is concerned, I have always deemed it to be a dream, unless it should have been some masquerade got up for the occasion. But it is not always in the druggist's shops that are found the best remedies for severe diseases. Our ignorance is every day proved by some wonderful phenomenon, and I believe this to be the reason why it is so difficult to meet with a learned man entirely untainted with superstition. We know, as a matter of course, that there never have been any sorcerers in this world, yet it is true that their power has always existed in the estimation of those to whom crafty knaves have passed themselves off as such. Somnio nocturnos lemues hortentacue thessalia vides. Many things became real which, at first, had no existence but in our imagination, and, as a natural consequence, many facts which have been attributed to faith may not always have been miraculous although they are true miracles for those who lend to faith a boundless power. The next circumstance of any importance to myself, which I recollect, happened three months after my trip to Muran, and six weeks before my father's death. I give it to my readers only to convey some idea of the manner in which my nature was expanding. One day, about the middle of November, I was with my brother Francois, two years younger than I, in my father's room, watching him attentively as he was working at optics. A huge lump of crystal, round and cut into facets, attracted my attention. I took it up, and having brought it near my eye, I was delighted to see that it multiplied objects. The wish to possess myself of it at once got hold of me, and, seeing myself unobserved, I took my opportunity and hid it in my pocket. A few minutes after this my father looked about for his crystal, and, unable to find it, 
he concluded that one of us must have taken it. My brother asserted that he had not touched it, and I, although guilty, said the same. But my father, satisfied that he could not be mistaken, threatened to search us, and to thrash the one who had told him a story. I pretended to look for the crystal in every corner of the room, and, watching my opportunity, I slyly slipped it into the pocket of my brother's jacket. At first I was sorry for what I had done, for I might as well have feigned to find the crystal somewhere about the room. But the evil deed was past recall. My father, seeing that we were looking in vain, lost patience, searched us, found the unlucky ball of crystal in the pocket of the innocent boy, and inflicted upon him the promised thrashing. Three or four years later I was foolish enough to boast before my brother of the trick I had then played on him. He never forgave me, and has never failed to take his revenge whenever the opportunity offered. However, having at a later period gone to confession, and accused myself to the priest of the sin with every circumstance surrounding it, I gained some knowledge which afforded me great satisfaction. My confessor, who was a Jesuit, told me that by the deed I had verified the meaning of my first name, Jacques, which he said meant in Hebrew supplanter, and that God had changed for that reason the name of the ancient patriarch into that of Israel, which meant knowing. He had deceived his brother Esau. Six weeks after the above adventure, my father was attacked with an abscess in the head, which carried him off in a week. Dr. Zambili first gave him operative remedies, and, seeing his mistake, he tried to mend it by administrating castorium, which sent his patient into convulsions and killed him. The abscess broke out through the ear one minute after his death, taking its leave after killing him, as if it had no longer any business with him. My father departed this life in the very prime of his manhood. He was only thirty-six years of age, but he was followed to his grave by the regrets of the public, and, more particularly, of all the patricians amongst them, whom he was held as above his profession, not less on account of his gentleman behaviour than on account of his extensive knowledge in mechanics. Two days before his death, feeling that his end was at hand, my father expressed a wish to see us all around his bed, in the presence of his wife, and of the Messieurs Gramini, three Venetian noblemen, whose protection he wished to entreat in our favour. After giving us his blessing, he requested our mother, who was drowned in tears, to give her sacred promise that she would not educate any of us for the stage, on which he never would have appeared himself, had he not been led to it by an unfortunate attachment. My mother gave her promise, and the three noblemen said they would see to its being faithfully kept. Circumstances helped our mother to fulfil her word. At that time my mother had been pregnant for six months, and she was allowed to remain away from the stage until after Easter. Beautiful and young as she was, she declined all the offers of marriage which were made to her, and, placing her trust in Providence, she courageously devoted herself to the task of bringing up her young family. She considered it a duty to think of me before the others, not so much from a feeling of preference, as in consequence of my disease, which had such an effect upon me that it was difficult to know what to do with me. I was very weak, without any appetite, unable to apply myself to anything, and I had all the appearance of an idiot. Physicians disagreed as to the cause of the disease. He loses, they would say, two pounds of blood every week, yet there cannot be more than sixteen or eighteen pounds in his body. What, then, can cause so abundant a bleeding? One assented that in me all the chyle turned into blood. Another was of the opinion that the air I was breathing must, at each inhalation, increase the quantity of blood in my lungs. 
and contended that this was the reason for which I always kept my mouth open. I heard of it all six years afterward, from M. Baffo, a great friend of my late father. This M. Baffo consulted with the celebrated Dr. Markop of Padua, who sent him his opinion by writing. This consultation, which I still have in my possession, says that our blood is an elastic fluid, which is liable to diminish or to increase in thickness, but never in quantity, and that my hemorrhage could only proceed from the thickness of the mass of my blood, which relieved itself in a natural way in order to facilitate circulation. The doctor added that I would have died long before, had not nature, in its wish for life, asserted itself, and he concluded by stating that the cause of the thickness of my blood could only be ascribed to the air I was breathing, and that, consequently, I must have a change of air, or every hope of cure be abandoned. He thought likewise that the stupidity so apparent on my countenance was caused by nothing else but the thickness of my blood. M. Baffo, a man of sublime genius, a most lascivious, yet a great and original poet, was therefore instrumental in bringing about the decision which was then taken to send me to Padua, and to him I am indebted for my life. He died twenty years after, the last of an ancient patrician family, but his poems, although obscene, will give everlasting fame to his name. The state inquisitors of Venice have contributed to his celebrity by their mistaken strictness. Their persecutions caused his manuscript works to become precious. They ought to have been aware that despised things are forgotten. As soon as the verdict given by Professor Macop had been approved of, the Erb Grimani undertook to find me a good boarding-house in Padua for me, through a chemist of his acquaintance who resided in that city. His name was Ottaviani, and he was an antiquarian of some repute. In a few days the boarding-house was found, and on the second day of April, 1734, on the very day I had accomplished my ninth year. I was taken to Padua, in a borciello, along the Brenta Canal. We embarked at ten o'clock in the evening, immediately after supper. The borciello may be considered a small floating-house. There is a large saloon with a smaller cabin at each end, and rooms for servants fore and aft. It is a long square with a roof, and cut on each side by glazed windows with shutters. The voyage takes eight hours. M. Grimani, M. Bafu, and my mother accompanied me. I slept with her in the saloon, and the two friends passed the night in one of the cabins. My mother rose at daybreak, opened one of the windows facing the bed, and the rays of the rising sun falling on my eyes caused me to open them. The bed was too low for me to see the land. I could see through the window only the tops of the trees along the river. The boat was sailing with such an even movement that I could not realize the fact of our moving, so that the trees which, one after the other, were rapidly disappearing from my sight, caused me an extreme surprise. "'Ah, dear mother!' I exclaimed. "'What is this? The trees are walking?' At that very moment the two noblemen came in, and, reading astonishment in my countenance, they asked me what my thoughts were so busy about. "'How is it?' I answered. "'That the trees are walking.' They all laughed, but my mother, heaving a great sigh, told me in a tone of deep pity, "'The boat is moving, the trees are not. Now dress yourself.' I understood at once the reason of the phenomenon. "'Then it may be,' said I, "'that the sun does not move, and that we, on the contrary, are resolving from west to east.' At these words my good mother fairly screamed. M. Grimani pitied my foolishness, and I remained dismayed, grieved, and ready to cry. 
M. Baffo brought me life again. He rushed to me, embraced me tenderly, and said, Thou art right, my child. The sun does not move. Take courage, give heed to your reasoning powers, and let others laugh. My mother, greatly surprised, asked him whether he had taken leave of his senses to give me such lessons. But the philosopher, not even condescending to answer her, went on sketching a theory in harmony with my young and simple intelligence. This was the first real pleasure I enjoyed in my life. Had it not been for M. Baffo, this circumstance might have been enough to degrade my understanding. The weakness of credulity would have become part of my mind. The ignorance of the two others would certainly have blunted in me the edge of a faculty which, perhaps has not carried me very far in my after-life, but to which alone I feel that I am indebted for every particle of happiness I enjoy when I look into myself. We reached Padua at an early hour, and went to Ottaviani's house. His wife loaded me with caresses. I found there five or six children, amongst them a girl of eight years named Marie, and another of seven, Rose, beautiful as a seraph. Ten years later, Marie became the wife of the broker Colonda, and Rose, a few years afterwards, married a nobleman, Pierre Marcello, and had one son and two daughters, one of whom was wedded to M. Pierre Monasenigo, and the other to a nobleman of the Carrero family. This last marriage was afterwards nullified. I shall have, in the course of events, to speak of all these persons, and that is my reason for mentioning their names here. Ottaviani took us at once to the house where I was to board. It was only a few yards from his own residence, at St. Marie d'Avance, in the parish of St. Michel, in the house of an old Sclavonian woman, who let the first floor to Signora Mida, wife of a Sclavonian colonel. My small trunk was laid open before the old woman, to whom was handed an inventory of all its contents, together with six sequins for six months paid in advance. From this small sum she undertook to feed me, to keep me clean, and to send me to a day-school. Protesting that it was not enough, she accepted these terms. I was kissed and strongly commanded to be always Chapter Two of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova, Episode 1, Childhood, Chapter 2. My grandmother comes to Padua and takes me to Dr. Gozzi's school, my first love affair. As soon as I was left alone with this Clavonian woman, she took me up to the garret, where she pointed out my bed in a row with four others, three of which belonged to three young boys of my age, who at that moment were at school, and the fourth to a servant girl whose province it was to watch us and to prevent the many peccadilloes in which schoolboys are wont to indulge. After this visit we came downstairs, and I was taken to the garden with permission to walk about until dinner-time. I felt neither happy nor unhappy. I had nothing to say. I had neither fear nor hope, nor even a feeling of curiosity. I was neither cheerful nor sad. The only thing which grated upon me was the face of the mistress of the house. Although I had not the faintest idea, either of beauty or of ugliness, 
her face, her countenance, her tone of voice, her language, everything in that woman was repulsive to me. Her masculine features repelled me every time I lifted my eyes towards her face to listen to what she said to me. She was tall and coarse like a trooper. Her complexion was yellow, her hair black, her eyebrows long and thick, and her chin gloried in a respectable, bristly beard. To complete the picture, her hideous, half-naked bosom was hanging halfway down her long chest. She may have been about fifty. The servant was a stout country girl who did all the work of the house. The garden was a square of some thirty feet, which had no other beauty than its green appearance. Towards noon my three companions came back from school, and they at once spoke to me as if we had been old acquaintances, naturally giving me credit for such intelligence as belonged to my age, but which I did not possess. I did not answer them, but they were not baffled, and they at last prevailed upon me to share their innocent pleasures." I had to run, to carry and be carried, to turn head over heels, and I allowed myself to be initiated into those arts with a pretty good grace until we were summoned to dinner. I sat down to the table, but seeing before me a wooden spoon, I pushed it back, asking for my silver spoon and fork, to which I was much attached, because they were a gift from my good old granny. The servant answered that the mistress wished to maintain equality between the boys, and I had to submit, much to my disgust. Having thus learned that equality in everything was the rule of the house, I went to work like the others and began to eat the soup out of the common dish, and, if I did not complain of the rapidity with which my companions made it disappear, I could not help wondering at such inequality being allowed. To follow this very poor soup, we had a small portion of dried cod and one apple each, and dinner was over. It was in Lent. We had neither glasses nor cups, and we all helped ourselves out of the same earthen pitcher to a miserable drink called graspia, which is made by boiling in water the stems of grapes stripped of their fruit. From the following day I drank nothing but water. This way of living surprised me, for I did not know whether I had a right to complain of it. After dinner the servant took me to the school, kept by a young priest, Dr. Godsey, with whom this Clavonian woman had bargained for my schooling at the rate of forty sous a month, or the eleventh part of a sequin. The first thing to do was to teach me writing, and I was placed amongst children of five and six years, who did not fail to turn me into ridicule on account of my age. On my return to the boarding-house, I had my supper, which, as a matter of course, was worse than the dinner, and I could not make out why the right of complaint should be denied me. I was then put to bed, but there three well-known species of vermin kept me awake all night, besides the rats, which, running all over the garret, jumped on my bed and fairly made my blood run cold with fright. This is the way in which I began to feel misery, and to learn how to suffer it patiently. The vermin which feasted upon me lessened my fear of the rats, and by a very lucky system of compensation, the dread of the rats made me less sensitive to the bites of the vermin. My mind was reaping benefit from the very struggle fought between the evils which surrounded me. The servant was perfectly deaf to my screaming. As soon as it was daylight I ran out of the wretched garret, and, after complaining to the girl of all I had endured during the night, I asked her to give me a clean shirt, 
the one I had on being disgusting to look at, but she answered that I could only change my linen on a Sunday, and laughed at me when I threatened to complain to the mistress. For the first time in my life I shed tears of sorrow and anger when I heard my companions scoffing at me. The poor wretches shared my unhappy condition, but they were used to it, and that makes all the difference. Sorely depressed, I went to school, but only to sleep soundly through the morning. One of my comrades, in the hope of turning the affair into ridicule at my expense, told the doctor the reason of my being so sleepy. The good priest, however, to whom without doubt providence had guided me, called me into his private room, listened to all I had to say, saw with his own eyes the proofs of my misery, and moved by the sight of the blisters which disfigured my innocent skin, he took up his cloak, went with me to the boarding-house, and showed the woman the state I was in. She put on a look of great astonishment, and threw all the blame upon the servant. The doctor, being curious to see my bed, I was, as much as he was, surprised at the filthy state of the sheets in which I had passed the night. The accursed woman went on blaming the servant, and said that she would discharge her, but the girl, happening to be close by and not relishing the accusation, told her boldly that the fault was her own, and she then threw open the beds of my companions to show us that they did not experience any better treatment. The mistress, raving, slapped her on the face, and the servant, to be even with her, returned the compliment and ran away. The doctor left me there, saying that I could not enter his school unless I was sent to him as clean as the other boys. The result for me was a very sharp rebuke, with the threat, as a finishing stroke, that if I ever caused such a broil again, I would be ignominiously turned out of the house. I could not make it out. I had just entered life, and I had no knowledge of any other place but the house in which I had been born, in which I had been brought up, and in which I had always seen cleanliness and honest comfort." Here I found myself ill-treated, scolded, although it did not seem possible that any blame could be attached to me. At last the old shrew tossed a shirt in my face, and an hour later I saw a new servant changing the sheets, after which we had our dinner. My schoolmaster took particular care in instructing me. He gave me a seat at his own desk, and in order to show my proper appreciation of such a favor, I gave myself up to studies. At the end of the first month I could write so well that I was promoted to the grammar class. The new life I was leading, the half-starvation system to which I was condemned, and most likely more than everything else, the heir of Padua, brought me health such as I had never enjoyed before, but that very state of blooming health made it still more difficult for me to bear the hunger which I was compelled to endure. It became unbearable. I was growing rapidly. I enjoyed nine hours of deep sleep, unbroken by any dreams, save that I always fancied myself sitting at a well-spread table and gratifying my cruel appetite, but every morning I could realize in full the vanity and the unpleasant disappointment of flattering dreams. This ravenous appetite would at last have weakened me to death, had I not made up my mind to pounce upon and to swallow every kind of eatables I could find, whenever I was certain of not being seen. Necessity begets ingenuity. I had spied in a cupboard of the kitchen some fifty red herrings. I devoured them all one after the other, as well as all the sausages which were hanging in the chimney to be smoked, and in order to accomplish those feats without being detected, I was in the habit of getting up at night and of undertaking my foraging expeditions under the friendly veil of darkness. 
Every new laid egg I could discover in the poultry yard, quite warm and scarcely dropped by the hen, was a most delicious treat. I would even go as far as the kitchen of the schoolmaster in the hope of pilfering something to eat. The Sclavonian woman, in despair at being unable to catch the thieves, turned away servant after servant. But in spite of all my expeditions, as I could not always find something to steal, I was as thin as a walking skeleton. My progress at school was so rapid during four or five months that the master promoted me to the rank of ducks. My province was to examine the lessons of my thirty school fellows, to correct their mistakes, and report to the master with whatever note of blame or of approval. I thought they deserved, but my strictness did not last long, for idle boys soon found out the way to enlist my sympathy. When their Latin lesson was full of mistakes, they would buy me off with cutlets and roast chickens. They even gave me money. These proceedings excited my covetousness, or rather my gluttony, and, not satisfied with levying a tax upon the ignorant, I became a tyrant, and I refused well-merited approbation to all those who declined paying the contribution I demanded. At last, unable to bear my injustice any longer, the boys accused me, and the master, seeing me convicted of extortion, removed me from my exalted position. I would very likely have fared badly after my dismissal, had not fate decided to put an end to my cruel apprenticeship. Dr. Godsey, who was so attached to me, called me privately one day into his study, and asked me whether I would feel disposed to carry out the advice he would give me in order to bring about my removal from the house of the Sclavonian woman, and my admission in his own family. Finding me delighted at such an offer, he caused me to copy three letters which I sent, one to the Abbe Grimani, another to my friend Baffo, and the last to my excellent grandam. The half-year was nearly out, and my mother not being in Venice at that period, there was no time to lose. In my letters I gave a description of all my sufferings, and I prognosticated my death were I not immediately removed from my boarding-house and placed under the care of my schoolmaster, who was disposed to receive me, but he wanted two sequins a month. M. Grimani did not answer me, and commissioned his friend Ottaviani to scold me for allowing myself to be ensnared by the doctor. But M. Baffo went to consult with my grandmother, who could not write, and, in a letter which he addressed to me, he informed me that I would soon find myself in a happier situation. And truly, within a week, the excellent old woman who loved me until her death made her appearance as I was sitting down to my dinner. She came in with the mistress of the house, and the moment I saw her, I threw my arms around her neck, crying bitterly in which luxury the old lady soon joined me. She sat down and took me on her knees. My courage rose again. In the presence of the Sclavonian woman, I enumerated all my grievances, and after calling her attention to the food, fit only for beggars, which I was compelled to swallow, I took her upstairs to show her my bed. I begged her to take me out and give me a good dinner after six months of such starvation. The boarding-house keeper boldly asserted that she could not afford better for the amount she had received, and there was truth in that, but she had no business to keep house and to become the tormentor of poor children who were thrown on her hands by stinginess, and who required to be properly fed. My grandmother very quietly intimated her intention to take me away forthwith, and asked her to pull all my things in my trunk. I cannot express my joy during these preparations. For the first time I felt that kind of happiness which makes forgiveness compulsory upon the being who enjoys it, and causes him to forget all previous unpleasantness. My grandmother took me to the inn, and dinner was served. 
but she could hardly eat anything in her astonishment at the voracity with which I was swallowing my food. In the meantime, Dr. Gotzi, to whom she had sent notice of her arrival, came in, and his appearance soon prepossessed her in his favor. He was then a fine-looking priest, twenty-six years of age, chubby, modest, and respectful. In less than a quarter of an hour everything was satisfactorily arranged between them. The good old lady counted out twenty-four sequins for one year of my schooling, and took a receipt for the same. But she kept me with her for three days, in order to have me clothed like a priest, and to get me a wig, as the filthy state of my hair made it necessary to have it all cut off. At the end of the three days she took me to the doctor's house, so as to see herself to my installation, and to recommend me to the doctor's mother, who desired her to send or to buy in Padua a bedstead and bedding. But, the doctor having remarked that, his own bed being very wide, I might sleep with him, my grandmother expressed her gratitude for all his kindness, and we accompanied her as far as the Burchiello she had engaged to return to Venice. The family of Dr. Godzi was composed of his mother, who had great reverence for him, because, a peasant by birth, she did not think herself worthy of having a son who was a priest, and still more a doctor in divinity. She was plain, old, and cross, and of his father, a shoemaker by trade, working all day long and never addressing a word to anyone, not even during the meals. He only became a sociable being on holidays, on which occasions he would spend his time with his friends in some tavern, coming home at midnight as drunk as a lord and singing verses from Tasso. When in this blissful state the good man could not make up his mind to go to bed, and became violent if any one attempted to compel him to lie down, wine alone gave him sense and spirit, for when sober he was incapable of attending to the simplest family matter, and his wife often said that he never would have married her had not his friends taken care to give him a good breakfast before he went to the church. The Dr. Godsey had also a sister called Bettina, who at the age of thirteen was pretty, lively, and a great reader of romances. Her father and mother scolded her constantly because she was too often looking out of the window, and the doctor did the same on account of her love for reading. This girl took at once my fancy without my knowing why, and little by little she kindled in my heart the first spark of a passion which, afterwards became in me the ruling one. Six months after I had been an inmate in the house, the doctor found himself without scholars. They all went away because I had become the sole object of his affection. He then determined to establish a college, and to receive young boys as boarders. But two years passed before he met with any success. During that period he taught me everything he knew. True, it was not much, yet it was enough to open to me the high road to all sciences. He likewise taught me the violin, an accomplishment which proved very useful to me in a peculiar circumstance, the particulars of which I will give in good time. The excellent doctor, who was in no way a philosopher, made me study the logic of the peripatetics and the cosmography of the ancient system of Ptolemy, at which I would laugh, teasing the poor doctor with theorems to which he could find no answer. His habits, moreover, were irreproachable, and in all things connected with religion, although not a bigot, he was of the greatest strictness in admitting everything as an article of faith. Nothing appeared difficult to his conception. He believed the deluge to have been universal, and he thought that, before that great cataclysm, men lived a thousand years and conversed with God. 
that Noah took one hundred years to build the ark, and that the earth, suspended in the air, is firmly held in the very center of the universe which God had created from nothing. When I would say and prove that it was absurd to believe in the existence of nothingness, he would stop me short and call me a fool. He could enjoy a good bed, a glass of wine, and cheerfulness at home. He did not admire fine wits, good jests, or criticisms, because it easily turns to slander, and he would laugh at the folly of men reading newspapers which, in his opinion, always lied and constantly repeated the same things. He asserted that nothing was more troublesome than incertitude, and therefore he condemned thought, because it gives birth to doubt. His ruling passion was preaching, for which his face and his voice qualified him. His congregation was almost entirely composed of women, of whom, however, he was the sworn enemy so much so that he would not look them in the face even when he spoke to them. Weakness of the flesh and fornication appeared to him the most monstrous of sins, and he would be very angry if I dared to assert that, in my estimation, they were the most venial of faults. His sermons were crammed with passages from the Greek authors, which he translated into Latin. One day I ventured to remark that those passages ought to be translated into Italian, because women did not understand Latin any more than Greek. But he took offense, and I never had afterwards the courage to allude any more to the matter. Moreover, he praised me to his friends as a wonder, because I had learned to read Greek alone without any assistance but a grammar. During Lent in the year 1736, my mother wrote to the doctor, and as she was on the point of her departure for St. Petersburg, she wished to see me and requested him to accompany me to Venice for three or four days. This invitation sent him thinking, for he had never seen Venice, never frequented good company, and yet he did not wish to appear a novice in anything. We were soon ready to leave Padua, and all the family escorted us to the Burchiello. My mother received the doctor with a most friendly welcome, but she was strikingly beautiful, and my poor master felt very uncomfortable, not daring to look her in the face, and yet called upon to converse with her. She saw the dilemma he was in, and thought she would have some amusing sport about it, should opportunity present itself. I, in the meantime, drew the attention of everyone in her circle. Everybody had known me as a fool, and was amazed at my improvement in the short space of two years. The doctor was overjoyed, because he saw that the full credit of my transformation was given to him. The first thing which struck my mother unpleasantly was my light-colored wig, which was not in harmony with my dark complexion, and contrasted most woefully with my black eyes and eyebrows. She inquired from the doctor why I did not wear my own hair, and he answered that, with a wig, it was easier for his sister to keep me clean. Everyone smiled at the simplicity of the answer. But the merriment increased when, to the question made by my mother whether his sister was married, I took the answer upon myself, and said that Bettina was the prettiest girl of Padua, and was only fourteen years of age. My mother promised the doctor a splendid present for his sister on condition that she would let me wear my own hair, and he promised her that her wishes would be complied with. The peruke maker was then called, and I had a wig which matched my complexion. Soon afterwards all the guests began to play cards, with the exception of my master, and I went to see my brothers in my grandmother's room. Francois showed me some architectural designs which I pretended to admire. Jean had nothing to show me, and I thought him a rather insignificant boy. The others were still very young. At the supper-table the doctor, seated next to my mother, was very awkward. 
he would very likely not have said one word had not an Englishman, a writer of talent, addressed him in Latin. But the doctor, being unable to make him out, modestly answered that he did not understand English, which caused much hilarity. M. Baffo, however, explained the puzzle by telling us that Englishmen read and pronounced Latin in the same way that they read and spoke their own language, and I remarked that Englishmen were wrong as much as we would be if we pretended to read and pronounce their language according to Latin rules. The Englishman, pleased with my reasoning, wrote down the following old couplet and gave it to me to read. Dicite grammatici, cur mascula nomina cunnus, e cur femineum mentula nomen habet. After reading it aloud, I exclaimed, This is Latin indeed. We know that, said my mother, but can you explain it? To explain it is not enough, I answered. It is a question which is worthy of an answer. And after considering for a moment, I wrote the following pentameter. Dice quod a domino nomina servus habet. This was my first literary exploit, and I may say that in that very instant the seed of my love for literary fame was sown in my breast, for the applause lavished upon me exalted me to the very pinnacle of happiness. The Englishman, quite amazed at my answer, said that no boy of eleven years had ever accomplished such a feat, embraced me repeatedly, and presented me with his watch. My mother, inquisitive like a woman, asked M. Grimani to tell her the meaning of the lines, but as the abbey was not any wiser than she was, M. Baffo translated it in a whisper. Surprised at my knowledge, she rose from her chair to get a valuable gold watch and present it to my master, who, not knowing how to express his deep gratitude, treated us to the most comic scene. My mother, in order to save him from the difficulty of paying her a compliment, offered him her cheek. He had only to give her a couple of kisses, the easiest and the most innocent thing in good company. But the poor man was on burning coals, and so completely out of countenance, that he would, I truly believe, rather have died than give the kisses. He drew back with his head down, and he was allowed to remain in peace until we retired for the night. When we found ourselves alone in our room, he poured out his heart and exclaimed that it was a pity he could not publish in Padua the distich of my answer. And why not, I said, because both are obscene, but they are sublime. Let us go to bed and speak no more on the subject. Your answer was wonderful, because you cannot possibly know anything of the subject in question or the manner in which verses ought to be written. As far as the subject was concerned, I knew it by theory. For, unknown to the doctor, and because he had forbidden it, I had read Meursius, but it was natural that he should be amazed at my being able to write verses when he, who had taught me prosody, never could compose a single line. Nemo dat quod non habet is a false axiom when applied to mental acquirements. Four days afterwards, as we were preparing for our departure, my mother gave me a parcel for Bettina, and M. Grimani presented me with four sequins to buy books. A week later my mother left for St. Petersburg. After our return to Padua, my good master, for three or four months, never ceased to speak of my mother and Bettina, having found in the parcel five yards of black silk and twelve pairs of gloves, became singularly attached to me, and took such good care of my hair that in less than six months I was able to give up wearing the wig. She used to comb my hair every morning, often before I was out of bed, saying that she had not time to wait until I was dressed. 
She washed my face, my neck, my chest, lavished on me childish caresses, which I thought innocent, but which caused me to be angry with myself, because I felt that they excited me. Three years younger than she was, it seemed to me that she could not love me with any idea of mischief, and the consciousness of my own vicious excitement put me out of temper with myself. When, seated on my bed, she would say that I was getting stouter, and would have the proof of it with her own hands, she caused me the most intense emotion. But I said nothing, for fear she would remark my sensitiveness, and when she would go on saying that my skin was soft, the tickling sensation made me draw back, angry with myself that I did not dare to do the same to her, but delighted at her not guessing how I longed to do it. When I was dressed, she often gave me the sweetest kisses, calling me her darling child, but whatever wish I had to follow her example. I was not yet bold enough. After some time, however, Bettina, laughing at my timidity, I became more daring, and returned her kisses with interest, but I always gave way the moment I felt a wish to go further. I then would turn my head, pretending to look for something, and she would go away. She was scarcely out of the room before I was in despair at not having followed the inclination of my nature, and astonished at the fact that Bettina could do to me all she was in the habit of doing without feeling any excitement from it, while I could hardly refrain from pushing my attacks further, I would every day determine to change my way of acting. In the early part of autumn, the doctor received three new boarders, and one of them, who was fifteen years old, appeared to me in less than a month on very friendly terms with Bettina. This circumstance caused me a feeling of which until then I had no idea, and which I only analyzed a few years afterwards. It was neither jealousy nor indignation, but a noble contempt which I thought ought not to be repressed, because Cordiani, an ignorant, coarse boy, without talent or polite education, the son of a simple farmer, and incapable of competing with me in anything, having over me but the advantage of dawning manhood, did not appear to me a fit person to be preferred to me. My young self-esteem whispered that I was above him. I began to nurse a feeling of pride mixed with contempt, which told against Bettina, whom I loved, unknown to myself. She soon guessed it from the way I would receive her caresses, when she came to comb my hair while I was in bed. I would repulse her hands, and no longer return her kisses. One day, vexed at my answering her questions as to the reason of my change towards her by stating that I had no cause for it, she told me in a tone of commiseration that I was jealous of Cordiani. This reproach sounded to me like a debasing slander. I answered that Cordiani was, in my estimation, as worthy of her as she was worthy of him. She went away smiling, but, revolving in her mind the only way by which she could be revenged, she thought herself bound to render me jealous. However, as she could not attain such an end without making me fall in love with her, this is the policy she adopted. One morning she came to me as I was in bed, and brought me a pair of white stockings of her own knitting. After dressing my hair, she asked my permission to try the stockings on herself, in order to correct any deficiency in the other pairs she intended to knit for me. The doctor had gone out to say his mass. As she was putting on the stockings, she remarked that my legs were not clean, and without any more ado, she immediately began to wash them. I would have been ashamed to let her see my bashfulness. I let her do as she liked, not foreseeing what would happen. 
Bettina, seated on my bed, carried too far her love for cleanliness, and her curiosity caused me such intense voluptuousness that the feeling did not stop until it could be carried no further. Having recovered my calm, I bethought myself that I was guilty and begged her forgiveness. She did not expect this, and, after considering for a few moments, she told me kindly that the fault was entirely her own, but that she never would again be guilty of it, and she went out of the room, leaving me to my own thoughts. They were of a cruel character. It seemed to me that I had brought dishonor upon Bettina, that I had betrayed the confidence of her family, offended against the sacred laws of hospitality, that I was guilty of a most wicked crime, which I could only atone for by marrying her, in case Bettina could make up her mind to accept for her husband a wretch unworthy of her. These thoughts led early ceased her morning visits by my bedside. During the first week I could easily account for the girl's reserve, and my sadness would soon have taken the character of the warmest love had not her manners towards cordiani inoculated in my veins the poison of jealousy although i never dreamed of accusing her of the same crime towards him that she had committed upon me i felt convinced after due consideration that the act she had been guilty of with me had been deliberately done and that her feelings of repentance kept her away from me this conviction was rather flattering to my vanity, as it gave me the hope of being loved, and the end of all my cumminings was that I made up my mind to write to her, and thus to give her courage. I composed a letter short, but calculated to restore peace to her mind, whether she thought herself guilty, or suspected me of feelings contrary to those which her dignity might expect from me. My letter was, in my own estimation, a perfect masterpiece, and just the kind of epistle by which I was certain to conquer her very adoration, and to sing forever the son of Cordiani, whom I could not accept as the sort of being likely to make her hesitate for one instant in her choice between him and me. Half an hour after the receipt of my letter, she told me herself that the next morning she would pay me her usual visit, but I waited in vain. This conduct provoked me almost to madness, but my surprise was indeed great when, at the breakfast table, she asked me whether I would let her dress me up as a girl to accompany her five or six days later to a ball for which a neighbor of ours, Dr. Olivo, had sent letters of invitation. Everybody having seconded the motion, I gave my consent. I thought this arrangement would afford a favorable opportunity for an explanation, for mutual vindication, and would open a door for the most complete reconciliation, without fear of any surprise arising from the proverbial weakness of the flesh. But a most unexpected circumstance prevented our attending the ball, and brought forth a comedy with a truly tragic turn. Dr. Godsey's godfather, a man advanced in age and in easy circumstances, residing in the country, thought himself, after severe illness, very near his end, and sent to the doctor a carriage with a request to come to him at once with his father, as he wished them to be present at his death, and to pray for his departing soul. The old shoemaker drained a bottle, donned his Sunday clothes, and went off with his son. I thought this a favorable opportunity, and determined to improve it, considering that the night of the ball was too remote to suit my impatience. I therefore managed to tell Bettina that I would leave ajar the door of my room, and that I would wait for her as soon as everyone in the house had gone to bed. She promised to come. She slept on the ground floor in a small closet, divided only by a partition from her father's chamber. The doctor being away, I was alone in the large room. The three boarders had their apartment in a different part of the house, 
and I had therefore no mishap to fear. I was delighted at the idea that I had at last reached the moment so ardently desired. The instant I was in my room I bolted my door and opened the one leading to the passage, so that Bettina should have only to push it in order to come in. I then put my light out, but did not undress. When we read of such situations in a romance, we think they are exaggerated. They are not so, and the passage in which Ariosto represents Roger waiting for Alcine is a beautiful picture painted from nature. Until midnight I waited without feeling much anxiety, but I heard the clock strike two, three, four o'clock in the morning without seeing Bettina. My blood began to boil, and I was soon in a state of furious rage. It was snowing hard, but I shook from passion more than from cold. One hour before daybreak, unable to master any longer my impatience, I made up my mind to go downstairs with bare feet so as not to wake the dog and to place myself at the bottom of the stairs within a yard of Bettina's door, which ought to have been opened if she had gone out of her room. I reached the door, it was closed, and, as it could be locked only from the inside, I imagined that Bettina had fallen asleep. I was on the point of knocking at the door, but was prevented by fear of five or four yards. Overwhelmed with grief and unable to take a decision, I sat down on the last step of the stairs, but at daybreak, chilled, benumbed, shivering with cold, afraid that the servant would see me and would think I was mad, I determined to go back to my room. I am that I am going to see her, and hope lending me new strength, I draw nearer to the door. It opens, but instead of Bettina coming out, I see Cordiani, who gives me such a furious kick in the stomach that I am thrown at a distance, deep in the snow. Without stopping a single instant, Cordiani is off, and locks himself up in the room which he shared with the brothers Feltrini. I pick myself up quickly with the intention of taking my revenge upon Bettina, whom nothing could have saved from the effects of my rage at that moment. But I find her door locked. I kick vigorously against it, the dog starts a loud barking, and I make a hurried retreat to my room, in which I lock myself up, throwing myself in bed to compose, and heal up my mind and body, for I was half dead. Deceived, humbled, ill-treated, an object of contempt to the happy and triumphant Cordiani, I spent three hours ruminating the darkest schemes of revenge. To poison them both seemed to me but a trifle in that terrible moment of bitter misery. This project gave way to another as extravagant, as cowardly, namely to go at once to her brother and disclose everything to him. I was twelve years of age, and my mind had not yet acquired sufficient coolness to mature schemes of heroic revenge, which are produced by false feelings of honor. This was only my apprenticeship in such adventures. I was in that state of mind when suddenly I heard outside of my door the gruff voice of Bettina's mother, who begged me to come down, adding that her daughter was dying. As I would have been very sorry if she had departed this life before she could feel the effects of my revenge, I got up hurriedly and went downstairs, and surrounded by the whole family. Half dressed, nearly bent in two, she was throwing her body now to the right, now to the left, striking at random with her feet and with her fists, and extricating herself by violent shaking from the hands of those who endeavored to keep her down. With this sight before me and the night's adventure still in my mind, I hardly knew what to think. 
I had no knowledge of human nature, no knowledge of artifice and tricks, and I could not understand how I found myself coolly witnessing such a scene, and composedly calm in the presence of two beings, one of whom I intended to kill, and the other to dishonor. At the end of an hour, Bettina fell asleep. A nurse and Dr. Olivo came soon after. The first said that the convulsions were caused by hysterics, but the doctor said no, and prescribed rest and cold baths. I said nothing, but I could not refrain from laughing at them, for I knew, or rather guessed, that Bettina's sickness was the result of her nocturnal employment, or of the fright which she must have felt at my meeting with Cordiani. At all events, I determined to postpone my revenge until the return of her brother, although I had not the slightest suspicion that her illness was all sham, whom I had to pass through Bettina's closet, and seeing her dress handy on the bed, I took it into my head to search her pockets. I found a small note, and recognizing Cordiani's handwriting, I took possession of it to read it in my room. I marveled at the girl's imprudence, for her mother might have discovered it, and being unable to read would very likely have given it to the doctor, her son. I thought she must have taken leave of her senses, but my feelings may be appreciated when I read the following words. As your father is away, it is not necessary to leave your door ajar as usual. When we leave the supper table, I will go to your closet. You will find me there. When I recovered from my stupor, I gave way to an irresistible fit of laughter, and seeing how completely I had been duped, I thought I was cured of my love. Cordiani appeared to me deserving of forgiveness, and Bettina of contempt. I congratulated myself upon having received a lesson of such importance for the remainder of my life. I even went so far as to acknowledge to myself that Bettina had been quite right in giving the preference to Cordiani, who was fifteen years old, while I was only a child. Yet in spite of my good disposition to forgiveness, the kick administered by Cordiani was still heavy upon my memory, and I could not help keeping a grudge against him. At noon, as we were at dinner in the kitchen, where we took our meals on account of the cold weather, Bettina began again to raise piercing screams. Everybody rushed to her room, but I quietly kept my seat and finished my dinner, after which I went to my studies. In the evening, when I came down to supper, I found that Bettina's bed had been brought to the kitchen close by her mother's, but it was no concern of mine, and I remained likewise perfectly indifferent to the noise made during the night and to the confusion which took place in the morning when she had a fresh fit of convulsions. Dr. Godsey and his father returned in the evening. Cordiani, who felt uneasy, came to inquire from me what my intentions were, but I rushed towards him with an open penknife in my hand, and he beat a hasty retreat. I had entirely abandoned the idea of relating the night's scandalous adventure to the doctor, for such a project I could only entertain in a moment of excitement and rage. The next day the preamble that she had discovered the character of her daughter's illness, that it was caused by a spell thrown over her by a witch, and that she knew careful not to make a mistake. Who is the witch of it? How so? I have barred the door of my room with two broomsticks placed in the shape of a cross, which she must have undone to go in. But when she saw them, she drew back, and she went round by the other door. It is evident that, were she not a witch, she would not be afraid of touching them. It is not complete evidence, dear mother, Send the woman to me. 
The servant made her appearance. Why, said the doctor, did you not enter my mother's room this morning through the usual door? I do not know what you mean. Did you not see the St. Andrew's cross on the door? What cross is that? Where did you sleep last Thursday night? At my niece's, who had just been confined. Nothing of the sort. You were at the witch's Sabbath. You are a witch, and have bewitched my daughter. The poor woman, indignant at such an accusation, spits at her mistress's face. The mistress, enraged, gets hold of a stick to give the servant a drubbing. The doctor endeavors to keep his mother back, but he is compelled to let her loose and to run after the servant, who was hurrying down the stairs, screaming and howling, in order to rouse the neighbors. He catches her and finally succeeds in pacifying her with some money. After this comical but rather scandalous exhibition, the doctor donned his vestments for the purpose of exercising his sister and of ascertaining whether she was truly possessed of an unclean spirit. The novelty of this mystery attracted the whole of my attention. All the inmates of the house appeared to me either mad or stupid, for I could not, for the life of me, imagine that diabolical spirits were dwelling in Bettina's body. When we drew near her bed, her breathing had, to all appearance, stopped, and the exorcisms of her brother did not restore it. Dr. Olivo happened to come in at that moment, and inquired whether if upon which he left, saying that he had no faith in any miracles except in those of the gospel. Soon after Dr. Godsey went to his room, and finding myself alone with Bettina, I bent down over her bed and whispered in her ear, Take courage, get well again, and rely upon my discretion. She turned her head towards the wall and did not answer me. But the day passed off without any more convulsions. I thought I had cured her, but on the following day the frenzy went up to the brain, and in her delirium she pronounced at random Greek and Latin words without any meaning, and then no doubt whatever was entertained of her being possessed of the evil spirit. Her mother went out, and returned soon, accompanied by the most renowned exorcist of Padua, a very ill-featured captain called Friar Prospero da Povolenta. The moment Bettina saw the exorcist, she burst into loud laughter, and addressed to him the most offensive insults, which fairly delighted everybody, as the devil alone could be bold enough to address a capuchin in such a manner. But the holy man, hearing himself called an obtrusive ignoramus and a stinkard, went on striking Bettina with a heavy crucifix, saying that he was beating the devil. He stopped only when he saw her on the point of hurling at him the chamber utensil which she had just seized. "'If it is the devil who has offended thee with his words,' she said, "'resent the insult with words likewise, jack as that thou art. But if I have offended thee myself, learn, stupid booby, that thou must respect me and be off at once.' I could see poor Dr. Godsey blushing. The friar, however, held his ground, and armed at all points began to read a terrible exorcism, at the end of which he commanded the devil to state his name. My name is Bettina. It cannot be, for it is the name of a baptized girl. Then thou art of opinion that a devil must rejoice in a masculine name? Learn, ignorant friar, that a devil is a spirit, and does not belong to either sex. But to answer me with truth, and I will engage to give way before thy incantations. Very well, I agree to this. 
Tell me, then, art thou thinking that thy knowledge is greater than mine? No, but I believe myself more powerful in the name of the Holy Trinity, and by my sacred character. If thou art more powerful than I, then prevent me from telling thee unpalatable truths. Thou art very vain of thy beard, thou art combing and dressing it ten times a day, and thou wouldst not shave half of it to get me out of this body. Cut off thy beard, and I promise to come out. Father of lies, I will increase thy punishment a hundredfold. I dare thee to do it. After saying these words, Bettina broke in such a loud peal of laughter that I could not refrain from joining in it. The capuchin, turning towards Dr. Godsey, told him that I was wanting in faith, and that I ought to leave the room, which I did, remarking that he had guessed rightly. I was not yet out of the room when the friar offered his hand to Bettina for her to kiss, and I had the pleasure of seeing her spit upon it. This strange girl, full of extraordinary talent, made rare sport of the friar, without causing any surprise to see what her purpose was in playing such a part. The capuchin dined with us, and during the meal he uttered a good deal of nonsense. After dinner he returned to Bettina's chamber with the intention of blessing her. But as soon as she caught sight of him, she took up a glass full of some black mixture sent from the apothecary and threw it at his head. Cordiani, being close by the friar, came in for a good share of the liquid, an accident which afforded me the greatest delight. Bettina was quite right to improve her opportunity, as everything she did was, of course, put to the account of the unfortunate devil. Not overmuch pleased, Friar Prospero, as he left the house, told the doctor that there was no doubt of the girl being possessed, but that another exorcist must be sent for, since he had not himself obtained God's grace to eject the evil spirit. After he had gone, Bettina kept very calm for six hours, and in the evening, to our great surprise, she joined us at the supper-table. She told her parents that she felt quite well, spoke to her brother, and then, addressing me, she remarked that, the ball taking place on the morrow, she would come to my room in the morning to dress my hair like a girl's. I thanked her, and said that, as she had been so ill, she ought to nurse herself. She soon retired to bed, and we remained at the table talking to her. When I was undressing for the night, I took up my nightcap, and found in it a small note with these words. You must accompany me to the ball, disguised as a girl, or I will give you a sight which will cause you to weep. I waited until the doctor was asleep, and I wrote the following answer. I cannot go to the ball, because I have fully made up my mind to avoid every opportunity of being alone with you. As for the painful sight with which you threaten to entertain me, I believe you capable of keeping your word. But I entreat you to spare my heart, for I love you as if you were my sister." I have forgiven you, dear Bettina, and I wish to forget everything. I enclose a note, which you must be delighted to have again in your possession. You see what risk you were running when you left it in your pocket? This restitution must convince you of my friendship. End of chapter 2
Chapter One of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova, translated by Arthur Machen. Episode One, Childhood, Chapter Three. Bettina is supposed to go mad. Father Mancia, the smallpox, I leave Padua. Bettina must have been in despair, not knowing into whose hands her letter had fallen, to return it to her, and thus to allay her anxiety. Was therefore a great proof of friendship. But my generosity, at the same time that it freed her from a keen sorrow, must have cost her another quite as dreadful, for she knew that I was master of her secret. Cordiani's letter was perfectly explicit. It gave the strongest evidence that she was in the habit of receiving him every night, and therefore the story she had prepared to deceive me was useless. I felt it was so, and, being disposed to calm her anxiety as far as I could, I went to her bedside in the morning and placed in her hands Cordiani's note, and my answer to her letter. The girl's spirit and talent had won my esteem. I could no longer despise her. I saw in her only a poor creature seduced by her natural temperament. She loved man, and was to be pitied only on account of the consequences. Believing that the view I took of the situation was the right one, I had resigned myself like a reasonable being, and not like a disappointed lover. The shame was for her, and not for me. I had only one wish, namely, to find out whether the two brothers, Feltrini, Cordiani's companions, had likewise shared Bettina's favors. Bettina put on throughout the day a cheerful and happy look. In the evening she dressed herself for the ball, but suddenly an attack of sickness whether feigned or real I did not know, compelled her to go to bed, and frightened everybody in the house. As for myself, knowing the whole affair, I was prepared for new scenes, and indeed for sad ones, for I felt that I had obtained over her a power repugnant to her vanity and self-love. I must, however, confess that, in spite of the excellent school in which I found myself before I had attained manhood, and which ought to have given me experience as a shield for the future. I have through the whole of my life been the dupe of women. Twelve years ago, if it had not been for my guardian angel, I would have foolishly married a young, thoughtless girl with whom I had fallen in love. Now that I am seventy-two years old, I believe myself no longer susceptible to such follies. But alas! That is the very thing which causes me to be miserable. The next day the whole family was deeply grieved, because the devil, of whom Bettina was possessed, had made himself master of her reason. Dr. Gozzi told me that there could not be the shadow of a doubt that his unfortunate sister was possessed, as, if she had only been mad, she never would have so cruelly ill-treated the capuchin, Prospero, and he determined to place her under the care of Father Mancia. This Mancia was a celebrated Jacobin, or Dominican, exorcist, who enjoyed the reputation of never having failed to cure a girl possessed of the demon. Sunday had come. Bettina had made a good dinner, but she had been frantic all through the day. Towards midnight her father came home, singing Tasso as usual, and so drunk that he could not stand. He went up to Bettina's bed, and after kissing her affectionately, he said to her, Thou art not mad, my girl. Her answer was that he was not drunk. Thou art possessed of the devil, my dear child. Yes, father, and you alone can cure me. Well, I am ready. Upon this, our shoemaker begins a theological discourse, expatiating upon the power of faith, 
and upon the virtue of the paternal blessing. He throws off his cloak, takes a crucifix in one hand, places the other over the head of his daughter, and addresses the devil in such an amusing way that even his wife, always a stupid, dull, cross-grained old woman, had to laugh till the tears came down her cheek. The two performers in the comedy alone were not laughing, and this serious countenance added to the fun of the performance. I marvelled at Bettina, who was always ready to enjoy a good laugh, having sufficient control over herself to remain calm and grave. Dr. Gozzi had also given way to merriment, but begged that the farce should come to an end, for he deemed that his father's eccentricities were as many profanations against the sacredness of exorcism. At last the exorcist, doubtless tired out, went to bed, saying that he was certain that the devil would not disturb his daughter during the night. On the morrow, just as we had finished our breakfast, Father Mancia made his appearance. Dr. Gozzi, followed by the whole family, escorted him to his sister's bedside. As for me, I was entirely taken up by the farce of the monk. Here is his portrait. His figure was tall and majestic, his age about thirty. He had light hair and blue eyes. His features were close to those of Apollo, but without his pride and assuming haughtiness. His complexion, dazzling white, was pale, but that paleness seemed to have been given for the very purpose of showing off the red coral of his lips, through which could be seen, when they opened, two rows of pearls. He was neither thin nor stout, and the habitual sadness of his countenance enhanced its sweetness. His gait was low, his air timid, an indication of the great modesty of his mind. When we entered the room Bettina was asleep, or pretended to be so. Father Mancia took a sprinkler and threw over her a few drops of holy water. She opened her eyes, looked at the monk, and closed them immediately. A little while after she opened them again, had a better look at him, laid herself on her back, let her arms droop down gently, and with her head pettily bent on one side, she fell into the sweetest of slumbers. The exorcist, standing by the bed, took out his pocket ritual, and the stole, which he put round his neck, then a reliquary, which he placed on the bosom of the sleeping girl, and with the air of a saint, he begged all of us to fall on our knees and to pray, so that God should let him know whether the patient was possessed, or only laboring under a natural disease. He kept us kneeling for half an hour, reading all the time in a low tone of voice. Bettina did not stir. Tired, I suppose, of the performance, he desired to speak privately with Dr. Gozzi. They passed into the next room, out of which they emerged after a quarter of an hour, brought back by a loud peal of laughter from the mad girl, who, when she saw them, turned her back on them. Father Mancia smiled, dipped the sprinkler over and over in the holy water, gave us all a generous shower, and took his leave. Dr. Gozzi told us that the exorcist would come again on the morrow, and that he had promised to deliver Bettina within three hours if she were truly possessed of the demon, but that he made no promise if it should turn out to be a case of madness. The mother exclaimed that he would surely deliver her, and she poured out her thanks to God for having allowed her the grace of beholding a saint before her death. The following day, Bettina was in a fine frenzy. She began to utter the most extravagant speeches that a poet could imagine, and did not stop. When the charming exorcist came into her room, he seemed to enjoy her foolish talk for a few minutes, after which, having armed himself cap a pied, he begged us to withdraw. His order was obeyed instantly. We left the chamber, and the door remained open. But what did it matter? 
who would have been bold enough to go in? During three long hours, we heard nothing. The stillness was unbroken. At noon, the monk called us in. Bettina was there sad and very quiet, while the exorcist packed up his things. He took his departure, saying he had very good hopes of the case, and requesting that the doctor would send him news of the patient. Bettina partook of dinner in her bed, got up for supper, and the next day behaved herself rationally. But the following circumstance strengthened my opinion that she had been neither insane nor possessed. It was two days before the purification of the Holy Virgin. Dr. Gotzi was in the habit of giving us the sacrament in his own church, but he always sent us for our confession to the church of St. Augustine, in which the Jacobins of Padua officiated. At the supper-table he told us to prepare ourselves for the next day, and his mother, addressing us, said, You ought, all of you, to confess to Father Mancia, so as to obtain absolution from that holy man. I intend to go to him myself. Cordiani and the two Feltrini agreed to the proposal. I remained silent, but as the idea was unpleasant to me, I concealed the feeling, with a full determination to prevent the execution of the project. I had entire confidence in the secrecy of confessions, and I was incapable of making a false one. But knowing that I had a right to choose my confessor, I most certainly never would have been so simple as to confess to Father Mancia what had taken place between me and the girl, because he would have easily guessed that the girl could be no other but Bettina. Besides, I was satisfied that Cordiani would confess everything to the monk, and I was deeply sorry. Early the next morning, Bettina brought me a band for my neck, and gave me the following letter. Spurn me, but respect my honor, and the shadow of peace to which I aspire. No one from this house must confess to Father Mancia. You alone can prevent the execution of that project, and I need not suggest the way to succeed. It will prove whether you have some friendship for me. I could not express the pity I felt for the poor girl, as I read that note. In spite of that feeling, this is what I answered. I can well understand that, notwithstanding the inviolability of confession, your mother's proposal should cause you great anxiety, but I cannot see why, in order to prevent its execution, you should depend upon me rather than upon Cordiani, who has expressed his acceptance of it. All I can promise you is that I will not be one of those who may go to Father Mancia, but I have no influence over your lover. You alone can speak to him. She replied, I have never addressed a word to Cordiani since the fatal night which has sealed my misery, and I never will speak to him again, even if I could by so doing recover my lost happiness. To you alone I wish to be indebted for my life and for my honor. The girl appeared to me more wonderful than all the heroines of whom I had read in novels. It seemed to me that she was making sport of me with the most barefaced effrontery. I thought she was trying to fetter me again with her chains, and although I had no inclination for them, I made up my mind to render her the service she claimed at my hands, and which she believed I alone could compass. She felt certain of her success, but in what school had she obtained her experience of human heart? Was it in reading novels? Most likely, the reading of a certain class of novels causes the ruin of a great many young girls, but I am of opinion that from good romances they acquire graceful manners and a knowledge of society. Having made up my mind to show her every kindness in my power, I took an opportunity, as we were undressing for the night, of telling Dr. Godsey that for conscientious motives I could not confess to Father Mancia and yet that I did not wish to be an exception in that matter. He kindly answered that he understood my reasons, 
and that he would take us all to the church of St. Antoine. I kissed his hands in token of my gratitude. On the following day, everything having gone according to her wishes, I saw Bettina sit down to the table with a face beaming with satisfaction. In the afternoon, I had to go to bed in consequence of a wound in my foot. The doctor accompanied his pupils to church, and Bettina, being alone, availed herself of the opportunity, came to my room, and sat down on my bed. I had expected her visit, and I received it with pleasure, as it heralded an explanation for which I was positively longing. She began by expressing a hope that I would not be angry with her for seizing the first opportunity she had of some conversation with me. No, I answered, for you thus afford me an occasion of assuring you that, my feelings toward you being those of a friend only, you need not have any fear of my causing you any anxiety or pleasure. Therefore, Bettina, you may do whatever suits you. My love is no more. You have, at one blow, given the death-stroke to the intense passion which was blossoming in my heart. When I reached my room, after the ill-treatment I had experienced at Cordiani's hands, I felt for you nothing but hatred. That feeling soon merged into utter contempt, but that sensation itself was in time, when my mind recovered its balance, changed for a feeling of the deepest indifference, which again has given way when I saw what power there is in your mind. I have now become your friend. I have conceived the greatest esteem for your cleverness. I have been the dupe of it. But no matter. That talent of yours does exist. It is wonderful, divine. I admire it, I love it, and the highest homage I can render to it is, in my estimation, to foster for the possessor of it the purest feelings of friendship. Reciprocate that friendship. Be true sincere, and plain dealing. Give up all nonsense, for you have already obtained from me all I can give you. The very thought of love is repugnant to me. I can bestow my love only, where I feel certain of being the only one loved. You are at liberty to lay my foolish delicacy to the account of my youthful age, but I feel so, and I cannot help it. You have written to me that you never speak to Cordiani, if I am the cause of that rupture between you, I regret it, and I think that, in the interest of your honour, you would do well to make it up with him. For the future, I must be careful never to give him any grounds for umbrage or suspicion. Recollect also that, if you have tempted him by the same manoeuvres which you have employed towards me, you are doubly wrong, for it may be that, if he truly loves you, you have caused him to be miserable. All you have just said to me, answered Bettina, is grounded upon false impressions and deceptive appearances. I do not love Cordiani, and I never had any love for him, on the contrary. I have felt, and I do feel for him, a hatred which he has richly deserved, and I hope to convince you, in spite of every appearance which seems to convict me. As to the reproach of seduction, I entreat you to spare me such an accusation. On our side, consider that, if you had not yourself thrown temptation in my way, I never would have committed towards you an action of which I have deeply repented, for reasons which you do not know, but which you must learn from me. The fault I have been guilty of is a serious one, only because I did not foresee the injury it would do me in the inexperienced mind of the ingrate who dares to reproach me with it. Bettina was shedding tears. All she had said was not unlikely and rather complimentary to my vanity, but I had seen too much. Besides, I knew the extent of her cleverness, and it was very natural to lend her a wish to deceive me. How could I help thinking that her visit to me was prompted only by her self-love being too deeply wounded to let me enjoy a victory so humiliating to herself? Therefore, unshaken in my preconceived opinion, I told her that I placed implicit confidence in all she had just said respecting the state of her heart previous to the playful nonsense 
which had been the origin of my love for her, and that I promised never in the future to allude again to my accusation of seduction. But, I continued, confess that the fire at that time burning in your bosom was only of short duration, and that the slightest breath of wind had been enough to extinguish it. Your virtue, which went astray for only one instant, and which has so suddenly recovered its mastery over your senses, deserves some praise. You, with all your deep adoring love for me, became all at once blind to my sorrow, whatever care I took to make it clear to your sight. It remains for me to learn how that virtue could be so very dear to you, at the very time that Cordiani took care to wreck it every night. Bettina eyed me with the air of triumph which perfect confidence in victory gives to a person, and said, You have just reached the point where I wished you to be. You shall not be made aware of things which I could not explain before, owing to your refusing the appointment which I then gave you for no other purpose than to tell you all the truth. Cordiani declared his love for me a week after he became an inmate in our house. He begged my consent to a marriage, if his father made the demand of my hand as soon as he could have completed his studies. My answer was that I did not know him sufficiently, that I could form no idea on the subject, and I requested him not to allude to it any more. He appeared to have quietly given up the matter, but soon after I found out that it was not the case. He begged me one day to come to his room now and then to dress his hair. I told him I had no time to spare, and he remarked that you were more fortunate. I laughed at this reproach, as every one here knew that I had the care of you. It was a fortnight after my refusal to Cordiani that I unfortunately spent an hour with you in that loving nonsense which has naturally given you ideas, until then unknown to your senses. That hour made me very happy. I loved you, and having given way to every natural desires, I reveled in my enjoyment without the slightest remorse of conscience. I was longing to be again with you the next morning, but after supper misfortune laid for the first time its hands upon me. Cordiani slipped in my hands this note, and this letter which I have since hidden in a hole on the wall, with the intention of showing them to you at the first opportunity. Seeing this, Bettina handed me the note and the letter. The first ran as follows. Admit me this evening in your closet, the door of which, leading to the yard, can be left ajar, or prepare yourself to make the best of it with the doctor, to whom I intend to deliver, if you should refuse my request, the letter of which I enclose a copy. Chapter 3, Part 2 of The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova. Volume 1. The Venetian Years. By Giacomo Casanova. Translated by Arthur Mackin. Episode 1. Childhood. Chapter 3. Part 2. The letter contained the statement of a cowardly and enraged informer, and would certainly have caused the most unpleasant results. In that letter, Cordiani informed the doctor that his sister spent her mornings with me in criminal connection while he was saying his mass, and he pledged himself to enter into particulars which would leave him no doubt. After giving to the case the consideration it required, continued Bettina, I made up my mind to hear that monster, but my determination being fixed, I put in my pocket my father's stiletto, and holding my door ajar, I waited for him there, unwilling to let him come in as my closet is divided only by a thin partition from the room of my father, whom the slightest noise might have roused up. My first question to Cardiani was in reference to the slander contained in the letter he threatened to deliver to my brother. He answered that it was no slander, 
for he had been a witness to everything that had taken place in the morning through a hole he had bored in the garret just above your bed, and to which he would apply his eye the moment he knew that I was in your room. He wound up by threatening to discover everything to my brother and to my mother, unless I granted him the same favours I had bestowed upon you. In my just indignation I loaded him with the most bitter insults. I called him a cowardly spy and slanderer, for he could not have seen anything but childish playfulness, and I declared to him that he need not flatter himself that any threat would compel me to give the slightest compliance to his wishes. He then begged and begged my pardon a thousand times, and went on assuring me that I must lay to my rigour the odium of the step he had taken, the only excuse for it being in the fervent love I had kindled in his heart, and which made him miserable. He acknowledged that his letter might be a slander, that he had acted treacherously, and he pledged his honour never to attempt obtaining from me by violence favours which he desired to merit only by the constancy of his love. I then thought myself to some extent compelled to say that I might love him at some future time, and to promise that I would not again come near your bed during the absence of my brother. In this way I dismissed him satisfied, without his daring to beg for so much as a kiss, but with the promise that we might now and then have some conversation in the same place. As soon as he left me I went to bed, deeply grieved that I could no longer see you in the absence of my brother, and that I was unable, for fear of consequences, to let you know the reason of my change. Three weeks passed off in that position, and I cannot express what have been my sufferings, for you, of course, urged me to come, and I was always under the painful necessity of disappointing you. I even feared to find myself alone with you, for I felt certain that I could not have refrained from telling you the cause of the change in my conduct. To crown my misery, add that I found myself compelled, at least once a week, to receive the vile Cordiani outside of my room and to speak to him in order to check his impatience with a few words. At last, unable to bear up any longer under such misery, threatened likewise by you, I determined to end my agony. I wished to disclose to you all this intrigue, leaving to you the care of bringing a change for the better, and for that purpose I proposed that you should accompany me to the ball disguised as a girl, although I knew it would enrage Cordiani, but my mind was made up. You knew how my scheme fell to the ground. The unexpected departure of my brother with my father suggested to both of you the same idea, and it was before receiving Cordiani's letter that I promised to come to you. Cardiani did not ask for an appointment. He only stated that it would be waiting for me in my closet, and I had no opportunity of telling him that I could not allow him to come, any more than I could find time to let you know that I would be with you only after midnight, as I intended to do, for I reckoned that after an hour's talk I would dismiss the wretch to his room. But my reckoning was wrong. Cardiani had conceived a scheme, and I could not help listening to all he had to say about it. His whining and exaggerated complaints had no end. He upbraided me for refusing to further the plan he had concocted, and which he thought I would accept with rapture if I loved him. The scheme was for me to elope with him during Holy Week, and to run away to Ferrara, where he had an uncle who would have given us a kind welcome, and would soon have brought his father to forgive him and to ensure our happiness for life. The objections I made— his answers, the details to be entered into, the explanations and the ways and means to be examined to obviate the difficulties of the project, took up the whole night. My heart was bleeding as I thought of you, but my conscience is at rest, and I did nothing that could render me unworthy of your esteem. You cannot refuse it to me, unless you believe that the confession I have just made is untrue, but you would be both mistaken and unjust." Had I made up my mind to sacrifice myself and to grant favours which love alone ought to obtain, I might have got rid of the treacherous wretch within one hour, but death seemed preferable to such a dreadful expedient. Could I in any way suppose that you were outside of my door, exposed to the wind and to the snow? Both of us were deserving of pity, but my misery was still greater than yours. All these fearful circumstances were written in the Book of Fate— to make me lose my reason, which now returns only at intervals, and I am in constant dread of a fresh attack of those awful convulsions. They say I am bewitched and possessed of the demon. I do not know anything about it, but if it should be true, I am the most miserable creature in existence. 
Bettina ceased speaking, and burst into a violent storm of tears, sobs, and groans. I was deeply moved, although I felt that all she had said might be true, and yet was scarcely worthy of belief. Force et rever, manon pero credibile, acci del senso sua fosse signor. But she was weeping, and her tears, which at all events were not deceptive, took away from me the faculty of doubt. Yet I put her tears to the account of her wounded self-love. To give way entirely, I needed a thorough conviction, and to obtain it, evidence was necessary. Probability was not enough. I could not admit either Cordiani's moderation or Bettina's patience, or the fact of seven hours employed in innocent conversation. In spite of all these considerations, I felt a sort of pleasure in accepting for ready cash all the counterfeit coins that she had spread out before me. After drying her tears, Bettina fixed her beautiful eyes upon mine, thinking that she could discern in them evident signs of her victory. But I surprised her much by alluding to one point which, with all her cunning, she had neglected to mention in her defence. Rhetoric makes use of nature's secrets in the same way as painters who try to imitate it. Their most beautiful work is false. This young girl, whose mind had not been refined by study, aimed at being considered innocent and artless, and she did her best to succeed, but I had seen too good a specimen of her cleverness. "'Well, my dear Mettina,' I said, "'your story has affected me. But how do you think I am going to accept your convulsions as natural, and to believe in the demoniac symptoms which came on so seasonably during the exorcisms, although you very properly expressed your doubts on the matter?' Hearing this, Bettina stared at me, remaining silent for a few minutes. Then, casting her eyes down, she gave way to fresh tears, exclaiming now and then, "'Poor me! Oh, poor me!' This situation, however, becoming most painful to me, I asked what I could do for her. She answered in a sad tone that if my heart did not suggest to me what to do, she did not herself see what she could demand of me. "'I thought,' said she, "'that I would reconquer my lost influence over your heart, but I see it too plainly.' you no longer feel an interest in me. Go on treating me harshly. Go on taking for mere fictions sufferings which are but too real, which you have caused, and which you will now increase. Some day, but too late, you will be sorry, and your repentance will be bitter indeed. As she pronounced these words, she rose to take her leave, but, judging her capable of anything, I felt afraid, and I detained her to say that the only way to regain my affection was to remain one month without convulsions and without handsome Father Mancia's presence being required. "'I cannot help being convulsed,' she answered. "'But what do you mean by applying to the Jacobin that epithet of handsome? Could you suppose—' "'Not at all, not at all. I suppose nothing. To do so, it would be necessary for me to be jealous.' but I cannot help saying that the preference given by your devils to the exorcism of that handsome monk over the incantations of the ugly capuchin is likely to give birth to remarks rather detrimental to your honour. Moreover, you are free to do whatever pleases you. Thereupon she left my room, and a few minutes later everybody came home. After supper the servant, without any question on my part, informed me that Bettina had gone to bed with violent feverish chills, having previously had her bed carried into the kitchen beside her mother's. This attack of fever might be real, but I had my doubts. I felt certain that she would never make up her mind to be well, for her good health would have supplied me with too strong an argument against her pretended innocence, even in the case of Cordiani. I likewise considered her idea of having her bed placed near her mother's nothing but artful contrivance. The next day Dr. Olivo found her very feverish, and told her brother that she would most likely be excited and delirious, but that it would be the effect of the fever, and not the work of the devil. And, truly, Bettina was raving all day, but Dr. Gozzi, placing implicit confidence in the physician, would not listen to his mother, and did not send for the Jacobin friar. The fever increased in violence, and on the fourth day the smallpox broke out. Cardiani and the two brothers Feitrini, who had so far escaped that disease, were immediately sent away, but, as I had had it before, I remained at home. The poor girl was so fearfully covered with a loathsome eruption that on the sixth day her skin could not be seen on any part of her body. Her eyes closed, 
and her life was despaired of when it was found that her mouth and throat were obstructed to such a degree that she could swallow nothing but a few drops of honey. She was perfectly motionless, she breathed, and that was all. Her mother never left her bedside, and I was thought a saint when I carried my table and my books into the patient's room. The unfortunate girl had become a fearful sight to look upon. Her head was dreadfully swollen, the nose could no longer be seen, and much fear was entertained for her eyes, in case her life should be spared. The odour of her perspiration was most offensive, but I persisted in keeping my watch by her. On the ninth day the vicar gave her absolution, and after administering extreme unction he left her, as he said, in the hands of God. In the midst of so much sadness, the conversation of the mother with her son would, in spite of myself, cause me some amount of merriment. The good woman wanted to know whether the demon who was dwelling in her child could still influence her to perform extravagant follies, and what would become of the demon in the case of her daughter's death for, as she expressed it, she could not think of his being so stupid as to remain in so loathsome a body. She particularly wanted to ascertain whether the demon had power to carry off the soul of her child. Dr. Gutsy, who was a ubiquitarian, made to all those questions answers which had not even the shadow of good sense, and which of course had no other effect than to increase a hundredfold the perplexity of his poor mother. During the tenth and eleventh days, Bettina was so bad that we thought every moment likely to be her last. The disease had reached its worst period. The smell was unbearable. I alone would not leave her, so sorely did I pity her. The heart of man is indeed an unfathomable abyss, for, however incredible it may appear, it was while in that fearful state that Bettina inspired me with the fondness which I showed her after her recovery. On the thirteenth day the fever abated, but the patient began to experience great irritation owing to a dreadful itching, which no remedy could have allayed as effectually as these powerful words which I kept constantly pouring into her ear. Bettina, you are getting better, but if you dare to scratch yourself, you will become such a fright that nobody will ever love you. All the physicians in the universe might be challenged to prescribe a more potent remedy against itching for a girl who, aware that she has been pretty, finds herself exposed to the loss of her beauty through her own fault if she scratches herself. At last her fine eyes opened again to the light of heaven. She was moved to her own room, but she had to keep her bed until Easter. She inoculated me with a few pucks, three of which have left upon my face everlasting marks, but in her eyes they gave me credit for great devotedness, for they were a proof of my constant care, and she felt that I indeed deserved her whole love. And she truly loved me, and I returned her love, although I never plucked a flower which fate and prejudice kept in store for a husband. But what a contemptible husband! Two years later she married a shoemaker by name Pigozzo a base, errant knave, who beggared and ill-treated her to such an extent that her brother had to take her home and to provide for her. Fifteen years afterwards, having been appointed archpriest at St. Georges de la Vallée, he took her there with him, and when I went to pay him a visit eighteen years ago, I found Bettina old, ill, and dying. She breathed her last in my arms in 1776, twenty-four hours after my arrival. I will speak of her death in good time." About that period my mother returned from St. Petersburg, where the Empress Anne Ivanovna had not approved of the Italian comedy. The whole of the troupe had already returned to Italy, and my mother had travelled with Carlin Bertinazzi, the Harlequin, who died in Paris in the year 1783. As soon as she had reached Padua, she informed Dr. Gozzi of her arrival, and he lost no time in accompanying me to the inn where she had put up. We dined with her, and before bidding us adieu, she presented the doctor with a splendid fur, and gave me the skin of a lynx for Bettina. Six months afterwards she summoned me to Venice, as she wished to see me before leaving for Dresden, where she had contracted an engagement for life in the service of the Elector of Saxony, Augustus the Third, King of Poland. She took with her my brother Jean, then eight years old, who was weeping bitterly when he left. I thought him very foolish, for there was nothing very tragic in that departure. He is the only one in the family who was wholly indebted to our mother for his fortune, although he was not her favourite child. I spent another year in Padua, 
studying law, in which I took the degree of doctor in my sixteenth year, the subject of my thesis being in the civil law, the testamentis, and in the canon law, utrum hebrai possint construere novas synagogas. My vocation was to study medicine, and to practice it, for I felt a great inclination for that profession. But no heed was given to my wishes, and I was compelled to apply myself to the study of the law, for which I had an invincible repugnance. My friends were of opinion that I could not make my fortune in any profession but that of an advocate, and, what is still worse, of an ecclesiastical advocate. If they had given the matter proper consideration, they would have given me leave to follow my own inclinations, and I would have been a physician, a profession in which quackery is of still greater avail than in the legal business. I never became either a physician or an advocate, and I never would apply to a lawyer when I had any legal business, nor call in a physician when I happened to be ill. Lawsuits and pettifoggery may support a good many families, but a greater proportion is ruined by them, and those who perish in the hands of physicians are more numerous by far than those who get cured. Strong evidence, in my opinion, that mankind would be much less miserable without either lawyers or doctors." To attend the lectures of the professors, I had to go to the university, called the Bow, and it became necessary for me to go out alone. This was a matter of great wonder to me, for until then I had never considered myself a free man, and in my wish to enjoy fully the liberty I thought I had just conquered, it was not long before I had made the very worst acquaintances amongst the most renowned students. As a matter of course, the most renowned were the most worthless, dissolute fellows, gamblers, frequenters of disorderly houses, hard drinkers, debauchees, tormentors and suborners of honest girls, liars, and wholly incapable of any good or virtuous feeling. In the company of such men did I begin my apprenticeship of the world, learning my lesson from the book of experience. The theory of morals and its usefulness through the life of man can be compared to the advantage derived by running over the index of a book before reading it. When we have perused that index, we know nothing but the subject of the work. This is like the school for morals offered by the sermons, the precepts, and the tales which our instructors recite for our especial benefit. We lend our whole attention to those lessons, but when an opportunity offers of profiting by the advice thus bestowed upon us, we feel inclined to ascertain for ourselves whether the result will turn out as predicted. We give way to that very natural inclination— and punishment speedily follows with concomitant repentance. Our only consolation lies in the fact that in such moments we are conscious of our own knowledge, and consider ourselves as having earned the right to instruct others. But those to whom we wish to impart our experience act exactly as we have acted before them, and, as a matter of course, the world remains in statu quo, or grows worse and worse. When Dr. Gotzi granted me the privilege of going out alone, he gave me an opportunity for the discovery of several truths which, until then, were not only unknown to me, but the very existence of which I had never suspected. On my first appearance the boldest scholars got hold of me and sounded my death. Finding that I was a thorough freshman, they undertook my education, and with that worthy purpose in view they allowed me to fall blindly into every trap. They taught me gambling, won the little I possessed, and then they made me play upon trust and put me up to dishonest practices in order to procure the means of paying my gambling debts, but I acquired at the same time the sad experience of sorrow. Yet these hard lessons proved useful, for they taught me to mistrust the impudent sycophants who openly flattered their dupes, and never to rely upon the offers made by fawning flatterers. They taught me likewise how to behave in the company of quarrelsome duelists, the society of whom ought to be avoided, unless we make up our minds to be constantly in the very teeth of danger. I was not caught in the snares of professional lewd women, because not one of them was in my eyes as pretty as Bettina, but I did not resist so well the desire for that species of vain glory which is the reward of holding life at a cheap price. In those days the students in Padua enjoyed very great privileges, which were in reality abuses made legal through prescription the primitive characteristic of privileges, which differ essentially from prerogatives. In fact, in order to maintain the legality of their privileges, the students often committed crimes. The guilty were dealt with tenderly, 
because the interest of the city demanded that severity should not diminish the great influx of scholars who flocked to that renowned university from every part of Europe. The practice of the Venetian government was to secure at a high salary the most celebrated professors, and to grant the utmost freedom to the young men attending their lessons. The students acknowledged no authority but that of a chief chosen among themselves, and called syndic. He was usually a foreign nobleman, who could keep a large establishment, and who was responsible to the government for the behaviour of the scholars. It was his duty to give them up to justice when they transgressed the laws, and the students never disputed his sentence, because he always defended them to the utmost when they had the slightest shadow of right on their side. The students, amongst other privileges, would not suffer their trunks to be searched by custom-house authorities, and no ordinary policeman would have dared to arrest one of them. They carried about them forbidden weapons, seduced helpless girls, and often disturbed the public peace by their nocturnal broils and impudent practical jokes. In one word, they were a body of young fellows whom nothing could restrain, who would gratify every whim, and enjoy their sport without regard or consideration for any human being. It was about that time that a policeman entered a coffee-room in which were seated two students. One of them ordered him out, but the man taking no notice of it, the student fired a pistol at him, and missed his aim. The policeman returned the fire, wounded the aggressor, and ran away. The students immediately mustered together at the bow, divided into bands, and went over the city, hunting the policemen to murder them, and avenge the insult they had received. In one of the encounters two of the students were killed, and all the others, assembling in one troop, swore never to lay their arms down as long as there should be one policeman alive in Padua. The authorities had to interfere, and the syndic of the students undertook to put a stop to hostilities, provided proper satisfaction was given as the police were in the wrong. The man who had shot the student in the coffee-room was hanged, and peace was restored, but during the eight days of agitation, as I was anxious not to appear less brave than my comrades who were patrolling the city, I followed them, in spite of Dr. Gotzi's remonstrances. Armed with a carbine and a pair of pistols, I ran about the town with the others, in quest of the enemy, and I recollect how disappointed I was, because the troop to which I belonged did not meet one policeman. When the war was over, the doctor laughed at me, but Bettina admired my valour. Unfortunately, I indulged in expenses far above my means, owing to my unwillingness to seem poorer than my new friends. I sold or pledged everything I possessed, and I contracted debts which I could not possibly pay. This state of things caused my first sorrows, and they are the most poignant sorrows under which a young man can smart. Not knowing which way to turn, I wrote to my excellent grandmother, begging her assistance, but instead of sending me some money, she came to Padua on the 1st of October, 1739, and, after thanking the doctor and Bettina for all their affectionate care, she brought me back to Venice. As he took leave of me, the doctor, who was shedding tears, gave me what he prized most on earth— a relic of some saint, which perhaps I might have kept to this very day, had not the setting been of gold. It performed only one miracle, that of being of service to me in a moment of great need. Whenever I visited Padua to complete my study of the law, I stayed at the house of the kind doctor, but I was always grieved at seeing near Bettina the brute to whom she was engaged, and who did not appear to me deserving of such a wife. I have always regretted that a prejudice, of which I soon got rid, should have made me preserve for that man a f Chapter 4, Part A of The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Chapter 4, Part A. Chapter 4 
I receive the minor orders from the Patriarch of Venice. I get acquainted with Senator Malipiero, with Therese Eimer, with the niece of the curate, with Madame Orio, with Nanette and Martin, and with the Cavamacchia. I become a preacher. My adventure with Lucy at Pazian, a rendezvous on the third story. He comes from Padua, where he has completed his studies. Such were the words by which I was everywhere introduced, and which, the moment they were uttered, called upon me the silent observation of every young man of my age and condition, the compliments of all fathers, and the caresses of old women, as well as the kisses of a few who, although not old, were not sorry to be considered so for the sake of embracing a young man without impropriety. The curate of St. Samuel, the Abbe Giosello, presented me to Monsignor Correre, Patriarch of Venice, who gave me the tonsure, and who, four months afterwards, by special favor, admitted me to the four minor orders. No words could express the joy and the pride of my grandmother. Excellent masters were given to me to continue my studies, and M. Buffo chose the Abbe Schiavo to teach me a pure Italian style, especially poetry, for which I had a decided talent. I was very comfortably lodged with my brother Francois, who was studying theatrical architecture. My sister and my youngest brother were living with our grand dame in a house of her own, in which it was her wish to die, because her husband had there breathed his last. The house in which I dwelt was the same in which my father had died, and the rent of which my mother continued to pay. It was large and well furnished. Although Abbe Grimani was my chief protector, I seldom saw him, and I particularly attached myself to M. de Malipiero, to whom I had been presented by the curate Iosello. M. de Malipiero was a senator, who was unwilling at seventy years of age to attend any more to state affairs, and enjoyed a happy, sumptuous life in his mansion, surrounded every evening by a well-chosen party of ladies who had all known how to make the best of their younger days, and of gentlemen who were always acquainted with the news of the town. He was a bachelor and wealthy, but, unfortunately, he had three or four times every year severe attacks of gout, which always left him crippled in some part or other of his body, so that all his person was disabled. His head, his lungs, and his stomach had alone escaped this cruel havoc. He was still a fine man, a great epicure, and a good judge of wine. His wit was keen, his knowledge of the world extensive, his eloquence worthy of a son of Venice, and he had that wisdom which must naturally belong to a senator who for forty years had had the management of public affairs, and to a man who has bid farewell to women after having possessed twenty mistresses, and only when he felt himself compelled to acknowledge that he could no longer be accepted by any woman. Although almost entirely crippled, he did not appear to be so when he was seated, when he talked, or when he was at the table. He had only one meal a day, and always took it alone because, being toothless and unable to eat otherwise than very slowly, 
he did not wish to hurry himself out of compliment to his guests, and would have been sorry to see them waiting for him. This feeling deprived him of the pleasure he would have enjoyed in entertaining at his board friendly and agreeable guests, and caused great sorrow to his excellent cook. The first time I had the honor of being introduced to him by the curate, I opposed earnestly the reason which made him eat his meals in solitude, and I said that His Excellency had only to invite guests whose appetite was good enough to enable them to eat a double share. But where can I find such table companions? he asked. It is rather a delicate matter, I answered but you must take your guests on trial, and after they have been found such as you wish them to be, the only difficulty will be to keep them as your guests without their being aware of the real cause of your preference, for no respectable man could acknowledge that he enjoys the honor of sitting at your excellency's table only because he eats twice as much as any other man. The senator understood the truth of my argument, and asked the curate to bring me to dinner on the following day. He found my practice even better than my theory, and I became his daily guest. This man, who had given up everything in life except his own self, fostered an amorous inclination in spite of his age and of his gout. He loved a young girl named Therese Eimer, the daughter of an actor residing near his mansion, her bedroom window being opposite to his own. This young girl, then in her seventeenth year, was pretty, whimsical, and a regular coquette. She was practicing music with a view to entering the theatrical profession, and by showing herself constantly at the window, she had intoxicated the old senator, and was playing with him cruelly. She paid him a daily visit, but always escorted by her mother, a former actress, who had retired from the stage in order to work out her salvation, and who, as a matter of course, had made up her mind to combine the interests of heaven with the works of this world. She took her daughter to Mass every day, and compelled her to go to confession every week, but every afternoon she accompanied her in a visit to the amorous old man, the rage of whom frightened me when she refused him a kiss under the plea that she had performed her devotions in the morning and that she could not reconcile herself to the idea of offending the god who was still dwelling in her. What a sight for a young man of fifteen like me, whom the old man admitted as the only and silent witness of these erotic scenes! The miserable mother applauded her daughter's reserve, and went so far as to lecture the elderly lover, who, in his turn, dared not refute her maxims, which savoured either too much or too little of Christianity, and resisted a very strong inclination to hurl at her head any object he had at hand. Anger would then take the place of lewd desires, and after they had retired he would comfort himself by exchanging with me philosophical considerations. Compelled to answer him, and not knowing well what to say, I ventured one day upon advising a marriage. He struck me with amazement when he answered that she refused to marry him from fear of drawing upon herself the hatred of his relatives. Then make her the offer of a large sum of money or a position. She says that she would not, even for a crown, commit a deadly sin. 
in that case you must either take her by storm or banish her forever from your presence i can do neither one nor the other physical as well as moral strength is deficient in me kill her then that will very likely be the case unless i die first indeed i pity your excellency do you sometimes visit her no for i might fall in love with her and i would be miserable you are right witnessing many such scenes and taking part in many similar conversations i became an especial favorite with the old nobleman i was invited to his evening assemblies which were as i have stated before frequented by superannuated women and witty men he told me that in this circle i would learn a science of greater import than gassendi's philosophy which i was then studying by his advice instead of aristotle's which he turned into ridicule he laid down some precepts of for my conduct in these assemblies explaining the necessity of my observing them as there would be some wonder at a young man of my age being received at such parties he ordered me never to open my lips except to answer direct questions and particularly enjoyed me never to pass an opinion on any subject because at my age i could not be allowed to have any opinions i faithfully followed his precepts and obeyed his orders so well that in a few days i had gained his esteem and become the child of the house as well as the favorite of all the ladies who visited him in my character of a young and innocent ecclesiastic they would ask me to accompany them in their visits to the convents where their daughters or their nieces were educated i was at all hours received at their houses without even being announced i was scolded if a week elapsed without my calling upon them and when i went to the apartments reserved for the young ladies they would run away but the moment they saw that the intruder was only i they would return at once and their confidence was very charming to me before dinner m de malipiero would often inquire from me what advantages were accruing to me from the welcome i received at the hands of the respectable ladies i had become acquainted with at his house taking care to tell me before i could have time to answer that they were all endowed with the greatest virtue and that i would give everybody a bad opinion of myself if i ever breathed one word of disparagement to the high reputation they all enjoyed in this way he would inculcate in me the wise precept of reserve and discretion it was at the senator's house that i made the acquaintance of madame manzoni the wife of a notary public of whom i shall have to speak very often this worthy lady inspired me with the deepest attachment and she gave me the wisest advice had i followed it and profited by it my life would not have been exposed to so many storms it is true that in that case my life would not be worth writing all these fine acquaintances amongst women who enjoyed the reputation of being high-bred ladies gave me a very natural desire to shine by my good looks and by the elegance of my dress but my father confessor as well as my grandmother objected very strongly to this feeling of vanity on one occasion taking me apart the curate told me with honeyed words that in the profession to which i had devoted myself my thoughts ought to dwell upon the best means of being agreeable to god 
and not unpleasing the world by my fine appearance. He condemned my elaborate curls and the exquisite perfume of my pomatum. He said that the devil had got hold of me by the hair, that I would be excommunicated if I continued to take such care of it, and concluded by quoting for my benefit these words from an ecumenical council. Clericus qui nutrit coman anathema sit. I answered him with the names of several fashionable perfumed abbots who were not threatened with excommunication, who were not interfered with, although they wore four times as much powder as I did, for I only used a slight sprinkling, who perfumed their hair with a certain amber-scented pomatum which brought women to the very point of fainting, while mine, a jessamine pomade, called forth the compliment of every circle in which I was received. I added that I could not, much to my regret, obey him, and that if I had meant to live in slovenliness, I would have become a capuchin and not an abbe. My answer made him so angry that, three or four days afterwards, he contrived to obtain leave from my grandmother to enter my chamber early in the morning before I was awake, and, approaching my bed on tiptoe with a sharp pair of scissors, he cut off unmercifully all my front hair from one ear to the other. My brother Francois was in the adjoining room and saw him, but he did not interfere as he was delighted at my misfortune. He wore a wig and was very jealous of my beautiful head of hair. Francois was envious through the whole of his life, yet he combined this feeling of envy with friendship. I never could understand him, but this vice of his, like my own vices, must by this time have died of old age. After his great operation, the abbey left my room quietly, but when I woke up shortly afterwards and realized all the horror of this unheard-of execution, my rage and indignation were indeed wrought to the highest pitch. What wild schemes of revenge my brain engendered while, with a looking-glass in my hand, I was groaning over the shameful havoc performed by this audacious priest. At the noise I made, my grandmother hastened to my room, and amidst my brother's laughter, the kind old woman assured me that the priest would never have been allowed to enter my room if she could have foreseen his intention, and she managed to soothe my passion to some extent by confessing that he had overstepped the limits of his right to administer a reproof. But I was determined upon revenge, and I went on dressing myself and revolving in my mind the darkest plots. It seemed to me that I was entitled to the most cruel revenge, without having anything to dread from the terrors of the law. The theatres being open at that time, I put on a mask to go out, and I went to the advocate Carrare, with whom I had become acquainted at the senator's house, to inquire from him whether I could bring a suit against the priest. He told me that, but a short time since, a family had been ruined for having sheared the mustache of a Sclavonian, a crime not nearly so atrocious as the shearing of all my front locks, and that I had only to give him my instructions to begin a criminal suit against the Abbe, which would make him tremble. I gave my consent, and begged that he would tell M. de Malipiero in the evening the reason for which I could not go to his house, for I did not feel any inclination 
to show myself anywhere until my hair had grown again. I went home and partook with my brother of a repast which appeared rather scanty in comparison to the dinners I had with the old senator. The privation of the delicate and plentiful fare to which His Excellency had accustomed me was most painful, besides all the enjoyments from which I was excluded through the atrocious conduct of the virulent priest who was my godfather. I wept from sheer vexation, and my rage was increased by the consciousness that there was in this insult a certain dash of comical fun, which threw over me a ridicule more disgraceful in my estimation than the greatest crime. I went to bed early, and, refreshed by ten hours of profound slumber, I felt in the morning somewhat less angry, but quite as determined to summon the priest before a court. I dressed myself with the intention of calling upon my advocate, when I received the visit of a skilful hairdresser whom I had seen at Madame Cantarini's house. He told me that he was sent by M. de Malipiero to arrange my hair so that I could go out, as the senator wished me to dine with him on that very day. He examined the damage done to my head and said, with a smile, that if I would trust to his art, he would undertake to send me out with an appearance of even greater elegance than I could boast of before. And truly, when he had done, I found myself so good-looking that I considered my thirst for revenge entirely satisfied. Having thus forgotten the injury, I called upon the lawyer to tell him to stay all proceedings, and I hastened to M. de Malipiero's palace, where, as chance would have it, I met the abbe. Notwithstanding all my joy, I could not help casting upon him rather unfriendly looks, but not a word was said about what had taken place. The senator noticed everything, and the priest took his leave, most likely with feelings of mortified repentance, for this time I most verily deserved excommunication by the extreme studied elegance of my curling hair. When my cruel godfather had left us, I did not dissemble with M. de Malipiero. I candidly told him that I would look out for another church, and that nothing would induce me to remain under a priest who, in his wrath, could go the length of such proceedings. The wise old man agreed with me and said that I was quite right. It was the best way to make me do ultimately whatever he liked. In the evening, everyone in our circle, being well aware of what had happened, complimented me and assured me that nothing could be handsomer than my new headdress. I was delighted and was still more gratified when, after a fortnight had elapsed, I found that M. de Malipiero did not broach the subject of my returning to my godfather's church. My grandmother alone constantly urged me to return. But this calm was the harbinger of a storm. When my mind was thoroughly at rest on that subject, M. de Malipiero threw me into the greatest astonishment by suddenly telling me that an excellent opportunity offered itself for me to reappear in the church and to secure ample satisfaction from the abbey. It is my province, added the senator, as president of the confraternity of the Holy Sacrament, to choose the preacher who is to deliver the sermon on the fourth Sunday of this month, which happens to be the second Christmas holiday. I mean to appoint you, and I am certain that the abbey will not dare to reject my choice. What say you to such a triumphant reappearance? Does it satisfy you? 
This offer caused me the greatest surprise, for I had never dreamt of becoming a preacher, and I had never been vain enough to suppose that I could write a sermon and deliver it in the church. I told M. de Malipiero that he must surely be enjoying a joke at my expense, but he answered that he had spoken in earnest, and he soon contrived to persuade me and to make me believe that I was born to become the most renowned preacher of our age, as soon as I should have grown fat, a quality which I certainly could not boast of, for at that time I was extremely thin. I had not the shadow of a fear as to my voice or to my elocution, and for the manner of composing my sermon, I felt myself equal to the production of a masterpiece. I told M. de Malipiero that I was ready and anxious to be at home in order to go to work, that, although no theologian, I was acquainted with my subject and would compose a sermon which would take everyone by surprise on account of its novelty. On the following day, when I called upon him, he informed me that the abbe had expressed unqualified delight at the choice made by him, and at my readiness in accepting the appointment. But he likewise desired that I should submit my sermon to him as soon as it was written, because the subject belonging to the most sublime theology, he could not allow me to enter the pulpit without being satisfied that I would not utter any heresies. I agreed to this demand, and during the week I gave birth to my masterpiece. I have now that first sermon in my possession, and I cannot help saying that, considering my tender years, I think it a very good one. I could not give an idea of my grandmother's joys. She wept tears of happiness at having a grandson who had become an apostle. She insisted upon my reading my sermon to her, listened to it with her beads in her hands, and pronounced it very beautiful. M. de Malipiero, who had no rosary when I read it to him, was of opinion that it would not prove acceptable to the parson. My text was from Horace. Ploravere suis non respondere favorem spertum veritis. And I deplored the wickedness and ingratitude of men through which had failed the design adopted by divine wisdom from the redemption of humankind. But M. de Malipiero was sorry that I had taken my text from any heretical poet, although he was pleased that my sermon was not interlarded with Latin quotations. I called upon the priest to read my production, but as he was out I had to wait for his return, and during that time I fell in love with his niece, Angela. She was busy upon some tambour work. I sat down close by her, and telling me that she had long desired to make my acquaintance, she begged me to relate the history of the locks of hair sheared by her venerable uncle. My love for Angela proved fatal to me, because from it sprang two other love affairs which, in their turn, gave birth to a great many others, and caused me finally to renounce the church as a profession. But let us proceed quietly and not encroach upon future events. On his return home, the abbey found me with his niece, who was about my age, and he did not appear to be angry. I gave him my sermon. He read it over and told me that it was a beautiful academical dissertation, but unfit for a sermon from the pulpit, and he added, I will give you a sermon written by myself, which I have never delivered. You will commit it to memory, and I promise to let everybody suppose that it is of your own composition. I thank you, very reverend father, but I will preach my own sermon, or none at all. 
at all events you shall not preach such a sermon as this in my church you can talk the matter over with m de malipiero in the meantime i will take my work to the censorship and to his eminence the patriarch and if it is not accepted i shall have it printed all very well young man the patriarch will coincide with me in the evening i related my discussion with the parson before all the guests of m de malipiero the reading of my sermon was called for and it was praised by all they lauded me for having with proper modesty refrained from quoting the holy fathers of the church whom at my age i could not be supposed to have sufficiently studied and the ladies particularly admired me because there was no latin in it but the text from horace who although a great libertine himself has written very good things a niece of the patriarch who was present that evening promised to prepare it her uncle in my favor as i had expressed my intention to appeal to him but m de malipiero desired me not to take any steps in the matter until i had seen him on the following day and i submissively bowed to his wishes when i called at his mansion the next day he sent for the priest who soon made his appearance as he knew well what he had been sent for he immediately launched out into a very long discourse which i did not interrupt but the moment he had concluded his list of objections i told him that there could not be two ways to decide the question that the patriarch would either approve or disapprove my sermon in the first case i added i can pronounce it in your church and no responsibility can possibly fall upon your shoulders in the second i must of course give way the abbe was struck by my determination and he said do not go to the patriarch i accept your sermon i only request you to change your text horace was a villain why do you quote seneca tertullian origen and bethius they were all heretics and must consequently be considered by you as worse wretches than horace who after all never had the chance of becoming a christian however as i saw it would please m the malipiero i finally consented to accept as a substitute for mine a text offered by the abbe although it did not suit in any way the spirit of my production and in order to get an opportunity for a visit to his niece i gave him my manuscript saying that i would call for it the next day my vanity prompted me to send a copy to dr gozzi but the good man caused me much amusement by returning it and writing that i must have gone mad and that if i were allowed to deliver such a sermon from the pulpit i would bring this honor upon myself as well as upon the man who had educated me i cared but little for his opinion and on the appointed day i delivered my sermon in the church of the holy sacrament in the presence of the best society of venice I received much applause, and every one predicted that I would certainly become the first preacher of our century, as no young ecclesiastic of fifteen had ever been known to preach as well as I had done. It is customary for the faithful to deposit their offerings for the preacher in a purse which is handed to them for that purpose. The sexton who empty it of its contents found it in more than fifty sequins and several billets doux to the great scandal of the weaker brethren an anonymous note amongst them the writer of which i thought i had guessed led me into a mistake which i think better not to relate this rich harvest in my great penury caused me to entertain a serious thoughts of becoming a preacher 
and I confided my intention to the parson, requesting his assistance to carry it into execution. This gave me the privilege of visiting at his house every day, and I improved the opportunity of conversing with Angela, for whom my love was daily increasing. But Angela was virtuous. She did not object to my love, but she wished me to renounce the church and to marry her. In spite of my infatuation for her, I could not make up my mind to such a step, and I went on seeing her and courting her in the hope that she would alter her decision. The priest, who had at last confessed his admiration for my first sermon, asked me some time afterwards to prepare another for St. Joseph's Day, with an invitation to deliver it on the 19th of March, 1741. I composed it, and the abbe spoke of it with enthusiasm, but fate had decided that I should never preach but once in my life. It is a sad tale, unfortunately for me very true, which some persons are cruel enough to consider very amusing. Young and rather self-conceited, I fancied that it was not necessary for me to spend much time in committing my sermon to memory. Being the author, I had all the ideas contained in my work classified in my mind, and it did not seem to me within the range of possibilities that I could forget what I had written. Perhaps I might not remember the exact words of a sentence, but I was at liberty to replace them by other expressions as good, and as I never happened to be at a loss or to be struck dumb, when I spoke in society, it was not likely that such an untoward accident would befall me before an audience amongst whom I did not know anyone who could intimidate me and cause me suddenly to lose the faculty of reason or of speech. I therefore took my pleasure as usual, being satisfied with reading my sermon morning and evening, in order to impress it upon my memory which until then had never betrayed me. The 19th of March came, and on that eventful day at four o'clock in the afternoon, I was to ascend to the pulpit. But, believing myself quite secure and thoroughly master of my subject, I had not the moral courage to deny myself the pleasure of dining with Count Montreal, who was then residing with me, and who had invited the patrician Barozzi, engaged to be married to his daughter, after the Easter holidays. I was still enjoying myself with my fine company when the sexton of the church came in to tell me that they were waiting for me in the vestry. With a full stomach and my head rather heated, I took my leave, ran to the church, and entered the pulpit. I went through the exordium with credit to myself, and I took breathing time. But scarcely had I pronounced the first sentences of the narration before I forgot what I was saying, what I had to say, and in my endeavors to proceed I fairly wandered from my subject and I lost myself entirely. I was still more discomforted by a half-repressed murmur of the audience as my deficiency appeared evident. Several persons left the church, others began to smile, I lost all presence of mind and every hope of getting out of the scrape. I could not say whether I feigned a fainting fit or whether I truly swooned. All I know is that I fell down on the floor of the pulpit striking my head against the wall with an inward prayer for annihilation. Two of the parish clerks carry me to the vestry, and after a few moments, without addressing a word to anyone, I took my cloak and my hat, and went home to lock myself in my room. I immediately dressed myself in a short coat, after the fashion of traveling priests. I packed a few things in a trunk, obtained some money from my grandmother, and took my departure of Padua, 
where I intended to pass my third examination. I reached Padua at midnight and went to Dr. Gozzi's house, but I did not feel the slightest temptation to mention to him my unlucky adventure. I remained in Padua long enough to prepare myself for the doctor's degree, which I intended to take the following year, and after Easter I returned to Venice, where my misfortune was already forgotten. But preaching was out of the question, and when any attempt was made to induce me to renew my efforts, I manfully kept to my determination never to ascend the pulpit again. On the eve of Ascension Day, M. Manzoni introduced me to a young courtesan who was at that time in great repute at Venice, and was nicknamed Cavamacchia, because her father had been a scourer. This name vexed her a great deal. She wished to be called Priati, which was her family name, but it was all in vain, and the only concession her friends would make was to call her by her Christian name of Juliet. She had been introduced to fashionable notice by the Marquis de San Vitali, a nobleman from Parma, who had given her one hundred thousand ducats for her favors. Her beauty was then the talk of everybody in Venice, and it was fashionable to call upon her. To converse with her, and especially to be admitted into her circle, was considered a great boon. As I shall have to mention her several times in the course of my history, my readers will, I trust, allow me to enter into some particulars about her previous life. Juliet was only fourteen years of age when her father sent her one day to the house of a Venetian nobleman, Marco Mauazzo, with a coat which he had cleaned for him. He thought her very beautiful in spite of the dirty rags in which she was dressed, and he called to see her at her father's shop with a friend of his, the celebrated advocate Bastien Uccelli, who, struck by the romantic and cheerful nature of Juliet still more than by her beauty and fine figure, gave her an apartment, made her study music, and kept her as his mistress. At the time of the fair, Bastien took her with him to various public places of resort, everywhere she attracted general attention, and secured the admiration of every lover of the sex. She made rapid progress in music, and at the end of six months she felt sufficient confidence in herself to sign an engagement with a theatrical manager who took her to Vienna to give her a castrato part in one of Metastasio's operas. The advocate had previously ceded her to a wealthy Jew who, after giving her splendid diamonds, left her also. In Vienna, Juliet appeared on the stage, and her beauty gained for her an admiration which she would never have conquered by her very inferior talent. But the constant crowd of adorers who went to worship the goddess, having sounded her exploits rather too loudly, the august Maria Theresa objected to this new creed being sanctioned in her capital, and the beautiful actress received an order to quit Vienna forthwith. Count Spada offered her his protection and brought her back to Venice, but she soon left for Padua, where she had an engagement. In that city she kindled the fire of love in the breast of Marquis San Vitali, but the Marchioness, having caught her once in her own box, and Juliet having acted disrespectfully to her, she slapped her face, and the affair having caused a good deal of noise, Juliet gave up the stage altogether. She came back to Venice, where, made conspicuous by her banishment from Vienna, she could not fail to make her fortune. Expulsion from Vienna for this class of women, had become a title to fashionable favor, and when there was a wish to depreciate a singer or a dancer, it was said of her that she had not been sufficiently prized 
to be expelled from Vienna. After her return, her first lover was Stefano Querini de Papozzes, but in the spring of 1740, the Marquis de San Vitali came to Venice and soon carried her off. It was indeed difficult to resist this delightful Marquis. His first present to the fair lady was a sum of one hundred thousand ducats, and to prevent his being accused of weakness or of lavish prodigality, he loudly proclaimed that the present could scarcely make up for the insult Juliet had received from his wife, an insult, however, which the courtesan never admitted, as she felt that there would be humiliation in such an acknowledgment and she always professed to admire with gratitude her lover's generosity. She was right. The admission of the blow received would have left a stain upon her charms, and how much more to her taste to allow those charms to be prized at such a high figure. It was in the year 1741 that Manzoni introduced me to his new primy as a young ecclesiastic who was beginning to make a reputation. I found her surrounded by seven or eight well-seasoned admirers who were burning at her feet the incense of their flattery. She was carelessly reclining on a sofa near Querini. I was much struck with her appearance. She eyed me from head to foot as if I had been exposed for sale and telling me with the air of a princess that she was not sorry to make my acquaintance, she invited me to take a seat. I began then, in my turn, to examine her closely and deliberately, and it was an easy matter, as the room, although small, was lighted with at least twenty wax candles. Juliet was then in her eighteenth year, the freshness of her complexion was dazzling, but the carnation tint of her cheeks, the vermilion of her lips, and the dark, very narrow curve of her eyebrows impressed me as being produced by art rather than nature. Her teeth, two rows of magnificent pearls, made one overlook the fact that her mouth was somewhat too large, and whether from habit or because she could not help it, she seemed to be ever smiling. Her bosom hid under a light gauze, invited the desires of love. Yet I did not surrender to her charms. Her bracelets and the rings which covered her fingers did not prevent me from noticing that her hand was too large and too fleshy, and in spite of her carefully hiding her feet, I judged, by a tell-tale slipper lying close by her dress, that they were well proportioned to the height of her figure proportion which is unpleasant not only to the chinese and spaniards but likewise to every man of refined taste we want a tall woman to have a small foot and certainly it is not a modern taste for holofernes of old was of the same opinion otherwise he would not have thought judith so charming it's Sandalid ejus rapuerunt oculus ejus. Altogether, I found her beautiful, but when I compared her beauty and the price of one hundred thousand ducats paid for it, I marveled at my remaining so cold, and at my not being tempted to give even one sequin for the privilege of making from nature a study of the charms which her dress concealed from my eyes. End of chapter 4, part A Chapter 4, part B of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova Volume 1 The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Episode 1 Childhood Chapter 4 B I had scarcely been there a quarter of an hour when the noise made by the oars of a gondola striking the water heralded the prodigal marquis. We all rose from our seats, and M. Quirini hastened, somewhat blushing, to quit his place on the sofa. M. de Savintali, a man of middle age, who had travelled much, took a seat near Juliette, but not on the sofa, so she was compelled to turn around. It gave me the opportunity of seeing her full front, while I had before only a side view of her face. After my introduction to Juliet, I paid her four or five visits, and I thought myself justified by the care I had given to the examination of her beauty, in saying in M. de Malipiero's drawer-room one evening, when my opinion about her was asked, that she could please only a glutton with depraved tastes that she had neither the fascination of simple nature nor any knowledge of society, that she was deficient in well-bred, easy manners, as well as in striking talents, and that those were the qualities which a thorough gentleman liked to find in a woman. This opinion met the general approbation of his friends, but M. de Malipiero kindly whispered to me that Juliet would certainly be informed of the portrait I had drawn of her, and that she would become my sworn enemy. He had guessed rightly. I thought Juliet very singular, for she seldom spoke to me, and whenever she looked at me she made use of an eyeglass, or she contracted her eyelids, as if she wished to deny me the honour of seeing her eyes, which were beyond all dispute very beautiful. They were blue, wondrously large and full, and tinted with that unfathomable variegated iris which nature only gives to youth, and which general disappears after having worked miracles when the owner reaches the shady side of forty. Frederick the Great preserved it until his death. Juliet was informed of the portrait I had given of her to M. de Malipiero's friends by the indiscreet pensioner Xavier Cortantini. One evening I called upon her with M. Manzoni, and she told him that a wonderful judge of beauty had found flaws in hers, but she took good care not to specify them. It was not difficult to make out that she was indirectly firing at me, and I prepared myself for the ostracism which I was expecting, but which, however, she kept in abeyance fully for an hour. At last, our conversation falling upon a concert given a few days before my Imer, the actor, and in which his daughter, Therese, had taken a brilliant part, Juliet turned around to me and inquired what M. de Malipiero did for Therese. I said that he was educating her. He can well do it she answered, for he is a man of talent, but I should like to know what he can do with you, whatever he can. I am told that he thinks you rather stupid. 
As a matter of course, she had the laugh on her side, and I, confused, uncomfortable, and not knowing what to say, took leave after having cut a very sorry figure, and determined never again to darken her door. The next day at dinner the account of my adventure caused much amusement to the old senator. Throughout the summer I carried on a course of platonic love with my charming Angela at the house of her teacher of embroidery, but her extreme reserve excited me, and my love had almost become a torment to myself. With my ardent nature I required a mistress like Bettina, who knew how to satisfy my love without wearing it out. I still retain some feelings of purity, and I entertain the deepest veneration for Angela. She was, in my eyes, the very palladium of Sigrops. Still very innocent, I felt some disinclination towards women, and I was simple enough to be jealous of even their husbands. Angela would not grant me the slightest favor. Yet she was no flirt, but the fire beginning in me parched and withered me. The pathetic entreaties which I poured out of my heart had less effect on her than upon two young sisters, her companions and friends. Had I not concentrated every look of mine upon the heartless girl, I might have discovered that her friends excelled her in beauty and in feeling. But my prejudiced eyes saw no one but Angela. To every outpouring of my love she answered that she was quite ready to become my wife, and that such was to be the limit of my wishes. When she condescended to add that she suffered as much as I did myself, she thought she had bestowed upon me the greatest of favors. Such was the state of my mind when, in the first days of autumn, I received a letter from the Countess de Montréal, with an invitation to spend some time at her beautiful estate at Pazian. She expected many guests, and among them her own daughter, who had married a Venetian nobleman, and who had a great reputation for wit and beauty, although she had but one eye. But it was so beautiful that it made up for the loss of the other. I accepted the invitation, and Pazian offering me a constant round of pleasures, it was easy enough for me to enjoy myself, and to forget for the time the rigors of the cruel Angela. I was given a pretty room on the ground floor, opening upon the gardens of Pazian, and I enjoyed its comforts without caring to know who my neighbors were. The morning after my arrival, at the very moment I awoke, my eyes were delighted with the sight of the charming creature who brought me my coffee. She was a very young girl, but as well formed as a young person of seventeen. Yet she had scarcely completed her fourteenth year. The snow of her complexion, her hair as dark as the raven's wing, her black eyes beaming with fire and innocence, her dress composed only of a chemise and a short petticoat which exposed a well-turned leg and the prettiest tiny foot, every detail I gathered in one instant presented to my looks the most original and the most perfect beauty I had ever beheld. I looked at her with the greatest pleasure, and her eyes rested upon me as if we had been old acquaintances. "'How did you find your bed?' she asked. "'Very comfortable. I am sure you made it. Pray, who are you?' "'I am Lucy, the daughter of the gatekeeper. I have neither brothers nor sisters, and I am fourteen years old.' I am very glad you have no servant with you. I will be your little maid, and I am sure you will be pleased with me. 
Delighted at this beginning, I sat up in my bed, and she helped me to put on my dressing gown, saying a hundred things which I did not understand. I began to drink my coffee, quite amazed at her easy freedom, and struck with her beauty, to which she would have been impossible to remain indifferent. She had seated herself on my bed, giving no other apology for that liberty than the most delightful smile. I was still sipping my coffee when Lucy's parents came into my room. She did not move from her place on the bed, but she looked at them, appearing very proud of such a seat. The good people kindly scolded her, begged my forgiveness in her favor, and Lucy left the room to attend to her other duties. The moment she had gone, her father and mother began to praise their daughter. She is, they said, our only child, our darling pet, the hope of our old age. She loves and obeys us, and fears God. She is as clean as a new pin, and has but one fault. What is that? She is too young. That is a charming fault to which time will mend. I was not long in ascertaining that they were living specimens of honesty, of truth, of homely virtues, and of real happiness. I was delighted at this discovery when Lucy returned as gay as a lark, prettily dressed, her hair done in a peculiar way of her own, and with well-fitting shoes. She dropped a simple curtsy before me, gave a couple of hearty kisses to both her parents, and jumped on her father's knees. I asked her to come and sit on my bed, but she answered that she could not take such a liberty now that she was dressed. The simplicity artlessness and innocence of her answer seemed to me very enchanting, and brought a smile on my lips. I examined her to see whether she was prettier in her new dress or in the morning's negligee, and I decided in favor of the latter. To speak the truth, Lucy was, I thought, superior in everything, not only to Angela, but even to Bettina. The hairdresser made his appearance, and the honest family left my room. When I was dressed, I went to meet the countess and her amiable daughter. The day passed off very pleasantly, as is generally the case in the country when you are amongst agreeable people. In the morning, the moment my eyes were opened, I rang the bell, and pretty Lucy came in, simple and natural as before, with her easy manners and wonderful remarks. Her candor, her innocence, shone brilliantly all over her person. I could not conceive how, with her goodness, her virtue, and her intelligence, she could run the risk of exciting me by coming into my room alone, and with so much familiarity. I fancied that she would not attach much importance to certain slight liberties, and would not prove over-scrupulous, and with that idea I made up my mind to show her that I fully understood her. I felt no remorse of conscience on the score of her parents, who, in my estimation, were as careless as herself. I had no dread of being the first to give the alarm to her innocence, or to enlighten her mind with the gloomy light of malice. But, unwilling either to be the dupe of feeling or to act against it, I resolved to reconnoiter the ground. I extend a daring hand towards her person, and by an involuntary movement she withdraws, blushes, her cheerfulness disappears, and, turning her head aside as if she were in search of something, she waits until her agitation has subsided. The whole affair had not lasted one minute. She came back, abashed at the idea that she had proved herself rather knowing, and at the dread of having perhaps given a wrong interpretation to an action which might have been, on my part, perfectly innocent, 
or the result of politeness. Her natural life soon returned, and, having rapidly read in her mind all I have just described, I lost no time in restoring her confidence and judging that I would venture too much by active operations. I resolved to employ the following morning in a friendly chat, during which I could make her out better. In pursuance of that plan, the next morning, as we were talking, I told her that it was cold, but she would not feel it if she would lie down near me. "'Shall I disturb you?' she said. "'No, but I am thinking that if your mother happened to come in, she would be angry. "'Mother would not think of any harm. "'Come, then.' "'But, Lucy, do you know what danger you are exposing yourself to?' "'Certainly I do. "'But you are a good, and what is more, you are a priest. "'Come, only lock the door. "'No, no, for people might think I do not know what.' "'She laid down close by me, and kept on her chatting, "'although I did not understand a word of what she said.' for in that singular position, and unwilling to give way to my ardent desires, I remained as still as a log. Her confidence in her safety, confidence which was certainly not feigned, worked upon my feelings to such an extent that I would have been ashamed to take any advantage of it. At last she told me that, nine o'clock had struck, and that if old Count Antonio found us as we were, he would tease her with his jokes. When I see that man, she said, I'm afraid, and I run away. Saying these words, she rose from the bed and left the room. I remained motionless for a long while, stupefied, benumbed, and mastered by the agitation of my excited senses as well as by my thoughts. The next morning, as I wished to keep calm, I only let her sit down on my bed, and the conversation I had with her proved without the shadow of a doubt that her parents had every reason to idolize her, and that the easy freedom of her mind as well as of her behavior with me was entirely owing to her innocence and to her purity. Her artlessness, her vivacity, her eager curiosity, and the bashful blushes which spread over her face whenever her innocent or jesting remarks caused me to laugh, everything, in fact, convinced me that she was an angel destined to become the victim of the first libertine who would undertake to seduce her. I felt sufficient control over my feelings to resist any attempt against her virtue which my conscience might afterwards reproach me with. The mere thought of taking advantage of her innocence made me shudder, and my self-esteem was a guarantee to her parents, who abandoned her to me on the strength of my good opinion they entertained of me, that Lucy's honor was safe in my hands. I thought I would have despised myself if I had betrayed the trust they reposed on me. I, there, I therefore determined to conquer my feelings, and, with perfect confidence in the victory, I made up my mind to wage war against myself and to be satisfied with her presence as the only reward of my heroic efforts. I was not yet acquainted with the axiom that, as long as the fighting lasts, victory remains uncertain. As I enjoyed her conversation much, a natural instinct prompted me to tell her that she would afford me great pleasure if she could come earlier in the morning and even wake me up if I happened to be asleep, adding, in order to give more weight to my request, that the less I slept, the better I felt in health. In this manner, I contrived to spend three hours instead of two in her society, 
although this cunning contrivance of mine did not prevent the hours flying, at least in my opinion, as swift as lightning. Her mother would often come in as we were talking, and when the good woman found her sitting on my bed, she would say nothing, only wondering at my kindness. Lucie would then cover her with kisses, and the kind old soul would entreat me to give her child lessons of goodness, and to cultivate her mind. But when she had left us, Lucie did not think herself more unrestrained, and whether in or out of her mother's presence, she was always the same without the slightest change. If the society of this angelic child afforded me the sweetest delight, it also caused me the most cruel suffering. Often, very often, when her face was close to my lips, I felt the most ardent temptation to smother her with kisses, and my blood was at fever heat when she wished that she had been a sister of mine. But I kept sufficient command over myself to avoid the slightest contact, for I was conscious that even one kiss would have been the spark would have been the spark which would have blown up all the edifice of my reserve. Every time she left me, I remained astounded at my own victory, but always eager to win fresh laurels, I longed for the following morning panting for a renewal of the sweet yet very dangerous contest. At the end of ten or twelve days, I felt that there was no alternative but to put a stop to this state of things, or to become a monster in my own eyes, and I decided for the moral side of the question all the more easily that nothing ensured me success if I chose the second alternative. The moment I placed her under the obligation to defend herself, Lucy would become a heroine, and the door of my room being open, I might have been exposed to shame and to a very useless repentance. This rather frightened me, yet to put an end to my torture, I did not know what to decide. I could no longer resist the effect made upon my senses by this beautiful girl, who at the break of day and and scarcely dressed, ran gaily into my room, came to my bed, inquiring how I had slept, bent familiarly her head towards me, and, so to speak, dropped her words on my lips. In those dangerous moments I would turn my head aside, but in her innocence she would reproach me for being afraid when she felt herself so safe, and if I answer that I could not possibly fear a child, she would reply that a difference of two years was of no account. Standing at bay, exhausted, conscious that every instant increased the ardor which was devouring me, I resolved to entreat from herself the discontinuance of her visits, and this resolution appeared to me sublime and infallible but having postponed its execution until the following morning, I passed a dreadful night, tortured by the image of Lucy, and by the idea that I would see her in the morning for the last time. I fancied that Lucy would not only grant my prayer, but that she would conceive for me the highest esteem. In the morning it was barely daylight, Lucy beaming, radiant with beauty, a happy smile brightening her pretty mouth, and her splendid hair in the most fascinating disorder, bursts into my room and rushes with open arms towards my bed. But when she sees my pale, dejected, and unhappy countenance, she stops short, and her beautiful face taking an expression of sadness and anxiety. "'What ails you?' she asks, with deep sympathy. "'I have had no sleep through the night.' "'And why?' "'Because I have made up my mind to impart to you a project which, although fraught with misery to myself, will at least secure me your esteem. But if your project is to ensure my esteem, it ought to make you very cheerful. Only tell me, reverend sir, 
why after calling me thou yesterday you treat me to-day respectfully like a lady what have i done i will get your coffee and you must tell me everything after you have drunk it i long to hear you she goes and returns i drink the coffee and seeing that my countenance remains grave she tries to enliven me contrives to make me smile and claps her hands for joy after putting everything in order she closes the door because the wind is high and in her anxiety not to lose one word of what i have to say she entreats artlessly a little place near me i cannot refuse her for i feel almost lifeless i then begin a faithful recital of the fearful state in which her beauty has thrown me and a vivid picture of all the suffering i have experienced in trying to master my ardent wish to give her some proof of my love i explain to her that unable to endure such torture any longer i see no other safety but in entreating her not to see me any more the importance of the subject the truth of my love my wish to present my expedient in the light of her heroic effort of a deep and virtuous passion lend me a peculiar eloquence i endeavor above all to make her realize the fearful consequences which might follow a course different to the one i was proposing and how miserable we might be at the close of my long discourse lucy seeing my eyes wet with tears throws off the bedclothes to wipe them without thinking that in so doing she uncovers two globes the beauty of which might have caused the wreck of the most experienced pilot after a short silence the charming child tells me that my tears make her very unhappy and that she had never supposed that she could cause them all that you have just told me she added proves the sincerity of your great love for me but i cannot imagine why you should be in such a, th a dread of a feeling which affords me the most intense pleasure you wish to banish me from your presence because you stand in fear of your love but what would you do if you hated me am i guilty because i have pleased you if it is a crime to have won your affection i can assure you that i did not think i was committing a criminal action and therefore you cannot conscientiously punish me yet i cannot conceal the truth i am very happy to be loved by you as for the danger we run when we love danger which i can understand we can set it at defiance if we choose and i wonder at my not fearing it ignorant as i am while you a learned man think it so terrible i am astonished that love which is not a disease should have made you ill and that it should have exactly the opposite effect upon me is it possible that i am mistaken and that my feelings toward you should not be love you saw me very cheerful when i came in this morning it is because i have been dreaming all night but my dreams did not keep me awake only several times i woke up to ascertain whether my dream was true for i thought i was near you and every time finding that it was not so i quickly went to sleep again in the hope of continuing my happy dream and every time i succeeded after such a night was it not natural for me to be cheerful this morning my dear abbe if love is a torment for you i am very sorry but would it be possible for you to live without love i will do anything you order me to do but even if your cure depended upon it i would not cease to love you for that would be impossible yet if to heal your sufferings it should be necessary for you to love me no more you must do your utmost to succeed for i would much rather see you alive without love than dead for having loved too much 
only try to find some other plan, for the one you have proposed makes me very miserable. Think of it, there may be some other way which will be less painful. Suggest one more practicable, and depend upon Lucy's obedience. These words, so true, so artless, so innocent, made me realize the immense superiority of nature's eloquence over that of philosophical intellect. For the first time I folded this angelic being in my arms, exclaiming, Yes, dearest Lucy, yes, thou hast it in thy power to afford the sweetest relief to my devouring pain. Abandon to my ardent kisses thy divine lips, which have just assured me of thy love. An hour passed in the most delightful silence, which nothing interrupted, except these words murmured now and then by Lucy. O oh God, is it true? Is it not a dream? Yet I respected her innocence, and the more readily that she abandoned herself entirely, and without the slightest resistance. At last, extricating herself gently from my arms, she said, with some uneasiness, My heart begins to speak. I must go. And she instantly rose. Having somewhat rearranged her dress, she sat down, and her mother, coming in at that moment, complimented me upon my good looks and my bright countenance, and told Lucy to dress herself to attend Mass. Lucy came back an hour later, and expressed her joy and her pride at the wonderful cure she thought she had performed upon me, for the healthy appearance I was then showing convinced her of my love much better than the pitiful state in which she had found me in the morning. If your complete happiness, she said, rests in my power, be happy. There is nothing that I can refuse you. The moment she left me, still wavering between happiness and fear, I understood that I was standing on the very brink of the abyss, and that nothing but a most extraordinary determination would prevent me from falling headlong into it. I remained at Pazian until the end of September, and the last eleven nights of my stay were passed in the undisturbed possession of Lucy, who, secure in her mother's profound sleep, came to my room to enjoy in my arms the most delicious hours. The burning ardor of my love was increased by the abstinence to which I condemned myself, although Lucy did everything in her power to make me break through my determination. She could not fully enjoy the sweetness of the forbidden fruit unless I plucked it without reserve, and the effect produced by our constantly lying in each other's arms was too strong for a young girl to resist. She tried everything she could to deceive me, and to make me believe that I had already, and in reality, gathered the whole flower. But Bettina's lessons had been too efficient to allow me to go on a wrong scent, and I reached the end of my stay without yielding entirely to the temptation she so fondly threw in my way. I promised her to return in the spring— our farewell was tender and very sad, and I left her in a state of mind and of body which must have been the cause of her misfortunes, which, twenty years after, I had occasion to reproach myself with in Holland, and which will ever remain upon my conscience. After a few days after my return to Venice, I had fallen back into all my old habits, and resumed my courtship of Angela in the hope that I would obtain from her at least as much as Lucy had granted to me. A certain dread, which today I can no longer trace in my nature, a sort of terror of the consequences which might have a blighting influence upon my future, prevented me from giving myself up to complete enjoyment. I do not know whether I have ever been a truly honest man, 
but I am fully aware that the feelings I fostered in my youth were by far more upright than those I have, as I lived on, force upon myself to accept. A wicked philosophy throws down too many of these barriers, which we call prejudices. The two sisters who were sharing Angela's embroidery lessons were her intimate friends and the confidants of all her secrets. I made their acquaintance and found that they disapproved of her extreme reserve towards me. As I usually saw them with Angela and knew their intimacy with her, I would, when I happened to meet them alone, tell them all my sorrows, and thinking only of my cruel sweetheart, I never was conceited enough to propose that these young girls might fall in love with me. But I often ventured to speak to them with all the blazing inspiration which was burning in me, a liberty I would not have dared to take in the presence of her whom I loved. True love always begets reserve. We fear to be accused of exaggeration if we should give utterance to feelings inspired by passion, and the modest lover, in his dread of saying too much, very often says too little. The teacher of embroidery, an old bigot, who at first appeared not to mind the attachment I skewed for Angela, got tired at last of my too frequent visits, and mentioned them to the abbe, the uncle of my fair lady. He told me kindly one day that I ought not to call at that house so often, as my constant visits might be wrongly construed and prove detrimental to the reputation of his niece. His words fell upon me like a thunderbolt, but I mastered my feelings sufficiently to leave him without incurring any suspicion, and I promised to follow his good advice. Three or four days afterwards I paid a visit to the teacher of embroidery, and to make her believe that my visit was only intended for her, I did not stop one instant near the young girls. Yet I contrived to slip in the hand of the eldest of the two sisters a note enclosing another for my dear Angela, in which I explained why I had been compelled to discontinue my visits, and treating her to devise some means by which I could enjoy the happiness of seeing her and of conversing with her. In my note to Nanette, I only begged her to give my letter to her friend, adding that I would see them again the day after the morrow, and that I trusted to her to find an opportunity for delivering me the answer. She managed it all very cleverly, and when I renewed my visit two days afterwards, she gave me a letter without attracting the attention of anyone. Nanette's letter enclosed a very short note from Angela, who, disliking letter-writing, merely advised me to follow, if I could, the plan proposed by her friend. Here is the copy of the letter written by Nanette, which I have always kept, as well as all other letters which I give in these memoirs. There is nothing in the world, reverend sir, that I would not readily do for my friend. She visits at our house every holiday, has supper with us, and sleeps under our roof. I will suggest the best way for you to make the acquaintance of Madame Orio, our aunt. But, if you obtain an introduction to her, you must be very careful not to let her suspect your preference for Angela, for our aunt would certainly object to her house being made a place of rendezvous to facilitate your interviews with a stranger to her family. Now, for the plan I propose, and in the execution of which I will give you every assistance in my power. 
Madame Orio, although a woman of good station in life, is not wealthy, and she wishes to have her name entered on the list of noble widows, who receive the bounties bestowed by the confraternity of the Holy Sacrament, of which M. de Malipiero is president. Last Sunday, Angela mentioned that you are in the good graces of that nobleman, and that the best way to obtain his patronage would be to ask you to entreat it in her behalf. The foolish girl added that you were smitten with me, that all your visits to our mistress of embroidery were made for my special benefit, and for the sake of entertaining me and that I would find it very easy task to interest you in her favor. My aunt answered that, as you are a priest, there was no fear of any harm, and she told me to write to you with an invitation to call on her. I refused. The procurator Rosa, who is a great favorite of my aunt's, was present. He approved of my refusal, saying that the letter ought to be written by her and not by me, that it was for my aunt to beg the honor of your visit on business of real importance, and that if there was any truth in the report of your love for me, you would not fail to come. My aunt, by his advice, has therefore written the letter which you will find at your house." If you wish to meet Angela, postpone your visit to us until next Sunday. Should you succeed in obtaining M. de Malipiero's good will in favor of my aunt, you will become the pet of the household. But you must forgive me if I appear to treat you with coolness, for I have said that I do not like you. I would advise you to make love to my aunt, who is sixty years of age." M. Rosa will not be jealous, and you will become dear to everyone. For my part, I will manage for you an opportunity for some private conversation with Angela, and I will do anything to convince you of my friendship. Adieu. This plan appeared to me very well conceived, and, having the same evening received Madame Orio's letter, I called upon her on the following day, Sunday. I was welcomed in a very friendly manner, and the lady, in entreating me to exert in her behalf my influence with M. de Malipiero, entrusted me with all the papers which I might require to succeed. I undertook to do my utmost, and I took care to address only a few words to Angela, but I directed all my gallant attentions to Nanette, who treated me as coolly as could be. Finally, I won the friendship of the old procurator Rosa, who, in after years, was of some service to me. I had so much at stake in the success of Madame Orio's petition that I thought of nothing else, and knowing all the power of the beautiful Therese Eimer over our amorous senator, who would be but too happy to please her in anything, I determined to call upon her the next day, and I went straight to her room without being announced. I found her alone with the physician Doro, who, feigning to be on a professional visit, wrote a prescription, felt her purse, and went off. This Doro was suspected of being in love with Therese. M. de Malipiero, who was jealous, had forbidden Therese to receive his visits, and she had promised to obey him. She knew that I was acquainted with those circumstances, and my presence was evidently unpleasant to her, for she had certainly no wish that the old man should hear how she kept her promise. I thought that no better opportunity could be found of obtaining from her everything I wished. I told her in a few words the object of my visit, and I took care to add that she could rely upon my discretion, and that I would not, for the world, do her any injury. 
Thérèse, grateful for this assurance, answered that she rejoiced at finding an occasion to oblige me, and asking me to give her the papers of my protégé, she shewed me the certificates and testimonials of another lady in favor, of whom she had undertaken to speak, and whom she said she would sacrifice to the person in whose behalf I felt interested." She kept her word, for the very next day she placed in my hands the brevet signed by His Excellency as President of the Confraternity. For the present, and with the expectation of further favors, Madame Orio's name was put down to share the bounties which were distributed twice a year. Nanette and her sister Martin were the orphan daughters of a sister of Madame Orio. All the fortune of the good lady consisted in the house which was her dwelling, the first floor being let, and in a pension given to her by her brother, member of the Council of Ten. She lived alone with her two charming nieces, the eldest sixteen and the youngest fifteen years of age. She kept no servant, and only employed an old woman who, for one crown a month, fetched water and did the rough work. Her only friend was the procurator Rosa. He had, like her, reached his sixtieth year and expected to marry her as soon as she should become a widower. The two sisters slept together on the third floor in a large bed, which was likewise shared by Angela every Sunday. As soon as I found myself in possession of the deed for Madame Orio, I hastened to pay a visit to the mistress of embroidery, in order to find an opportunity of acquainting Nanette with my success, and in a short note which I prepared, I informed her that in two days I would call to give the brevet to Madame Orio, and I begged her earnestly not to forget her promise to contrive a private interview with my dear Angela. When I arrived on the appointed day at Madame Orio's house, Nanette, who had watched for my coming, dexterously conveyed to my hand a billet, requesting me to find a moment to read it before leaving the house. I found Madame Orio, Angela, the old procurator, and Martin in the room. Longing to read the note, I refused the seat offered to me, and presenting to Madame Orio the deed she had so long desired, I asked, as my only reward, the pleasure of kissing her hand, giving her to understand that I wanted to leave the room immediately. "'Oh, my dear Abbey,' said the lady, "'you shall have a kiss, but not on my hand, and no one can object to it, as I am thirty years older than you. She might have said forty-five without much astray. I gave her two kisses, which evidently satisfy her, for she desired me to perform the same ceremony with her nieces, but they both ran away, and Angela alone stood the brunt of my hardihood. After this the widow asked me to sit down. I cannot, madame. Why, I beg. I have... I understand. Nanette, show the way. Dear aunt, excuse me. Well, then, Martin. Oh, dear aunt, why do you not insist upon my sister obeying your orders? Alas, madame, these young ladies are quite right. Allow me to retire. No, my dear Abbe, my nieces are very foolish, and Rosa, I am sure, will kindly. The good procurator takes me affectionately by the hand, and leads me to the third story where he leaves me. The moment I am alone, I open my letter, and I read the following. My aunt will invite you to supper. Do not accept. Go away as soon as we sit down to the table and Martin will escort you as far as the street door. But do not leave the house. When the street door is closed again, everyone thinking you are gone, 
go upstairs in the dark as far as the third floor where you must wait for us we will come up the moment m rosa has left the house and our aunt has gone to bed angela will be at liberty to grant you throughout the night a tete-a-tete which i entrust will prove a happy one oh what joy what gratitude for the lucky chance which allowed me to read this letter on the very spot where i was to expect the dear object of my love certain of finding my way without the slightest difficulty i returned to madame orio's sitting-room overwhelmed with happiness Chapter Five, Part A of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One. The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova, Episode One, Childhood, Chapter Five, Part A. An unlucky night, I fall in love with the two sisters and forget Angela. A ball at my house, Juliet's humiliation, my return to Pazian, Lucy's misfortune. A propitious storm. On my reappearance, Madame Orio told me, with many heartfelt thanks, that I must for the future consider myself as a privileged and welcome friend, and the evening passed off very pleasantly. As the hour for supper drew near, I excused myself so well. That Madame Orio could not insist upon my accepting her invitation to stay. Martin rose to light me out of the room, but her aunt, believing Nanette to be my favorite, gave her such an imperative order to accompany me that she was compelled to obey. She went down the stairs rapidly, opened and closed the street door very noisily. And putting her light out, she re-entered the sitting room, leaving me in darkness. I went upstairs softly. When I reached the third landing, I found the chamber of the two sisters, and throwing myself upon a sofa, I waited patiently for the rising of the star of my happiness. An hour passed amidst the sweetest dreams of my imagination. At last, I hear the noise of the street door opening and closing, and a few minutes after, the two sisters come in with my Angela. I draw her towards me, and caring for nobody else, I keep up for two full hours my conversation with her. The clock strikes midnight. I am pitied for having gone so late supperless. But I am shocked at such an idea. I answer that which such happiness as I am enjoying, I can suffer from no human want. I am told that I am a prisoner, that the key of the house door is under the aunt's pillow, and that it is opened only by herself as she goes in the morning to the first mass. I wonder at my young friends imagining that such news can be anything but delightful to me. I express all my joy at the certainty of passing the next five hours with the beloved mistress of my heart. Another hour is spent when suddenly Nanette begins to laugh. Angela wants to know the reason, and Martin, whispering a few words to her. They both laugh likewise. This puzzles me. 
in my turn i want to know what causes this general laughter and at last nanette putting on an air of anxiety tells me that they have no more candle and that in a few minutes we shall be in the dark this is a piece of news particularly agreeable to me but i do not let my satisfaction appear on my countenance and saying how truly i am sorry for their sake i propose that they should go to bed and sleep quietly under my respectful guardianship my proposal increases their merriment what can we do in the dark we can talk we were four for the last three hours we had been talking and i was the hero of the romance love is a great poet its resources are inexhaustible but if the end it has in view is not obtained it feels weary and remains silent my angela listened willingly but little disposed to talk herself she seldom answered and she displayed good sense rather than wit to weaken the force of my arguments she was often satisfied with hurling at me a proverb somewhat in the fashion of the romans throwing the catapult every time that my poor hands came to the assistance of love she drew herself back or repulsed me yet in spite of all i went on talking and using my hands without losing courage but i gave myself up to despair when i found that my rather artful arguing astounded her without bringing conviction to her heart which was only disquieted never softened on the other hand i could see with astonishment upon their countenances the impression made upon the two sisters by the ardent speeches i poured out to angela this metaphysical curve struck me as unnatural it ought to have been an angle i was then unhappily for myself studying geometry i was in such a state that notwithstanding the cold i was perspiring profusely at last the light was nearly out and nanette took it away the moment we were in the dark i very naturally extended my arms to seize her whom i loved but i only met with empty space and i could not help laughing at the rapidity with which angela had availed herself of the opportunity of escaping me for one full hour i poured out all the tender cheerful words that love inspired me with to persuade her to come back to me i could only suppose that it was a joke to tease me but i became impatient the joke i said has lasted long enough it is foolish as i could not run after you and i am surprised to hear you laugh for your strange conduct leads me to suppose that you are making fun of me come and take your seat near me and if i must speak to you without seeing you let my hands assure me that i am not addressing my words to the empty air to continue this game would be an insult to me and my love does not deserve such a return well be calm i will listen to every word you may say but you must feel that it would not be decent for me to place myself near you in this dark room do you want me to stand where i am until morning lie down on the bed and go to sleep i wonder indeed at your thinking me capable of doing so in the state i am in well i suppose we must play at blind man's buff thereupon i began to feel right and left everywhere but in vain whenever i caught any one it always turned out to be nanette or martin who at once discovered themselves and i stupid don quixote instantly would let them go love and prejudice blinded me i could not see how ridiculous i was with my respectful reserve i had not yet read the anecdotes of louis xiii king of france but i had read boccaccio i kept on seeking in vain 
reproaching her with her cruelty, and entreating her to let me catch her, but she would only answer that the difficulty of meeting each other was mutual. The room was not large, and I was enraged at my want of success. Tired and still more vexed, I sat down, and for the next hour I told the history of Roger when Angelica disappears through the power of the magic ring, which the loving knight had so imprudently given her. Così dicendo, intorno alla fortuna, brancolando n'andava come cieco. O quante volte abbracciò l'aria vana, speyando la donzella abbracciar seco. Angela had not read Ariosto, but Nanette had done so several times. She undertook the defense of Angelica, and blamed the simplicity of Roger, who, if he had been wise, would never have trusted the ring to a coquette. I was delighted with Nanette, but I was yet too much of a novice to apply her remarks to myself. Only one more hour remained, and I was to leave before the break of day, for Madame Orio would have died rather than give way to the temptation of missing the early mass. During that hour I spoke to Angela, trying to convince her that she ought to come and sit by me. My soul went through every gradation of hope and despair and the reader cannot possibly realize it unless he has been placed in a similar position. I exhausted the most convincing arguments. Then I had recourse to prayers, and even to tears. But, seeing all was useless, I gave way to that feeling of noble indignation which lends dignity to anger. Had I not been in the dark, I might, I truly believe, have struck the proud monster. The cruel girl who had thus for five hours condemned me to the most distressing suffering. I poured out all the abuse, all the insulting words that despised love can suggest to an infuriated mind. I loaded her with the deepest curses. I swore that my love had entirely turned into hatred, and, as a finale, I advised her to be careful, as I would kill her the moment I would set my eyes on her. My invectives came to an end with the darkness. At the first break of day, and as soon as I heard the noise made by the bolt and the key of the street door, which Madame Orio was opening to let herself out, that she might seek in the church the repose of which her pious soul was in need, I got myself ready, and looked for my cloak and for my hat. But how can I ever portray the consternation in which I was thrown when, casting a sly glance upon the young friends, I found the three bathed in tears? In my shame and despair, I thought of committing suicide, and sitting down again, I recollected my brutal speeches, and upbraided myself for having wantonly caused them to weep. I could not say one word. I felt choking. At last tears came to my assistance, and I gave way to a fit of crying which relieved me. Nanette then remarked that her aunt would soon return home. I dried my eyes, and, not venturing another look at Angela or at her friends, I ran away without uttering a word, and threw myself on my bed, where sleep would not visit my troubled mind. At noon, M. de Malipiero, noticing the change in my countenance, inquired what ailed me, and longing to unburden my heart, I told them all that had happened. The wise old man did not laugh at my sorrow, but by his sensible advice he managed to console me and to give me courage. He was in the same predicament with the beautiful Therese. Yet he could not help giving way to his merriment when at dinner he saw me in spite of my grief eat 
with increased appetite. I had gone without my supper the night before. He complimented me upon my happy constitution. I was determined never to visit Madame Orio's house, and on that very day I held an argument in metaphysics, in which I contended that any being of whom we had only an abstract idea could only exist abstractedly, and I was right, but it was a very easy task to give to my thesis an irreligious turn, and I was obliged to recant. A few days afterwards I went to Padua, where I took my degree of doctor, utroque jure. When I returned to Venice, I received a note from M. Rosa, who entreated me to call upon Madame Orio. She wished to see me, and, feeling certain of not meeting Angela, I paid her a visit the same evening. The two graceful sisters were so kind, so pleasant, that they scattered to the winds the shame I felt at seeing them after the fearful night I had passed in their room two months before. The labors of writing my thesis and passing my examination were, of course, sufficient excuses for Madame Orio, who only wanted to reproach me for having remained so long away from her house. As I left, Nanette gave me a letter containing a note from Angela, the contents of which ran as follows. If you are not afraid of passing another night with me, you shall have no reason to complain of me, for I love you, and I wish to hear from your own lips whether you would still have loved me if I had consented to become contemptible in your eyes. This is the letter of Nanette, who alone had her wits about her. M. Rosa, having undertaken to bring you back to her house, I prepare these few lines to let you know that Angela is in despair at having lost you. I confess that the night you spent with us was a cruel one, but I do not think that you did rightly in giving up your visits to Madame Orio. If you still feel any love for Angela, I advise you to take your chances once more. Accept the rendezvous for another night. She may vindicate herself, and you will be happy. Believe me. Come. Farewell. Those two letters afforded me much gratification, for I had it in my power to enjoy my revenge by showing to Angela the coldest contempt. Therefore, on the following Sunday, I went to Madame Orio's house, having provided myself with a smoked tongue and a couple of bottles of Cyprus wine. But to my great surprise, my cruel mistress was not there. Nanette told me that she had met her at church in the morning, and that she would not be able to come before supper-time. Trusting to that promise, I declined Madame Orio's invitation, and before the family sat down to supper, I left the room, as I had done on the former occasion, and slipped upstairs. I longed to represent the character I had prepared myself for, and feeling assured that Angela, even if she should prove less cruel, would only grant me insignificant favors— I despised them in anticipation, and resolved to be avenged. After waiting three quarters of an hour, the street door was locked, and a moment later Nanette and Martin entered the room. "'Where is Angela?' I inquired. "'She must have been unable to come or to send a message, yet she knows you are here. "'She thinks she has made a fool of me.' But I suspected she would act in this way. You know her now. She is trifling with me, and very likely she is now reveling in her triumph. She has made use of you to allure me in the snare, and it is all the better for her. Had she come, I meant to have had my turn, and to have laughed at her. Ah, you must allow me to have my doubts as to that. Doubt me not, beautiful Nanette. The pleasant night we are going to spend without her must convince you. 
That is to say that, as a man of sense, you can accept us as a makeshift, but you can sleep here, and my sister can lie with me on the sofa in the next room. I cannot hinder you, but it would be great unkindness on your part. At all events, I do not intend to go to bed. What? You would have the courage to spend seven hours alone with us? Why, I am certain that in a short time you will be at a loss what to say, and you will fall asleep. Well, we shall see. In the meantime, here are provisions. You will not be so cruel as to let me eat alone. Can you get any bread? Yes, and to please you we must have a second supper. I ought to be in love with you. Tell me, beautiful Nanette, if I were as much attached to you as I was to Angela, would you follow her example and make me unhappy? How can you ask such a question? It is worthy of a conceited man. All I can answer is that I do not know what I would do. They laid the cloth, brought some bread, some parmesan cheese and water, laughing all the while, and then we went to work. The wine, to which they were not accustomed, went to their heads, and their gaiety was soon delightful. I wondered, as I looked at them, at my having been blind enough not to see their merit. After our supper, which was delicious, I sat between them, holding their hands, which I pressed to my lips, asking them whether they were truly my friends, and whether they approved of Angela's conduct towards me. They both answered that it had made them shed many tears. Then let me, I said, have for you the tender feelings of a brother, and share those feelings yourselves as if you were my sisters. Let us exchange in all innocence proofs of our mutual affection, and swear to each other an eternal fidelity. The first kiss I gave them was prompted by entirely harmless motives, and they returned the kiss, as they assured me a few days afterwards, only to prove to me that they reciprocated my brotherly feelings. But those innocent kisses, as we repeated them, very soon became ardent ones, and kindled a flame which certainly took us by surprise, for we stopped, as by common consent, after a short time, looking at each other very much astonished and rather serious. They both left me without affectation, and I remained alone with my thoughts. Indeed, it was natural that the burning kisses I had given and received should have sent through me the fire of passion, and that I should suddenly have fallen madly in love with the two amiable sisters. Both were handsomer than Angela, and they were superior to her. Nanette by her charming wit, Martin by her sweet and simple nature. I could not understand how I had been so long in rendering them the justice they deserved, but they were the innocent daughters of a noble family, and the lucky chance which had thrown them in my way ought not to prove a calamity for them. I was not vain enough to suppose that they loved me, but I could well enough admit that my kisses had influenced them in the same manner that their kisses had influenced me, and, believing this to be the case, it was evident that, with a little cunning on my part, and of sly practices of which they were ignorant, I could easily, during the long night I was going to spend with them, obtain favors, the consequences of which might be very positive. The very thought made me shudder and I firmly resolved to respect their virtue, never dreaming that circumstances might prove too strong for me. 
when they returned i read upon their countenances perfect security and satisfaction and i quickly put on the same appearance with a full determination not to expose myself again to the danger of their kisses for one hour we spoke of angela and i expressed my determination never to see her again as i had every proof that she did not care for me she loves you said the artless martin i know she does but if you do not mean to marry her you will do well to give up all intercourse with her for she is quite determined not to grant you even a kiss as long as you are not her acknowledged suitor you must therefore either give up the acquaintance altogether or make up your mind that she will refuse you everything you argue very well but how do you know that she loves me i am quite sure of it and as you have promised to be our brother i can tell you why i have that conviction when angela is in bed with me she embraces me lovingly and calls me her dear abbe the words were scarcely spoken when nanette laughing heartily placed her hand on her sister's lips but the innocent confession had such an effect upon me that i could hardly control myself martin told nanette that i could not possibly be ignorant of what takes place between young girls sleeping together there is no doubt i said that everybody knows those trifles and i do not think dear nanette that you ought to reproach your sister with indiscretion for her friendly confidence it cannot be helped now but such things ought not to be mentioned if angela knew it she would be vexed of course but martin has given me a mark of her friendship which i never can forget but it is all over i hate angela and i do not mean to speak to her any more she is false and she wishes my ruin yet loving you is she wrong to think of having you for her husband granted that she is not but she thinks only of her own self for she knows what i suffer and her conduct would be very different if she loved me in the meantime thanks to her imagination she finds the means of satisfying her senses with the charming martin who kindly performs the part of her husband nanette laughed louder but i kept very serious and i went on talking to her sister and praising her sincerity i said that very likely and to reciprocate her kindness angela must likewise have been her husband but she answered with a smile that angela played husband only to nanette and nanette could not deny it but said i what name did nanette in her rapture give to her husband nobody knows do you love any one nanette i do but my secret is my own this reserve gave me the suspicion that i had something to do with her secret and that nanette was the rival of angela such a delightful conversation caused me to lose the wish of passing an idle night with two girls so well made for love it is very lucky i exclaimed that i have for you only feelings of friendship otherwise it would be very hard to pass the night without giving way to the temptation of bestowing upon you proofs of my affection for you are both so lovely so bewitching that you would turn the brains of any man as i went on talking i pretended to be somewhat sleepy nanette being the first to notice it said go to bed without any ceremony we will lie down on the sofa in the adjoining room i would be a very poor spirited fellow indeed if i agreed to this let us talk my sleepiness will soon pass off but i am anxious about you go to bed yourselves my charming friends and i will go into the next room if you are afraid of me lock the door but you would do me an injustice for i feel only a brother's yearnings towards you 
"'We cannot accept such an arrangement,' said Nanette. "'But let me persuade you. Take this bed. "'I cannot sleep with my clothes on. "'Undress yourself. We would not look at you. "'I have no fear of it, but how could I find the heart to sleep "'while on my account you are compelled to sit up?' "'Well,' said Martin, "'we can lie down, too, without undressing.' If you show me such distrust, you will offend me. Tell me, Nanette, do you think I am an honest man? Most certainly. Well, then, give me a proof of your good opinion. Lie down near me in the bed, undressed, and rely on my word of honor that I will not even lay a finger upon you. Besides, you are two against one. What can you fear?' "'Will you not be free to get out of the bed in case I should not keep quiet? "'In short, unless you consent to give me this mark of your confidence in me, "'at least when I have fallen asleep, I cannot go to bed.' "'I said no more and pretended to be very sleepy. "'They exchanged a few words, whispering to each other, "'and Martin told me to go to bed, "'that they would follow me as soon as I was asleep. "'Nanette made me the same promise.' I turned my back to them, undressed myself quickly, and wishing them good night, I went to bed. I immediately pretended to fall asleep, but soon I dozed in good earnest and only woke when they came to bed. Then, turning around as if I wished to resume my slumbers, I remained very quiet until I could suppose them fast asleep. At all events, if they did not sleep, they were at liberty to pretend to do so. Their backs were towards me, and the light was out. Therefore, I could only act at random, and I paid my first compliments to the one who was lying on my right, not knowing whether she was Nanette or Martin. I find her bent in two, and wrapped up in the only garment she had kept on. Taking my time and sparing her modesty, I compel her by degrees to acknowledge her defeat and convince her that it is better to feign sleep and to let me proceed. Her natural instincts, soon working in concert with mine, I reach the goal, and my efforts, crowned with the most complete success, Leave me not the shadow of a doubt that I have gathered those first fruits to which our prejudice makes us attach so great an importance. Enraptured at having enjoyed my manhood completely and for the first time, I quietly leave my beauty in order to do homage to the other sister. I find her motionless, lying on her back like a person wrapped in profound and undisturbed slumber. Carefully manage my advance as if I were afraid of waking her up, I begin by gently gratifying her senses, and I ascertain the delightful fact that, like her sister, she is still in possession of her maidenhood. As soon as a natural movement proves to me that love accepts the offering, I take my measure to consummate the sacrifice. At that moment, giving way suddenly to the violence of her feelings, and tired of her assumed dissimulation, she warmly locks me in her arms, at the very instant of the voluptuous crisis, smothers me with kisses, shares my raptures, and love blends our souls in the most ecstatic enjoyment. Guessing her to be Nanette, I whisper her name. Yes, I am Nanette, she answers, and I declare myself happy, as well as my sister, if you prove yourself true and faithful. Until death, my beloved ones, and as everything we have done is the work of love, do not let us ever mention the name of Angela. After this, I beg that she would give us a light, but Martin, always kind and obliging, got out of bed, leaving us alone. When I saw Nanette in my arms, beaming with love, and Martin near the bed holding a candle, with her eyes reproaching us with ingratitude, because we did not speak to her, 
who, by accepting my first caresses, had encouraged her sister to follow her example, I realized all my happiness. End of chapter 5, part Chapter 5, Part B of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova Episode 1 Childhood Chapter 5 Part B Let us get up, my darlings, said I, and swear to each other eternal affection. When we had risen, we performed, all three together, ablutions which made them laugh a good deal, and which gave a new impetus to the ardor of our feelings. Sitting up in the simple costume of nature, we ate the remains of our supper, exchanging those thousand trifling words which love alone can understand, and we again retired to our bed, where we spent a most delightful night, giving each other mutual and oft-repeated proofs of our passionate ardor. Annette was the recipient of my last bounties, for Madame Orio having left the house to go to church, I had to hasten my departure, after assuring the two lovely sisters that they had effectually extinguished whatever flame might still have flickered in my heart for Angela. I went home and slept soundly until dinner-time. M. de Malipiero passed a remark upon my cheerful looks and the dark circles around my eyes, but I kept my own counsel, and I allowed him to think whatever he pleased. On the following day I paid a visit to Madame Orio, and Angela not being of the party, I remained to supper and retired with M. Rosa. During the evening Nanette contrived to give me a letter and a small parcel. The parcel contained a small lump of wax with the stamp of a key, and the letter told me to have a key made, and to use it to enter the house whenever I wished to spend the night with them. She informed me at the same time that Angela had slept with them the night following our adventures, and that, thanks to their mutual and usual practices, she had guessed the real state of things, that they had not denied it, adding that it was all her fault, and that Angela, after abusing them most vehemently, had sworn never again to darken their doors, but they did not care a jot. A few days afterwards, our good fortune delivered us from Angela. She was taken to Vicenza by her father, who had removed there for a couple of years, having been engaged to paint frescoes in some houses in that city. Thanks to her absence, I found myself undisturbed possessor of the two charming sisters, with whom I spent at least two nights every week, finding no difficulty in entering the house with the key which I had speedily procured. Carnival was nearly over when M. Manzoni informed me one day that the celebrated Juliet wished to see me, and regretted much that I had ceased to visit her. I felt curious as to what she had to say to me, and accompanied him to her house. She received me very politely, and, remarking that she had heard of a large hall I had in my house, she said she would like to give a ball there, if I would give her the use of it. I readily consented, and she handed me twenty-four sequins for the supper and for the band, undertaking to send people to place chandeliers in the hall and in my other rooms. M. de San Vitali had left Venice, and the Parmesan government had placed his estates in chancery, in consequence of his extravagant expenditure. 
I met him at Versailles ten years afterwards. He wore the insignia of the King's Order of Knighthood, and was grand equerry to the eldest daughter of Louis XV, Duchess of Parma, who, like all French princesses, could not be reconciled to the climate of Italy. The ball took place and went off splendidly. All the guests belonged to Juliet's set, with the exception of Madame Orio, her nieces, and the procurator Rosa, who sat together in the room adjoining the hall, and whom I had been permitted to introduce as persons of no consequence whatever. While the after-supper minuets were being danced, Juliet took me apart and said, "'Take me to your bedroom. I have—' just got an amusing idea. My room was on the third story. I showed her the way. The moment we entered, she bolted the door, much to my surprise. I wish you, she said, to dress me up in your ecclesiastical clothes, and I will disguise you as a woman with my own things. We will go down and dance together. Come, let us first dress our hair." Feeling sure of something pleasant to come, and delighted with such an unusual adventure, I lose no time in arranging her hair, and I let her afterwards dress mine. She applies rouge and a few beauty spots to my face. I humor her in everything, and to prove her satisfaction she gives me the best of grace a very loving kiss, on condition that I do not ask for anything else." "'As you please, beautiful Juliet, but I give you due notice that I adore you. "'I place upon my bed a shirt, an abbey's neckband, a pair of drawers, black silk stockings, in fact, a complete fit-out. "'Coming near the bed, Juliet drops her skirt and cleverly gets into the drawers, which were not a bad fit, but when she comes to the breeches there is some difficulty.' The waistband is too narrow, and the only remedy is to rip it behind or to cut it, if necessary. I undertake to make everything right, and as I sit on the foot of my bed, she places herself in front of me with her back towards me. I begin my work, but she thinks that I want to see too much, that I am not skillful enough, and that my fingers wander in unnecessary places. She gets fidgety, leaves me, tears the breeches, and manages in her own way. Then I help her to put her shoes on, and I pass the shirt over her head. But, as I am disposing the ruffle and the neckband, she complains of my hands being too curious, and in truth her bosom was rather scanty. She calls me a knave and rascal, but I take no notice of her. I was not going to be duped, and I thought that a woman who had been paid one hundred thousand ducats was well worth some study. At last, her toiling being completed, my turn comes. In spite of her objections, I quickly get rid of my breeches, and she must put on me the chemise, then a skirt, in a word she has to dress me up. But, all at once, playing the coquette, she gets angry because I do not conceal from her, looks that very apparent proof that her charms have some effect on a particular part of my being, and she refuses to grant me the favor which would soon afford both relief and calm. I try to kiss her, and she repulses me, whereupon I lose patience, and in spite of herself she has to witness the last stage of my excitement. At the sight of this she pours out every insulting word she can think of. I endeavor to prove that she is to blame, but it is all in vain. However, she is compelled to complete my disguise. There is no doubt that an honest woman would not have exposed herself to such an adventure, unless she had intended to prove her tender feelings, and that she would not have drawn back at the very moment she saw them shared by her companion. But women, like Juliet, are often guided by a spirit of contradiction which causes them to act against their own interests. 
Besides, she felt disappointed when she found out that I was not timid, and my want of restraint appeared to her a want of respect. She would not have objected to my stealing a few light favors, which she would have allowed me to take, as being of no importance, but, but by doing that I should have flattered her vanity too highly. Our disguise being complete, we went together to the dancing hall, where the enthusiastic applause of the guests soon restored our good temper. Everybody gave me credit for a piece of fortune which I had not enjoyed, but I was not ill-pleased with the rumor, and went on dancing with the false abbey, who was only too charming. Juliet treated me so well during the night that I construed her manners towards me into some sort of repentance, and I almost regretted what had taken place between us. It was a momentary weakness for which I was sorely punished. At the end of the quadrille all the men thought they had a right to take liberties with the abbe, and I became myself rather free with the young girls, who would have been afraid of exposing themselves to ridicule had they offered any opposition to my caresses. M. Querini was foolish enough to inquire from me whether I had kept on my breeches, and, as I answered that I had been compelled to lend them to Juliet, he looked very unhappy, sat down in a corner of the room, and refused to dance. Every one of the guests soon remarked that I had on a woman's chemise, and nobody entertained a doubt of the sacrifice having been consummated, with the exception of Nanette and Martin, who could not imagine the possibility of my being unfaithful to them. Juliet perceived that she had been guilty of great imprudence, but it was too late to remedy the evil. When we returned to my chamber upstairs, thinking that she had repented of her previous behavior, and feeling some desire to possess her, I thought I would kiss her, and I took hold of her hand, saying, I was disposed to give her every satisfaction. But she quickly slapped my face in so violent a manner, that in my indignation I was very near returning the compliment. I undressed myself rapidly without looking at her. She did the same, and we came downstairs. But in spite of the cool water I had applied to my cheek, every one could easily see the stamp of the large hand which had come in contact with my face. Before leaving the house, Juliet took me apart and told me, in the most decided and impressive manner, that if I had any fancy for being thrown out of the window, I could enjoy that pleasure whenever I liked to enter her dwelling, and that she would have me murdered if this night's adventure ever became publicly known. I took care not to give her any cause for the execution of either of her threats, but I could not prevent the fact of our having exchanged shirts being rather notorious. As I was not seen at her house, it was generally supposed that she had been compelled by M. Querini to keep me at a distance. The reader will see how, six years later, this extraordinary woman thought proper to feign entire forgetfulness of this adventure. I passed Lent partly in the company of my loved ones, partly in the study of experimental physics at the convent of the Salutation. My evenings were always given to M. de Malipiero's assemblies. At Easter, in order to keep the promise I had made to the Countess of Montreal, and longing to see again my beautiful Lucie, I went to Pasean. I found the guests entirely different to the set I had met the previous autumn. Count Daniel, the eldest of the family, had married a Countess Gotzi and a young and wealthy government official, who had married a good daughter of the old countess, was there with his wife and his sister-in-law. I thought the supper very long. The same room had been given to me, and I was burning to see Lucy, whom I did not intend to treat any more like a child. I did not see her before going to bed, but I expected her early in the morning, when, lo, 
instead of her pretty face brightening my eyes, I see standing before me a fat, ugly servant girl. I inquire after the gatekeeper's family, but her answer is given in the peculiar dialect of the place, and is, of course, unintelligible to me. I wonder what has become of Lucy. I fancy that our intimacy has been found out. I fancy that she's ill. Dead, perhaps. I dress myself with the intention of looking for her. If she has been forbidden to see me, I think to myself, I will be even with them all, for somehow or other I will contrive the means of speaking to her, and, out of spite, I will do with her that which honour prevented love from accomplishing. As I was revolving such thoughts, the gatekeeper comes in with a sorrowful countenance. I inquire after his wife's health and after his daughter, but at the name of Lucy his eyes are filled with tears. What? Is she dead? Would to God she were! What has she done? She has run away with Count Daniel's courier, and we have been unable to trace her anywhere. His wife comes in at the moment he replies, and at these words which renewed her grief, the poor woman faints away. The keeper, seeing how sincerely I felt for his misery, tells me that this great misfortune befell them only a week before my arrival. I know that man Lègle, I say. He is a scoundrel. Did he ask to marry Lucy? No. He knew well enough that our consent would have been refused. I wonder at Lucy acting in such a way. He seduced her, and her running away made us suspect the truth, for she had become very stout. Had he known her long? About a month after your last visit, she saw him for the first time. He must have thrown a spell over her, for our Lucy was as pure as a dove, and you can, I believe, bear testimony to her goodness. And no one knows where they are? No one. God alone knows what this villain will do with her. I grieved as much as the unfortunate parents. I went out and took a long ramble in the woods to give way to my sad feelings. During two hours I cogitated over considerations, some true, some false, which were all prefaced by an if. If I had paid this visit, as I might have done, a week sooner, loving Lucy would have confided in me, and I would have prevented that self-murder. If I had acted with her as with Nanette and Martin, she would not have been left by me in that state of ardent excitement which must have proved the principal cause of her fault, and she would not have fallen a prey to that scoundrel. If she had not known me before meeting the courier, her innocent soul would never have listened to such a man. I was in despair, for in my conscience I acknowledge myself the primary agent of this infamous seduction. I had prepared the way for the villain. Had I known where to find Lucy, I would certainly have gone forth on the instant to seek for her, but no trace whatsoever of her whereabouts had been discovered. Before I had been made acquainted with Lucy's misfortune, I felt great pride at having had sufficient power over myself to respect her innocence, but after hearing what had happened, I was ashamed of my own reserve, and I promised myself that for the future I would, on that score, act more wisely. I felt truly miserable when my imagination painted the probability of the unfortunate girl being left to the poverty and shame, cursing the remembrance of me and hating me as the first cause of her misery. This fatal event caused me to adopt a new system, which in after years I carried sometimes rather too far. I joined the cheerful guests of the Countess in the gardens, and received such a welcome that I was soon again in my usual spirits, and at dinner I delighted everyone. 
My sorrow was so great that it was necessary either to drive it away at once or to leave Pazian. But a new life crept into my being as I examined the face and the disposition of the newly married lady. Her sister was prettier, but I was beginning to feel afraid of a novice. I thought the work too great. This newly married lady, who was between nineteen and twenty years of age, drew upon herself everybody's attention by her overstrained and unnatural manners. A great talker, with a memory crammed with maxims and precepts often without sense, but to which she loved to make a show, very devout, and so jealous of her husband that she did not conceal her vexation when he expressed his satisfaction at being seated at table opposite her sister. She laid herself open to much ridicule. Her husband was a giddy young fellow who perhaps felt very deep affection for his wife, but who imagined that, through good breeding, he ought to appear very indifferent, and whose vanity found pleasure in giving her constant causes for jealousy. She, in turn, had a great dread of passing for an idiot if she did not show her appreciation of, and her resentment for, his conduct. She felt uneasy in the midst of good company, precisely because she wished to appear thoroughly at home. If I prattled away with some of my trilling nonsense, she would stare at me, and in her anxiety not to be thought stupid, she would laugh out of season. Her oddity, her awkwardness, and her self-conceit gave me the desire to know her better, and I began to dance attendance upon her. My attentions, important and unimportant, my constant care, every my fropperies, let everybody know that I meditated conquest. The husband was duly warned, but with a great show of intrepidity, he answered me with a joke every time he was told that I was a formidable rival. On my side, I assumed a modest and even sometimes a careless appearance when, to show his freedom from jealousy, he excited me to make love to his wife who, on her part, understood but little how to perform the part of fancy free. I had been paying my address to her for five or six days with great constancy, when, taking a walk with her in the garden, she imprudently confided to me the reason of her anxiety respecting her husband, and how wrong he was to give her any cause for jealousy. I told her, speaking as an old friend, that the best way to punish him would be to take no apparent notice of her husband's preference for her sister, and to feign to be herself in love with me. In order to entice her more easily to follow my advice, I added that I was well aware of my plan being a very difficult one to carry out, and that to play successfully such a character, a woman must be particularly witty. I had touched her weak point, and she exclaimed that she would play the part to perfection, but, in spite of her self-confidence, she acquitted herself so badly that everybody understood that the plan was of my own scheming. If I happened to be alone with her in the dark paths of the garden, and tried to make her play her part in real earnest, she would take the dangerous step of running away and rejoining the other guests, the result being that, on my reappearance, I was called a bad sportsman who frightened the bird away. I would not fail at the first opportunity to reproach her for her flight, and to represent the triumph she had thus prepared for her spouse. I praised her mind, but lamented over the shortcomings of her education. I said that the tone, the manners I adopted towards her, were those of good society and proved the great esteem I entertained for her intelligence. But, in the middle of all my fine speeches, towards the eleventh or twelfth day of my courtship, she suddenly put me out of all conceit by telling me that, 
being a priest, I ought to know that every amorous connection was a deadly sin, that God could see every action of his creatures, and that she would neither damn her soul nor place herself under the necessity of saying to her confessor that she had so far forgotten herself as to commit such a sin with a priest. I objected that I was not yet a priest, but she foiled me by inquiring point-blank whether or not the act I had in view was to be numbered amongst the cardinal sins, for, not feeling the courage to deny it, I felt that I must give up the argument and put an end to the adventure. A little consideration having considerably calmed my feelings, everybody remarked my new countenance during dinner, and the old count, who was very fond of a joke, expressed loudly his opinion that such a quiet demeanor on my part announced the complete success of my campaign. Considering such a remark to be favorable to me, I took care to spew my cruel devotee that such was the way the world would judge, but all this was lost labor. Luck, however, stood me in good stead, and my efforts were crowned with success in the following manner. On Ascension Day we all went to pay a visit to Madame Bergali, a celebrated Italian poetess. On my return to Paisan, the same evening, my pretty mistress wished to get into a carriage for four persons, in which her husband and sister were already seated, while I was alone in a two-wheeled chaise. I exclaimed at this, saying that such a mark of distrust was indeed too pointed, and everybody remonstrated with her, saying that she ought not to insult me so cruelly. She was compelled to come with me, and having told the postillion that I wanted to go by the nearest road, he left the other carriages and took the way through the forest of Chiquini. The sky was clear and cloudless when we left, but in less than half an hour we were visited by one of those storms so frequent in the south, which appeared likely to overthrow heaven and earth, and which end rapidly leaving behind them a bright sky and a cool atmosphere, so that they do more good than harm. "'Oh, heavens!' exclaimed my companion. "'We shall have a storm.' "'Yes,' I say, "'and although the chaise is covered, the rain will spoil your pretty dress. I am very sorry.' "'I do not mind the dress, but the thunder frightens me so. "'Close your ears. "'And the lightning?' Postillon, let us go somewhere for shelter. There is not a house, sir, for a league, and before we come to it the storm will have passed off. He quietly keeps on his way, and the lightning flashes, the thunder sends forth its mighty voice, and the lady shudders with fright. The rain comes down in torrents. I take off my cloak to shelter us in front. At the same moment we are blinded by a flash of lightning, and the electric fluid strikes the earth within one hundred yards of us. The horses plunge and prance with fear, and my companion falls in spasmodic convulsions. She throws herself upon me and folds me in her arms. The cloak had gone down. I stoop to place it around us, and improving my opportunity, I take up her clothes. She tries to pull them down, but another clap of thunder deprives her of every particle of strength. Covering her with the cloak, I draw her towards me, and the motion of the chaise coming to my assistance, she falls over me in the most favorable position. I lose no time, and under pretense of arranging my watch and my fob, I prepare myself for the assault. On her side, conscious that unless she stops me at once, all is lost, she makes a great effort, but I hold her tightly, saying that if she does not feign a fainting fit, the post-boy will turn round and see everything. I let her enjoy the pleasure of calling me an infidel, a monster, anything she likes, but my victory is the most complete that ever a champion achieved. 
The rain, however, was falling, the wind, which was very high, blew in our faces, and compelled to stay where she was, she said I would ruin her reputation, as the postillon could see everything. I keep my eye upon him, I answered. He is not thinking of us, and even if he should turn his head, the cloak shelters us from him. Be quiet, and pretend to have fainted, for I will not let you go. She seems resigned, and asks how I can thus set the storm at defiance. The storm, dear one, is my best friend to-day. She almost seems to believe me, her fear vanishes, and feeling my rapture she inquires whether I have done. I smile and answer in the negative, stating that I cannot let her go till the storm is over. Consent to everything, or I let the cloak drop, I say to her. Well, you dreadful man, are you satisfied now that you have insured my misery for the remainder of my life? No, not yet. What more do you want? A shower of kisses. How unhappy I am! Well, here they are. Tell me you forgive me and confess that you have shared all my pleasure. You know I did. Yes, I forgive you. Then I give her her liberty, and treating her to some very pleasant caresses, I ask her to have the same kindness for me, and she goes to work with a smile on her pretty lips. Tell me you love me, I say to her. No, I do not, for you are an atheist, and hell awaits you. The weather was fine again, and the elements calm. I kissed her hands and told her that the postillion had certainly not seen anything, and that I was sure I had cured her of her dread of thunder, but that she was not likely to reveal the secret of my remedy. She answered that one thing at least was certainly, namely that no other woman had ever been cured by the same prescription. Why, I say, the same remedy has very likely been applied a million of times within the last thousand years. To tell the truth, I had somewhat depended upon it when we entered the chaise together, for I did not know any other way of obtaining the happiness of possessing you. But console yourself with the belief that, placed in the same position, no frightened woman could have resisted. I believe you, but for the future I will travel only with my husband. You would be wrong, for your husband would not have been clever enough to cure your fright in the way I have done. True again, one learns some curious things in your company, but we shall not travel tete-a-tete -tete again. And my fair mistress ran off to her chamber while I was looking for a crown for the postillon. I saw that he was grinning. What are you laughing at? Oh, you know. Here, take this ducat and keep a quiet tongue in your head. End of chapter Chapter Six of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 1. Childhood. Chapter 6. My grandmother's death and its consequences. I lose M. de Malipiero's friendship. I have no longer a home. La Tintoretta. I am sent to a clerical seminary. I am expelled from it and confined in a fortress. During supper the conversation turned altogether upon the storm 
and the official, who knew the weakness of his wife, told me that he was quite certain I would never travel with her again. "'Nor I with him,' his wife remarked, for in his fearful impiety he exercised the lightning with jokes. Henceforth she avoided me so skilfully that I never could contrive another interview with her. When I returned to Venice I found my grandmother ill, and I had to change all my habits, for I loved her too dearly not to surround her with every care and attention. I never left her until she had breathed her last. She was unable to leave with me anything, for during her life she had given me all she could, and her death compelled me to adopt an entirely different mode of life. A month after her death, I received a letter from my mother, informing me that, as there was no probability of her return to Venice, she had determined to give up the house, and rent of which she was still paying, that she had communicated her intention to the Abbe Grimani, and that I was to be guided entirely by his advice. He was instructed to sell the furniture, and to place me, as well as my brothers and my sister, in a good boarding-house. I called upon Grimani to assure him of my perfect disposition to obey his commands. The rent of the house had been paid until the end of the year, but, as I was aware that the furniture would be sold on the expiration of the term, I placed my wants under no restraint. I had already sold some linen, most of the china, and several tapestries. I now began to dispose of the mirrors, beds, etc. I had no doubt that my conduct would be severely blamed, but I knew likewise that it was my father's inheritance, to which my mother had no claim whatever, and, as to my brothers, there was plenty of time before my explanation could take place between them. Four months afterwards, I had a second letter from my mother, dated from Warsaw, and enclosing another. Here is the translation of my mother's letter. My dear son, I have made here the acquaintance of a learned Menim friar, a Calabrian by birth, whose great qualities have made me think of you every time he has honored me with a visit. A year ago I told them that I had a son who was preparing himself for the church, but that I had not the means of keeping him during his studies, and he promised that my son would become his own child if I could obtain for him from the queen a bishopric in his native country, and he added that it would be very easy to succeed if I could induce the sovereign to recommend him to her daughter, the Queen of Naples. Full of trust in the Almighty, I threw myself at the feet of Her Majesty, who granted me her gracious protection. She wrote to her daughter, and the worthy friar has been appointed by the Pope to the bishopric of Monterano. Faithful to his promise, the good bishop will take you with him about the middle of next year, as he passes through Venice to reach Calabria. He informs you himself of his intentions in the enclosed letter. Answer him immediately, my dear son, and forward your letter to me. I will deliver it to the bishop. He will pave your way to the highest dignities of the church, and you may imagine my consolation if, in some twenty or thirty years, I had the happiness of seeing you a bishop, at least. Until his arrival, M. Grimani will take care of you. I give you my blessing, and I am my dear child, etc., etc. The bishop's letter was written in Latin, and was only a repetition of my mother's. It was full of unction, and informed me that he would tarry but three days in Venice. I answered according to my mother's wishes, but those two letters had turned my brain. I looked upon my fortune as made. I longed to enter the road which was to lead me to it, and I congratulated myself that I could leave my country without any regret. 
Farewell, Venice, I exclaimed. The days for vanity are gone by, and in the future I will only think of a great, of a substantial career. M. Grimani congratulated me warmly on my good luck, and promised all his friendly care to secure a good boarding-house, to which I would go at the beginning of the year, and where I would wait for the bishop's arrival. M. de Manipiero, who in his own way had great wisdom, and who saw that in Venice I was plunging headlong into pleasures and dissipation, and was only wasting a precious time, was delighted to see me on the eve of going somewhere else to fulfill my destiny, and much pleased with my ready acceptance of those new circumstances in my life. He read me a lesson which I have never forgotten. The famous precept of the Stoic philosophers, he said to me, Sequere Deum, can be perfectly explained by these words. Give yourself up to whatever fate offers to you, provided you do not feel an invincible repugnance to accept it. He added that it was the genius of Socrates, Sepii revocans raro impellens, and that it was the origin of the fata viam inveniunt of the same philosophers. M. de Malipiero's science was embodied in that very lesson, for he had obtained his knowledge by the study of only one book, the Book of Man. However, as it, if it were to give me the proof that perfection does not exist, and that there is a bad side as well as a good one to everything, a certain adventure happened to me a month afterwards which, although I was following his own maxims, cost me the loss of his friendship, and which certainly did not teach me anything. The senator fancied that he could trace upon the physiognomy of young people certain signs which marked them out as the special favorites of fortune. When he imagined that he had discovered those signs upon any individual, he would take him in hand and instruct him how to assist fortune by good and wise principles. And he used to say, with a great deal of truth, that a good remedy would turn into poison in the hands of a fool, but that poison is a good remedy when administered by a learned man. He had, in my time, three favorites, in whose education he took great pains. They were, besides myself, Therese Eimer, with whom the reader has a slight acquaintance already, and the third was the daughter of the boatman Gardella, a girl three years younger than I, who had the prettiest and most fascinating countenance. The speculative old man, in order to assist fortune in her particular case, made her learn dancing, for, he would say, the ball cannot reach the pocket unless someone pushes it. This girl made a great reputation at Stuttgart under the name of Augusta. She was the favorite mistress of the Duke of Württemberg in 1757. She was a most charming woman. The last time I saw her she was in Venice, and she died two years afterwards. Her husband, Michel de la Gata, poisoned himself a short time after her death. One day we had all three dined with him, and after dinner the senator left us, as was his wont to enjoy his siesta. The little Gardella, having a dancing lesson to take, went away soon after him, and I found myself alone with Therese, whom I rather admired, although I had never made love to her. We were sitting down at the table very near each other, with our backs to the door of the room in which we thought our patron fast asleep, and somehow or other we took a fancy to examine into the difference of conformation between a girl and a boy. But at the most interesting part of our study, a violent blow on my shoulders from a stick, followed by another, and which would have been itself followed by many more, if I had not ran away, compelled us to abandon our interesting investigation unfinished. I got off without hat or cloak and went home, but in less than a quarter of an hour the old housekeeper of the senator brought my clothes with a letter which contained a command never to present myself again at the mansion of his excellency 
I immediately wrote him an answer in the following terms. You have struck me while you were the slave of your anger. You cannot therefore boast of having given me a lesson, and I have not learned anything. To forgive you, I must forget that you are a man of great wisdom, and I can never forget it. This nobleman was perhaps quite right not to be pleased with the sight we gave him, yet with all his prudence he proved himself very unwise, for all the servants were acquainted with the cause of my exile, and, of course, the adventure was soon known through the city, and was received with great merriment. He dared not address any reproaches to Therese, as I heard from her soon after, but she could not venture to entreat him to pardon me. The time to leave my father's house was drawing near, and one fine morning I received the visit of a man about forty years old, with a black wig, a scarlet cloak, and a very swarthy complexion, who handed me a letter from M. Grimani, ordering me to consign to the bearer all the furniture of the house according to the inventory, a copy of which was in my possession. Taking the inventory in my hand, I pointed out every article marked down, except when the said article, having through my instrumentality taken an airing out of the house, happened to be missing, and whenever any article was absent, I said that I had not the slightest idea where it might be. But the uncouth fellow, taking very high note, said loudly that he must know what I had done with the furniture. His manner being very disagreeable to me, I answered that I had nothing to do with him, and, as he still raised his voice, I advised him to take himself off as quickly as possible, and I gave him that piece of advice in such a way as to prove him that, at home, I knew I was the most powerful of the two. Feeling it my duty to give information to M. Grimani of what had just taken place, I called him as soon as he was up, but I found that my man was already there, and that he had given his own account of the affair. The abbey, after a very severe lecture to which I had to listen in silence, ordered me to render an account of all the missing articles. I answered that I had found myself under the necessity of selling them to avoid running into debt. This confession threw him in a violent passion called me a rascal, said that those things did not belong to me, that he knew what he had to do, and he commanded me to leave his house on the very instant. Mad with rage, I ran for a Jew, to whom I wanted to sell what remained of the furniture, but when I returned to my house, I found a bailiff waiting at the door, and he handed me a summons. I looked over it and perceived that it was issued at the instance of Antonio Razzetta. It was the name of the fellow with the swarthy countenance. The seals were already affixed on all the doors, and I was not even allowed to go to my room, for a keeper had been left there by the bailiff. I lost no time and called upon M. Rosa, to whom I related all the circumstances. After reading the summons, he said, the seals shall be removed to-morrow morning, and in the meantime I shall summon Razzetta before the Avogador. But to-night, my dear friend, he added, you must beg the hospitality of some of your acquaintances. It has been a violent proceeding, but you shall be paid handsomely for it. The man is evidently acting under M. Grimani's orders. Well, that is their business. I spent the night with Nanette and Martin, and on the following morning, the seals having been taken off, I took possession of my dwelling. Razzetta did not appear before the avogador, and M. Rosa summoned him in my name before the criminal court, and obtained against him a writ of capias, in case he should not obey the second summons. On the third day, M. Grimani wrote to me, commanding me to call upon him. I went immediately. As soon as I was in his presence, he inquired abruptly what my intentions were. I intend to shield myself from your violent proceedings under the protection of the law, and to defend myself against a man with whom I ought never to have had 
any connection, and who has compelled me to pass the night in a disreputable place? In a disreputable place? Of course. Why was I, against all right and justice, prevented from entering my own dwelling? You have possession of it now, but you must go to your lawyer and tell him to suspend all proceedings against Rosetta, who has done nothing but under my instructions. I suspect that your intention was to sell the rest of the furniture. I have prevented it. There is a room at your disposal at St. Chrysostom's, in a house of mine the first floor of which is occupied by la tintoretta our first opera dancer send all your things there and come and dine with me every day your sister and your brothers have been provided with a comfortable home therefore everything is now arranged for the best i called at once upon m rosa to whom i explained all that had taken place and his advice being to give way to m grimani's wishes I determined to follow it. Besides, the arrangement offered the best satisfaction I could obtain, as to be a guest at his dinner-table was an honor for me. I was likewise full of curiosity respecting my new lodging, under the same roof with La Tintoretta, who was much talked of, owing to a certain prince of Waldeck, who was extravagantly generous with her. The bishop was expected in the course of the summer. I had, therefore, only six months more to wait in Venice before taking the road which would lead me, perhaps, to the throne of St. Peter. Everything in the future assumed in my eyes the brightest hue, and my imagination reveled amongst the most radiant beams of sunshine. My castles in the air were indeed most beautiful. I dined the same day with M. Grimani, and I found myself seated next to Rosetta, an unpleasant neighbor, but I took no notice of him. When the meal was over, I paid a last visit to my beautiful house in St. Samuel's Parish, and sent all I possessed in a gondola to my new lodging. I did not know Signora Tintoretta, but I was well acquainted with her reputation, character, and manners. She was but a poor dancer, neither handsome nor plain, but a woman of wit and intellect. Prince Waldeck spent a great deal for her, and yet he did not prevent her from retaining the titulary protection of a noble Venetian of the Lynn family, now extinct, a man about sixty years of age, who was her visitor at every hour of the day. This nobleman who knew me came to my room towards the evening with the compliments of the lady who, he added, was delighted to have me in her house and would be pleased to receive me in her intimate circle. To excuse myself for not having been the first to pay my respects to the signora, I told M. Lynn that I did not know she was my neighbor that m grimani had not mentioned the circumstance otherwise i would have paid my duties to her before taking possession of my lodging after this apology i followed the ambassador he presented me to his mistress and the acquaintance was made she received me like a princess took off her glove before giving me her hand to kiss mentioned my name before five or six strangers who were present, and whose names she gave me, and invited me to take a seat near her. As she was a native of Venice, I thought it was absurd for her to speak French to me, and I told her that I was not acquainted with that language, and would feel grateful if she would converse in Italian. She was surprised at my not speaking French, and I said I would cut but a poor figure in her drawing-room, as they seldom spoke any other language there, because she received a great many foreigners. I promised to learn French. Prince Waldeck came in during the evening. I was introduced to him, and he gave me a very friendly welcome. He could speak Italian very well, and during the carnival he shewed me great kindness. He presented me with a good snuff-box as a reward for a very poor sonnet, which I had written for his dear Grizzellini. This was her family name. She was called Tintoretta, because her father had been a dyer. 
the Tintoretta had greater claims than Juliet to the admiration of sensible men. She loved poetry, and if it had not been that I was expecting the bishop, I would have fallen in love with her. She was herself smitten with a young physician of great merit, named Rigellini, who died in the prime of life, and whom I still regret. I shall have to mention him in another part of my memoirs. Towards the end of the carnival, my mother wrote to M. Grimani that it would be a great shame if the bishop found me under the roof of an opera dancer, and he made up his mind to lodge me in a respectable and decent place. He took the Abbe Tosello into consultation, and the two gentlemen thought that the best thing that they could do for me would be to send me to a clerical seminary. They arranged everything unknown to me, and the abbey undertook to inform me of their plan and to obtain from me a gracious consent. But when I heard him speak with beautiful flowers of rhetoric for the purpose of gilding the bitter pill, I could not help bursting into a joyous laughter, and I astounded his reverence when I expressed my readiness to go anywhere he might think right to send me. The plan of the two worthy gentlemen was absurd, for at the age of seventeen, and with a nature like mine, the idea of placing me in a seminary ought never to have been entertained. But, ever a faithful disciple of Socrates, feeling no unconquerable reluctance, and the plan, on the contrary, appearing to me rather a good joke, I not only gave a ready consent, but I even longed to enter the seminary. I told M. Grimani I was prepared to accept anything, provided Rosetta had nothing to do with it. He gave me his promise, but he did not keep it when I left the seminary. I have never been able to decide whether this Grimani was kind because he was a fool, or whether his stupidity was the result of his kindness, but all his brothers were the same. The worst trick that dame fortune could play upon an intelligent young man is to place him under the dependence of a fool a few days afterwards having been dressed as a pupil of a clerical seminary by the care of the abbe i was taken to saint cyprian de muran and introduced to the rector the patriarchal church of saint cyprian is served by an order of the monks founded by the blessed jerome miani a nobleman of venice the rector received me with tender affection and great kindness but in his address which was full of unction i thought i could perceive a suspicion on his part that my being sent to the seminary was a punishment or at least a way to put a stop to an irregular life, and, feeling hurt in my dignity, I told him at once, Reverend Father, I do not think that any one has the right of punishing me. No, no, my son, he answered, I only meant that you would be very happy with us. We were then shown three halls, in which we found at least one hundred and fifty seminarists, ten or twelve schoolrooms, the refectory, the dormitory, the gardens for play hours, and every pain was taken to make me imagine life in such a place the happiest that could fall to the lot of a young man, and to make me suppose that I would even regret the arrival of the bishop. Yet they all tried to cheer me up by saying that I would only remain there five or six months. Their eloquence amused me greatly. I entered the seminary at the beginning of March, and prepared myself for my new life by passing the night between my two young friends, Nanette and Martin, who bathed their pillows with tears. They could not understand, and this was likewise the feeling of their aunt and of their good M. Rosa, how a young man like myself could show such obedience. The day before going to the seminary, I had taken care to entrust all my papers to Madame Manzoni. They made a large parcel, and I left it in her hands for fifteen years. The worthy old lady is still alive, and with her ninety years she enjoys good health and a cheerful temper. She received me with a smile, and told me that I would not remain one month in the seminary. I beg your pardon, madam, but I am very glad to go there, 
and intend to remain until the arrival of the bishop. You do not know your own nature, and you do not know your bishop, with whom you will not remain very long either. The abbey accompanied me to the seminary in a gondola, but at St. Michel he had to stop in consequence of a violent attack of vomiting which seized me suddenly. The apothecary cured me with some mint water. I was indebted for this attack to the two frequent sacrifices which I had been offering on the altar of love. Any lover who knows what his feelings were when he found himself with the woman he adored, and with the fear that it was for the last time, will easily imagine my feelings during the last hours that I expected ever to spend with my two charming mistresses. I could not be induced to let the last offering be the last, and I went on offering until there was no more incense left. The priest committed me to the care of the rector, and my luggage was carried to the dormitory, where I went myself to deposit my cloak and my hat. I was not placed amongst the adults, because, notwithstanding my size, I was not old enough. Besides, I would not shave myself through vanity, because I thought that the down on my face left no doubt of my youth. It was ridiculous, of course, but when does man cease to be so? We get rid of our vices more easily than of our follies." tyranny has not had sufficient power over me to compel me to shave myself, if it is only in that respect that I have found tyranny to be tolerant. "'To which school do you wish to belong?' asked the rector. "'To the dogmatic, reverend father, I wish to study the history of the church. I will introduce you to the father examiner.' I am a doctor in divinity, most reverend father, and do not want to be examined. It is necessary, my dear son. Come with me. This necessity appeared to me an insult, and I felt very angry, but a spirit of revenge quickly whispered to me the best way to mystify them, and the idea made me very joyful. I answered so badly all the questions propounded in Latin by the examiner, I made so many solecisms that he felt it his duty to send me to an inferior class of grammar, in which, to my great delight, I found myself the companion of some twenty young urchins of about ten years, who, hearing that I was doctor in divinity, kept on saying, Accipiamus pecuniam et mitamus asinum in patriam suam. Our play hours afforded me great amusement. My companions of the dormitory, who were all in the class of philosophy at least, looked down upon me with great contempt, and when they spoke of their own sublime discourses, they laughed if I appeared to be listening attentively to their discussions, which, as they thought, must have been perfect enigmas to me. I did not intend to betray myself, but an accident, which I could not avoid, forced me to throw off the mask. Father Barbarigo, belonging to the convent of the Salutation at Venice, whose pupil I had been in physics, came to pay a visit to the rector, and seeing me as we were coming from Mass, paid me his friendly compliments. His first question was to inquire what science I was studying, and he thought I was joking when I answered that I was learning the grammar. The rector having joined us, I left them together and went to my class. An hour later, the rector sent for me. Why did you feign such ignorance at the examination, he asked. Why, I answered, were you unjust enough to compel me to the degradation of an examination? He looked annoyed and escorted me to the dogmatic school, where my comrades of the dormitory received me with great astonishment, and in the afternoon, at playtime, they gathered around me and made me very happy with their professions of friendship. One of them, about fifteen years old, and who at the present time must, if still alive, be a bishop, attracted my notice by his features as much as by his talents. He inspired me with a very warm friendship, and during recess, instead of playing skittles with the others, we always walked together. 
we conversed upon poetry and we both delighted in the beautiful odes of horace we liked ariosto better than tasso and petrarch had our whole admiration while tassoni and muratori who had been his critics were the special objects of our contempt we were such fast friends after four days of acquaintance that we were actually jealous of each other and to such an extent that if either of us walked about with any seminarist the other would be angry and sulk like a disappointed lover the dormitory was placed under the supervision of a lay friar and it was his province to keep us in good order after supper accompanied by this lay friar who had the title of prefect we all proceeded to the dormitory there every one had to go to his own bed and to undress quietly after having said his prayers in a low voice when all the pupils were in bed the prefect would go to his own a large lantern lighted up the dormitory which had the shape of a parallelogram eighty yards by ten the beds were placed at equal distances and to each bed there were a fold stool a chair and room for the trunk of the seminarist at one end was the washing place and at the other the bed of the prefect the bed of my friend was opposite mine and the lantern was between us the principal duty of the prefect was to take care that no pupil should go and sleep with one of his comrades for such a visit was never supposed an innocent one it was a cardinal sin and bed being accounted the place for sleep and not for conversation it was admitted that a pupil who slept out of his own bed did so only for immoral purposes so long as he stopped in his own bed he could do what he liked so much the worse for him if he gave himself up to bad practices it has been remarked in germany that it is precisely in those institutions for young men in which the directors have taken most pains to prevent onanism that this vice is most prevalent those who had framed the regulations in our seminary were stupid fools who had not the slightest knowledge of either morals or human nature nature has wants which must be administered to and tissot is right only as far as the abuse of nature is concerned but his abuse would very seldom occur if the directors exercised proper wisdom and prudence and if they did not make a point of forbidding it in a special and peculiar manner young people give way to dangerous excesses from a sheer delight in disobedience a disposition very natural to humankind since it began with adam and eve i had been in the seminary for nine or ten days when one night i felt some one stealing very quietly in my bed my hand was at once clutched and my name whispered i could hardly restrain my laughter it was my friend who having chanced to wake up and finding that the lantern was out had taken a sudden fancy to pay me a visit I very soon begged him to go away for fear the prefect should be awake, for in such a case we should have found ourselves in a very unpleasant dilemma, and most likely would have been accused of some abominable offence. As I was giving him that good advice, we heard someone moving, and my friend made his escape. But immediately after he had left me, I heard the fall of some person, and at the same time the hoarse voice of the prefect exclaiming, Ah, villain, wait until tomorrow, until tomorrow. After which threat he lighted the lantern and returned to his couch. The next morning, before the ringing of the bell for rising, the rector, followed by the prefect, entered the dormitory and said to us, Listen to me, all of you. You are aware of what has taken place this last night. Two amongst you must be guilty, but I wish to forgive them and to save their honor. 
I promise that their names shall not be made public. I expect every one of you to come to me for confession before recess. He left the dormitory, and we dressed ourselves. In the afternoon, in obedience to his orders, we all went to him and confessed, after which ceremony we repaired to the garden, where my friend told me that, having unfortunately met the prefect after he left me, he had thought that the best way was to knock him down, in order to get him to reach his own bed without being known. And now, I said, you are certain of being forgiven, for, of course, you have wisely confessed your error? You're joking, answered my friend. Why, the rector would not have known any more than he knows at present, even if my visit to you had been paid with a criminal intent. Then you must have made a false confession. You are, at all events, guilty of disobedience. That may be, but the rector is responsible for the guilt, as he used compulsion. My dear friend, you argue in a very forcible way, and the very reverend rector must by this time be satisfied that the inmates of our dormitory are more learned than he is himself. No more would have been said about the adventure if, a few nights after, I had not in my turn taken a fancy to return the visit paid by my friend. Towards midnight, having had occasion to get out of bed, and hearing the loud snoring of the prefect, I quickly put out the lantern and went to lie beside my friend. He knew me at once, and gladly received me. But we both listened attentively to the snoring of our keeper, and when it ceased, understanding our danger, I got up and reached my own bed without losing a second. But the moment I got to it I had a double surprise. In the first place I felt somebody lying in my bed, and in the second I saw the prefect, with a candle in his hand, coming along slowly and taking a survey of all the beds right and left. I could understand the prefect suddenly lighting a candle, but how could I realize what I saw? Namely, one of my comrades sleeping soundly in my bed, with his back turned to me. I immediately made up my mind to feign sleep. After two or three shakings given by the prefect, I pretended to wake up, and my bed companion woke up in earnest. Astonished at finding himself in my bed, he offered me an apology. I have made a mistake, he said, as I returned from a certain place in the dark. I found your bed empty and mistook it for mine. Very likely, I answered, I had to get up too. Yes, remarked the prefect, but how does it happen that— you went to bed without making any remark when, on your return, you found your bed already tenanted. And how is it that, being in the dark, you did not suppose that you were mistaken yourself? I could not mistaken, for I felt the pedestal of this crucifix of mine, and I knew I was right. As to my companion here, I did not feel him. It is all very unlikely, answered our Argus, and he went to the lantern, the wick of which he found crushed down. The wick has been forced into the oil, gentlemen. It has not gone out of itself. It has been the handiwork of one of you, but it will be seen to in the morning. My stupid companion went to his own bed. The prefect lighted the lamp and retired to his rest, and after this scene, which had broken the repose of every pupil, I quietly slept under the appearance of the rector, who, at the dawn of day, came in great fury, escorted by his satellite, the prefect. The rector, after examining the localities and submitting to a lengthy interrogatory first my accomplice, who very naturally was considered as the most guilty, and then myself, whom nothing could convict of the offence, ordered us to get up and go to church to attend Mass. As soon as we were dressed, he came back, and addressing us both, he said kindly, You stand both convicted of a scandalous connivance, and it is proved by the fact of the lantern having been willfully extinguished. 
I am disposed to believe that the cause of all these disorders is, if not entirely innocent, at least due only to extreme thoughtlessness. But the scandal given to all your comrades, the outrage offered to the discipline and to the established rules of the seminary, call loudly for punishment. Leave the room. We obeyed, but hardly were we between the double doors of the dormitory than we were seized by four servants who tied our hands behind us and led us to the classroom where they compelled us to kneel down before the great crucifix. The rector told them to execute his orders, and, as we were in that position, the wretches administered to each of us seven or eight blows with a stick or with a rope, which I received, as well as my companion, without a murmur. But the moment my hands were free, I asked the rector whether I could write two lines at the very foot of the cross. He gave orders to bring ink and paper, and I traced the following words. I solemnly swear by this God that I have never spoken to the seminarist who was found in my bed. As an innocent person I must protest against this shameful violence. I shall appeal to the justice of his lordship, the patriarch. My comrade in misery signed this protest with me, after which, addressing myself to all the pupils, I read it aloud calling upon them to speak the truth if any one could say the contrary of what I had written. They, with one voice, immediately declared that, that we had never been seen conversing together, and that no one knew who had put the lamp out. The rector left the room in the midst of hisses and curses, but he sent us to prison all the same at the top of the house and in separate cells. An hour afterwards I had my bed, my trunk and all my things and my meals were brought to me every day on the fourth day the abbe tosello came for me with instructions to bring me to venice i asked him whether he had sifted this unpleasant affair he told me that he had inquired into it that he had seen the other seminarists and that he believed we were both innocent but the rector would not confess himself in the wrong, and he did not see what could be done. I threw off my seminarist habit, and dressed myself in the clothes I used to wear in Venice, and while my luggage was carried to a boat, I accompanied the abbey to M. Grimani's gondola, in which he had come, and we took our departure. On our way, the abbey ordered the boatman to leave my things at the palace Grimani, adding that he was instructed by M. Grimani to tell me that, if I had the audacity to present myself at his mansion, his servants had received orders to turn me away. He landed me near the convent of the Jesuits without any money and with nothing but what I had on my back. I went to beg a dinner from Madame Manzoni, who laughed heartedly at the realization of her prediction. After dinner, I called upon M. Rosa to see whether the law could protect me against the tyranny of my enemies, and after he had been made acquainted with the circumstances of the case, he promised to bring me the same evening at Madame Orio's house an extrajudicial act. I repaired to the palace of appointment to wait for him, and to enjoy the pleasures of my two charming friends at my sudden reappearance. It was indeed very great, and the recital of my adventures did not astonish them less than my unexpected presence. M. Rosa came and made me read the act which he had prepared. He did not have time to have it engrossed by the notary, but he undertook to have it ready the next day. I left Madame Orio to take supper with my brother Francois, who resided with a painter called Guardi. He was, like me, much oppressed by the tyranny of Grimani, and I promised to deliver him. Towards midnight I returned to the two amiable sisters, who were expecting me with their usual loving impatience, but, I am bound to confess it with all humility, my sorrows were prejudicial to love in spite of the fortnight of absence and of abstinence. They were themselves deeply affected to see me so unhappy, and pitied me with all their hearts. 
I endeavored to console them and assured them that all my misery would soon come to an end and that we would make up for lost time. In the morning, having no time and not knowing where to go, I went to St. Mark's Library, where I remained until noon. I left it with the intention of dining with Madame Manzoni, but I was suddenly accosted by a soldier who informed me that someone wanted to speak to me in a gondola to which he pointed. I answered that the person might as well come out, but he quietly remarked that he had a friend at hand to conduct me forcibly to the gondola, if necessary, and without any more hesitation I went towards it. I had a great dislike to noise or to anything like a public exhibition. I might have resisted, for the soldiers were unarmed, and I would not have been taken up, this sort of arrest not being legal in Venice, but I did not think of it. The sacred deum was playing its part. I felt no reluctance. Besides, there are moments in which a courageous man has no courage, or disdains to show it. I enter the gondola, the curtain is drawn aside, and I see my evil genius, Razetta, with an officer. The two soldiers sit down at the prow. I recognize M. Grimani's own gondola. It leaves the landing and takes the direction of the Lido. No one spoke to me, and I remained silent. After half an hour's sailing, the gondola stopped before the small entrance of the fortress St. Andre, at the mouth of the Adriatic, on the very spot where the Bucentaur stands, when, on Ascension Day, the Doge comes to expose the sea. The sentinel calls the corporal. We alight. The officer who accompanied me introduces me to the major and presents a letter to him. The major, after reading its contents, gives orders to M. Zen, his adjutant, to consign me to the guardhouse. In another quarter of an hour, my conductors take their departure, and M. Zen brings me three livres and a half stating that I would receive the same amount every week. It was exactly the pay of a private. I did not give way to any burst of passion, but I felt the most intense indignation. Late in the evening I expressed a wish to have some food brought, for I could not starve. Then, stretching myself upon a hard camp bed, I passed the night amongst the soldiers without closing my eyes, for these Clavonians were singing, eating garlic, smoking a bad tobacco which was most noxious, and drinking a wine of their own country as black as ink, which nobody else could swallow. Early next morning, Major Pelodoro, the governor of the fortress, called me up to his room and told me that, in compelling me to spend the night in the guardhouse, he had only obeyed the orders he had received from Venice from the Secretary of War. Now, Reverend Sir, he added, my further orders are only to keep you a prisoner in the fort, and I am responsible for your remaining here. I give you the whole of the fortress for your prison. You shall have a good room in which you will find your bed and all your luggage. Walk anywhere you please, but recollect that if you should escape, you would cause my ruin. I am sorry that my instructions are to give you only ten sous a day, but if you have any friends in Venice able to send you some money, write to them and trust to me for the security of your letters. Now you may go to bed if you need rest. I was taken to my room. It was large and on the first story, with two windows from which I had a very fine view. I found my bed, and I ascertained with great satisfaction that my trunk, of which I had the keys, had not been forced open. The major had kindly supplied my table with all the implements necessary for writing. A Sclavonian soldier informed me very politely that he would attend upon me, and that I would pay f him for his services whenever I could, for every one knew that I had only ten sous a day. I began by ordering some soup, and when I had dispatched it, I went to bed and slept for nine hours. 
When I woke, I received an invitation to supper from the Major, and I began to imagine that things, after all, would not be so very bad. I went to the honest governor, whom I found in numerous company. He presented me to his wife and to every person present. I met there several officers, the chaplain of the fortress, a certain Paoli Vida, one of the singers of St. Mark's Church, and his wife, a pretty woman, sister-in-law of the major, whom the husband chose to confine in the fort because he was very jealous. Jealous men are not comfortable at Venice, together with several other ladies, not very young, but whom I thought very agreeable, owing to their kind welcome. Cheerful as I was by nature, those pleasant guests easily managed to put me in the best of humors. Everyone expressed a wish to know the reasons which could have induced M. Grimani to send me to the fortress, so I gave a faithful account of all my adventures since my grandmother's death. I spoke for three hours without any bitterness, and even in a pleasant tone, upon things which, said in a different manner, might have displeased my audience. All expressed their satisfaction and showed so much sympathy that, as we parted for the night, I received from all an assurance of friendship and the offer of their services. This is a piece of good fortune which has never failed me whenever I have been the victim of oppression until I reached the age of fifty. Whenever I met with honest persons expressing a curiosity to know the history of the misfortune under which I was laboring, and whenever I satisfied their curiosity, I have inspired them with friendship, and with that sympathy which was necessary to render them favorable and useful to me. That success was owing to a very simple artifice. It was only to tell my story in a quiet and truthful manner, without even avoiding the facts which told against me. It is simple secret that many men do not know because the larger portion of humankind is composed of cowards. A man who always tells the truth must be possessed of great moral courage. Experience has taught me that truth is a talisman, the charm of which never fails in its effect, provided it is not wasted upon unworthy people. And I believe that a guilty man, who candidly speaks the truth to his judge, has a better chance of being acquitted than the innocent man who hesitates and evades true statements. Of course, the speaker must be young, or at least in the prime of manhood, for an old man finds the whole of nature combined against him. The major had his joke respecting the visit paid, and returned to the seminarist's bed, but the chaplain and the ladies scolded him. The major advised me to write up my story and send it to the Secretary of War, undertaking that he should receive it, and he assured me that he would become my protector. All the ladies tried to induce me to follow the major's advice. Chapter 7, Part 1 of The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Harris. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 1. CHILDHOOD CHAPTER Seven, PART One. The fort, in which the Republic usually kept only a garrison of one hundred half-pay Sclavonians, happened to contain at that time two thousand Albanian soldiers, who were called Samariotes. The Secretary of War, who was generally known under the title of Sage à l'Écriture, had summoned these men from the east in consequence of some impending promotion, as he wanted the officers to be on the spot in order to prove their merits before being rewarded. They all came from the part of Epirus called Albania, which belongs to the Republic of Venice, 
and they had distinguished themselves in the last war against the Turks. It was for me a new and extraordinary sight to examine some eighteen or twenty officers, all of an advanced age yet strong and healthy, showing the scars which covered their face and their chest, the last naked and entirely exposed through military pride. The lieutenant colonel was particularly conspicuous by his wounds, for, without exaggeration, he had lost one-fourth of his head. He had but one eye, but one ear, and no jaw to speak of. Yet he could eat very well, speak without difficulty, and was very cheerful. He had with him all his family, composed of two pretty daughters, who looked all the prettier in their national costume, and of seven sons, every one of them a soldier. This lieutenant colonel stood six feet high, and his figure was magnificent, but his scars so completely deformed his features that his face was truly horrid to look at. Yet I found so much attraction in him that I liked him the moment I saw him, and I would have been much pleased to converse with him if his breath had not sent forth such a strong smell of garlic. All the Albanians had their pockets full of it, and they enjoyed a piece of garlic with as much relish as we do a sugar-plum. After this none can maintain it to be a poison, though the only medicinal virtue it possesses is to excite the appetite, because it acts like a tonic upon a weak stomach. The lieutenant colonel could not read, but he was not ashamed of his ignorance, because not one amongst his men, except the priest and the surgeon, could boast greater learning. Every man, officer or private, had his purse full of gold. Half of them, at least, were married, and we had in the fortress a colony of five or six hundred women, with God knows how many children. I felt greatly interested in them all. Happy idleness! I often regret thee, because thou hast often offered me new sights, and for the same reason I hate old age, which never offers but what I know already unless I should take up a gazette, but I cared nothing for them in my young days. Alone in my room I made an inventory of my trunk, and having put aside everything of an ecclesiastical character, I sent for a Jew and sold the whole parcel unmercifully. Then I wrote to M. Rosa, enclosing all the tickets of the articles I had pledged, requesting him to have them sold without any exception, and to forward me the surplus raised by the sale. Thanks to that double operation, I was enabled to give my Sclavonian servant the ten sous allowed to me every day. Another soldier, who had been a hairdresser, took care of my hair, which I had been compelled to neglect in consequences of the rules of the seminary. I spent my time in walking about the fort and through the barracks, and my two places of resort were the major's apartment for some intellectual enjoyment, and the rooms of the Albanian lieutenant colonel for a sprinkling of love. The Albanian, feeling certain that his colonel would be appointed brigadier, solicited the command of the regiment, but he had a rival, and he feared his success. I wrote him a petition, short but so well composed, that the secretary of war having inquired the name of the author, gave the Albanian his colonelcy. On his return to the fort, the brave fellow, overjoyed at his success, hugged me in his arms, saying that he owed it all to me. He invited me to a family dinner, in which my very soul was parched by his garlic, and he presented me with twelve botargos and two pounds of excellent Turkish tobacco. The result of my petition made all the other officers think that they could not succeed without the assistance of my pen, and I willingly gave it to everybody. This entailed many quarrels upon me, for I served all interests, but finding myself the lucky possessor of some forty sequins, I was no longer in dread of poverty, and laughed at everything. However, I met with an accident which made me pass six weeks in a very unpleasant condition. On the 2nd of April, the fatal anniversary of my first appearance in this world, as I was getting up in the morning, I received in my room the visit of a very handsome Greek woman. She told me that her husband, then ensign in the regiment, 
had every right to claim the rank of lieutenant, and that he would certainly be appointed if it were not for the opposition of his captain, who was against him, because she had refused him certain favors which she could bestow only upon her husband. She handed me some certificates, and begged me to write a petition which she would present herself to the Secretary of War, adding that she could only offer me her heart in payment. I answered that her heart ought not to go alone. I acted as I had spoken, and I met with no other resistance than the objection which a pretty woman is always sure to feign for the sake of appearance. After that I told her to come back at noon, and that the petition would be ready. She was exact to the appointment, and very kindly rewarded me a second time, and in the evening, under pretense of some alterations to be made in the petition, she afforded an excellent opportunity of reaping a third recompense. But alas, the path of pleasure is not strewn only with roses. On the third day I found out, much to my dismay, that a serpent had been hid under the flowers. Six weeks of care and of rigid diet re-established my health. When I met the handsome Greek again, I was foolish enough to reproach her for the present she had bestowed upon me, but she baffled me by laughing, and saying that she had only offered me what she possessed, and that it was my own fault if I had not been sufficiently careful. The reader cannot imagine how much this first misfortune grieved me, and what deep shame I felt. I looked upon myself as a dishonored man, and while I am on that subject, I may as well relate an incident which will give some idea of my thoughtlessness. Madame Vida, the major's sister-in-law, being alone with me one morning, confided in me in a moment of unreserved confidence what she had to suffer from the jealous disposition of her husband, and his cruelty in having allowed her to sleep alone for the last four years, when she was in the very flower of her age. "'I trust to God,' she added, "'that my husband will not find out that you have spent an hour alone with me, for I should never hear the end of it.' Feeling deeply for her grief, and confidence begetting confidence, I was stupid enough to tell her the sad state to which I had been reduced by the cruel Greek woman, assuring her that I felt my misery all the more deeply, because I should have been delighted to console her, and to give her the opportunity of a revenge for her jealous husband's coldness. At this speech, in which my simplicity and good faith could easily be traced, she rose from her chair and upbraided me with every insult which an outraged honest woman might hurl at the head of a bold libertine who is presumed too far. Astounded, but understanding perfectly well the nature of my crime, I bowed myself out of her room, but as I was leaving it she told me in the same angry tone that my visits would not be welcome for the future, as I was a conceited puppy unworthy of the society of good and respectable women. I took care to answer that a respectable woman would have been rather more reserved than she had been in her confidences. On reflection I felt pretty sure that, if I had been in good health, or had said nothing about my mishap, she would have been but too happy to receive my consolations. A few days after that incident I had a much greater cause to regret my acquaintance with the Greek woman. On Ascension Day, as the ceremony of the Busan Tower was celebrated near the fort, M. Rosa brought Madame Oreo and her two nieces to witness it, and I had the pleasure of treating them all to a good dinner in my room. I found myself during the day alone with my young friends in one of the casements, and they both loaded me with the most loving caresses and kisses. I felt that they expected some substantial proof of my love, but to conceal the real state of things, I pretended to be afraid of being surprised, and they had to be satisfied with my shallow excuse. I had informed my mother by letter of all I had suffered from Grimani's treatment. She answered that she had written to him on the subject, that she had no doubt he would immediately set me at liberty, 
and that an arrangement had been entered into by which M. Grimani would devote the money raised by Rosetta from the sale of the furniture to the settlement of a small patrimony on my youngest brother. But in this matter Grimani did not act honestly, for the patrimony was only settled thirteen years afterwards, and even then only in a fictitious manner. I shall have an opportunity later on of mentioning this unfortunate brother, who died very poor in Rome twenty years ago. Towards the middle of June the Samariotes were sent back to the east, and after their departure the garrison of the fort was reduced to its usual number. I began to feel weary in this comparative solitude, and I gave way to terrible fits of passion. The heat was intense, and so disagreeable to me, that I wrote to M. Grimani, asking for two summer suits of clothes, and telling him where they would be found, if Rosetta had not sold them. A week afterwards I was in the Major's apartment, when I saw the wretch Rosetta come in, accompanied by a man whom he introduced as Petrillo, the celebrated favorite of the Empress of Russia, just arrived from St. Petersburg. He ought to have said infamous instead of celebrated, and clown instead of favorite. The major invited them to take a seat, and Rosetta, receiving a parcel from Grimani's gondolier, handed it to me, saying, I have brought you your rags, take them. I answered, Some day I will bring you a regano. At these words the scoundrel dared to raise his cane, but the indignant major compelled him to lower his tone by asking him whether he had any wish to pass the night in the guard-house. Petrillo, who had not yet opened his lips, told me then that he was sorry not to have found me in Venice, as I might have shown him round certain places which must be well known to me. "'Very likely we should have met your wife in such places,' I answered." I am a good judge of faces, he said, and I can see that you are a true gallows bird. I was trembling with rage, and the major, who shared my utter disgust, told them that he had business to transact, and they took their leave. The major assured me that on the following day he would go to the war office to complain of Rosetta, and that he would have him punished for his insolence. I remained alone, a prey to feelings of the deepest indignation, and to a most ardent thirst for revenge. The fortress was entirely surrounded by water, and my windows were not overlooked by any of the sentinels. A boat coming under my windows could therefore easily take me to Venice during the night, and bring me back to the fortress before daybreak. All that was necessary was to find a boatman who, for a certain amount, would risk the galleys in case of discovery. Amongst several who brought provisions to the fort, I chose a boatman whose countenance pleased me, and I offered him one sequin. He promised to let me know his decision on the following day. He was true to his time, and declared himself ready to take me. He informed me that, before deciding to serve me, he had wished to know whether I was kept in the fort for any great crime, but as the wife of the major had told him that my imprisonment had been caused by very trifling frolics, I could rely upon him. We arranged that he should be under my window at the beginning of the night, and that his boat should be provided with a mast long enough to enable me to slide along it from the window to the boat. The appointed hour came, and everything being ready I got safely into the boat, landed at the Sclavonian Quay, ordered the boatman to wait for me, and wrapped up in a mariner's cloak I took my way straight to the gate of St. Sauveur, and engaged the waiter of a coffee-room to take me to Rosetta's house. Being quite certain that he would not be at home at that time, I rang the bell, and I heard my sister's voice telling me that if I wanted to see him I must call in the morning. Satisfied with this, I went to the foot of the bridge and sat down, waiting there to see which way he would come, and a few minutes before midnight I saw him advancing from the square of St. Paul. It was all I wanted to know. I went back to my boat and returned to the fort without any difficulty. 
At five o'clock in the morning, everyone in the garrison could see me enjoying my walk on the platform. Taking all the time necessary to mature my plans, I made the following arrangements to secure my revenge with perfect safety, and to prove an alibi in case I should kill my rascally enemy, as it was my intention to do. The day preceding the night fixed for my expedition, I walked about with the son of the adjutant Zen, who was only twelve years old, but who amused me much by his shrewdness. The reader will meet him again in the year 1771. As I was walking with him, I jumped down from one of the bastions and feigned to sprain my ankle. Two soldiers carried me to my room, and the surgeon of the fort, thinking that I was suffering from a luxation, ordered me to keep to bed and wrapped up the ankle in towels saturated with camphorated spirits of wine. Everybody came to see me, and I requested the soldier who served me to remain and to sleep in my room. I knew that a glass of brandy was enough to stupefy the man and to make him sleep soundly. As soon as I saw him fast asleep, I begged the surgeon and the chaplain, who had his room over mine, to leave me, and at half-past ten I lowered myself in the boat. As soon as I reached Venice, I bought a stout cudgel, and I sat myself down on a doorstep at the corner of the street near St. Paul's Square. A narrow canal at the end of the street was, I thought, the very place to throw my enemy in. That canal has now disappeared. At a quarter before twelve, I see Rosetta walking along leisurely. I come out of the street with rapid strides, keeping near the wall to compel him to make room for me, and I strike a first blow on the head, and a second on his arm. The third blow sends him tumbling in the canal, howling and screaming my name. At the same instant a forlorn, or citizen of Forley, comes out of a house on my left side with a lantern in his hand. A blow from my cudgel knocks the lantern out of his grasp, and the man, frightened out of his wits, takes to his heels. I throw away my stick, I run at full speed through the square and over the bridge, and while people are hastening towards the spot where the disturbance had taken place, I jump into the boat, and, thanks to a strong breeze swelling our sail, I get back to the fortress. Twelve o'clock was striking as I re-entered my room through the window. I quickly undress myself, and the moment I am in my bed, I wake up the soldier by my loud screams, telling him to go for the surgeon, as I am dying of the colic. The chaplain, roused by my screaming, comes down and finds me in convulsions. In the hope that some discordium would relieve me, the good old man runs to his room and brings it. But while he has gone for some water, I hide the medicine. After half an hour of wry faces, I say that I feel much better, and, thanking all my friends, I beg them to retire, which everyone does, wishing me a quiet sleep. The next morning I could not get up, in consequence of my sprained ankle, although I had slept very well. The Major was kind enough to call upon me before going to Venice, and he said that very likely my colic had been caused by the melon I had eaten for my dinner the day before. The Major returned at one o'clock in the afternoon. "'I have good news to give you,' he said to me with a joyful laugh. Rosetta was soundly cudgeled last night and thrown into a canal. "'Has he been killed?' "'No, but I am glad of it for your sake, for his death would make your position much more serious. You are accused of having done it.' "'I am very glad people think me guilty. It is something of a revenge, but it will be rather difficult to bring it home to me.' "'Very difficult. All the same, Rosetta swears he recognized you.' and the same declaration is made by the forelin who says that you struck his hand to make him drop his lantern. Rosetta's nose is broken, three of his teeth are gone, and his right arm is severely hurt. You've been accused before the Avigator, and M. Grimani has written to the war office to complain of your release from the fortress without his knowledge. I arrived at the office just in time. 
The secretary was reading Grimani's letter, and I assured His Excellency that it was a false report, for I left you in bed this morning, suffering from a sprained ankle. I told him likewise that at twelve o'clock last night you were very near death from a severe attack of colic. Was it at midnight that Rosetta was so well treated? So says the official report. The war secretary wrote at once to M. Grimani and informed him that you have not left the fort, and that you are even now detained in it, and that the plaintiff is at liberty, if he chooses, to send commissaries to ascertain the fact. Therefore, my dear Abbe, you must prepare yourself for an interrogatory. I expect it, and I will answer that I am very sorry to be innocent. Three days afterwards a commissary came to the fort with a clerk of the court, and the proceedings were soon over. Everybody knew that I had sprained my ankle. The chaplain, the surgeon, my body servant, and several others swore that at midnight I was in bed suffering from colic. My alibi being thoroughly proved, the avigator sentenced Rosetta and the Forlan to pay all expenses without prejudice to my rights of action. After this judgment, the major advised me to address to the Secretary of War a petition which he undertook to deliver himself, and to claim my release from the fort. I gave notice of my proceedings to M. Grimani, and a week afterwards the major told me that I was free, and that he would himself take me to the abbey. It was at dinner time, and in the middle of some amusing conversation, that he imparted that piece of information. Not supposing him to be in earnest, and in order to keep up the joke, I told him very politely that I preferred his house to Venice, and that, to prove it, I would be happy to remain a week longer if he would grant me permission to do so. I was taken at my word, and everybody seemed very pleased. But when, two hours later, the news was confirmed, and I could no longer doubt the truth of my release, I repented the week which I had so foolishly thrown away as a present to the Major. Yet I had not the courage to break my word, for everybody, and particularly his wife, had shown such unaffected pleasure, it would have been contemptible of me to change my mind. The good woman knew that I owed her every kindness which I had enjoyed, and she might have thought me ungrateful. But I met in the fort with a last adventure, which I must not forget to relate. On the following day an officer, dressed in the national uniform, called upon the Major, accompanied by an elderly man of about sixty years of age, wearing a sword, and, presenting to the Major a dispatch with the seal of the war office, he waited for an answer, and went away as soon as he had received one from the Governor. After the officer had taken leave, the Major, addressing himself to the elderly gentleman, to whom he gave the title of Count, told him that his orders were to keep him a prisoner, and that he gave him the whole of the fort for his prison. The Count offered him his sword, but the Major nobly refused to take it, and escorted him to the room he was to occupy. Soon after, a servant in livery brought a bed and a trunk, and the next morning the same servant, knocking at my door, told me that his master begged the honor of my company to breakfast. I accepted the invitation, and he received me with these words. Dear sir, there has been so much talk in Venice about the skill with which you proved your incredible alibi, that I could not help asking for the honor of your acquaintance. But count, the alibi being a true one, there can be no skill required to prove it, Allow me to say that those who doubt its truth are paying me a very poor compliment, for, never mind, do not let us talk any more of that, and forgive me, but as we happen to be companions in misfortune, I trust you will not refuse me your friendship. Now for breakfast. After our meal, the Count, who had heard from me some portion of my history, thought that my confidence called for a return on his part, and he began— I am the Count de Bonafide. In my early days I served under Prince Eugene, but I gave up the army and entered on a civil career in Austria. 
I had to fly from Austria and take refuge in Bavaria in consequence of an unfortunate duel. In Munich I made the acquaintance of a young lady belonging to a noble family. I eloped with her and brought her to Venice, where we were married. I have now been twenty years in Venice. I have six children, and everybody knows me. About a week ago I sent my servant to the post office for my letters, but they were refused him because he had not any money to pay the postage. I went myself, but the clerk would not deliver me my letters, although I assured him that I would pay for them the next time. This made me angry, and I called upon the Baron de Taxis, the postmaster, and complained of the clerk, but he answered very rudely that the clerk had simply obeyed his orders, and that my letters would only be delivered on payment of the postage. I felt very indignant, but as I was in his house I controlled my anger, went home and wrote a note to him, asking him to give me satisfaction for his rudeness, telling him that I would never go out without my sword, and that I would force him to fight whenever and wherever I should meet him. I never came across him, but yesterday I was accosted by the secretary of the inquisitors, who told me that I must forget the baron's rude conduct, and go under the guidance of an officer whom he pointed out to me, to imprison myself for a week in this fortress. I shall thus have the pleasure of spending that time with you. I told him that I had been free for the last twenty-four hours, but that to show my gratitude for his friendly confidence I would feel honored if he would allow me to keep him company. As I had already engaged my Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Harris. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 1, Childhood, Chapter 7, Part 2 In the afternoon I happened to be with him on the tower of the fort, and pointed out a gondola advancing towards the lower gate. He took his spy-glass and told me that it was his wife and daughter coming to see him. We went to meet the ladies, one of whom might once have been worth the trouble of an elopement, the other, a young person between fourteen and sixteen, struck me as a beauty of a new style. Her hair was of a beautiful light auburn, her eyes were blue and very fine, her nose a Roman, and her pretty mouth, half open and laughing, exposed a set of teeth as white as her complexion, although a beautiful rosy tint somewhat veiled the whiteness of the last. Her figure was so slight that it seemed out of nature, but her perfectly formed breast appeared an altar on which the god of love would have delighted to breathe the sweetest incense. This splendid chest was, however, not yet well furnished, but in my imagination I gave her all the embalm point which might have been desired, and I was so pleased that I could not take my looks from her. I met her eyes, and her laughing countenance seemed to say to me, Only wait for two years, at the utmost, and all that your imagination is now creating will then exist in reality. She was elegantly dressed in the prevalent fashion, with large hoops, and, like the daughters of the nobility who have not yet attained the age of puberty, although the young countess was marriageable. I had never dared to stare so openly at the bosom of a young lady of quality, but I thought there was no harm in fixing my eyes on a spot where there was nothing yet but in expectation. The Count, after having exchanged a few words in German with his wife, presented me in the most flattering manner, and I was received with great politeness. 
The major joined us, deeming it his duty to escort the countess all over the fortress, and I improved the excellent opportunity thrown in my way by the inferiority of my position. I offered my arm to the young lady, and the count left us to go to his room. I was still an adept in the old Venetian fashion of attending upon ladies, and the young countess thought me rather awkward, though I believed myself very fashionable when I placed my hand under her arm, but she drew it back in high merriment. Her mother turned round to inquire what she was laughing at, and I was terribly confused when I heard her answer that I had tickled her. "'This is the way to offer your arm to a lady,' she said, and she passed her hand through my arm, which I rounded in the most clumsy manner, feeling it a very difficult task to resume a dignified countenance. Thinking me a novice of the most innocent species, she very likely determined to make sport of me. She began by remarking that by rounding my arm as I had done, I placed it too far from her waist, and that I was consequently out of drawing. I told her I did not know how to draw, and inquired whether it was one of her accomplishments. "'I am learning,' she answered, "'and when you call upon us I will show you Adam and Eve, after the Chevalier Libery. I have made a copy which has been found very fine by some professors, although they did not know it was my work.' "'Why did you not tell them?' "'Because those two figures are too naked. "'I am not curious to see your Adam, "'but I will look at your Eve with pleasure "'and keep your secret.' "'This answer made her laugh again, "'and again her mother turned round. "'I put on the look of a simpleton, "'for, seeing the advantage I could derive "'from her opinion of me, "'I had formed my plan "'at the very moment she tried to teach me "'how to offer my arm to a lady.' She was so convinced of my simplicity that she ventured to say that she considered her Adam by far more beautiful than her Eve, because in her drawing of the man she had omitted nothing, every muscle being visible, while there was none conspicuous in Eve. It is, she added, a figure with nothing in it. Yet it is the one which I shall like best. "'No, believe me, Adam will please you most.' "'This conversation had greatly excited me. "'I had on a pair of linen breeches, the weather being very warm. "'I was afraid of the Major and the Countess, "'who were a few yards in front of us, turning round. "'I was on thorns. "'To make matters worse, the young lady stumbled. "'One of her shoes slipped off, "'and presenting me her pretty foot, "'she asked me to put the shoe right.' I knelt on the ground, and, very likely without thinking, she lifted up her skirt. She had very wide hoops and no petticoat. What I saw was enough to strike me dead on the spot. When I rose, she asked if anything was the matter with me. A moment after, coming out of one of the casemates, her headdress got slightly out of order, and she begged that I would remedy the accident. But, having to bend her head down, the state in which I was could no longer remain a secret for her. In order to avoid greater confusion to both of us, she inquired who had made my watch ribbon. I told her it was a present for my sister, and she desired to examine it. But when I answered her that it was fastened to the fob pocket, and found that she disbelieved me, I added that she could see for herself. She put her hand to it, and a natural but involuntary excitement caused me to be very indiscreet. She must have felt vexed, for she saw that she had made a mistake in her estimate of my character. She became more timid, she would not laugh any more, and we joined her mother and the major, who was showing her, in a sentry-box, the body of Marshal de Schulenburg, which had been deposited there until the mausoleum erected for him was completed. As for myself, I felt deeply ashamed. I thought myself the first man who had alarmed her innocence, and I felt ready to do anything to atone for the insult. 
Such was my delicacy of feeling in those days. I used to credit people with exalted sentiments, which often existed only in my imagination. I must confess that time has entirely destroyed that delicacy. Yet I do not believe myself worse than other men, my equals in age and in experience. We returned to the Count's apartment, and the day passed off rather gloomily. Towards evening the ladies went away, but the Countess gave me a pressing invitation to call upon them in Venice. The young lady, whom I thought I had insulted, had made such a deep impression upon me that the seven following days seemed very long. Yet I was impatient to see her again, only that I might entreat her forgiveness, and convince her of my repentance. The following day the Count was visited by his son. He was plain-featured, but a thorough gentleman, and modest withal. Twenty-five years afterwards I met him in Spain, a cadet in the King's bodyguard. He had served as a private twenty years before obtaining this poor promotion. The reader will hear of him in good time. I will only mention here that when I met him in Spain he stood me out that I had never known him. His self-love prompted this very contemptible lie. Early on the eighth day the Count left the fortress, and I took my departure the same evening, having made an appointment at a coffee-house in St. Mark's Square with the Major, who was to accompany me to M. Grimani's house. I took leave of his wife, whose memory will always be dear to me, and she said, I thank you for your skill in proving your alibi, but you have also to thank me for having understood you so well. My husband never heard anything about it until it was all over. As soon as I reached Venice, I went to pay a visit to Madame Orio, where I was made welcome. I remained to supper, and my two charming sweethearts, who were praying for the death of the bishop, gave me the most delightful hospitality for the night. At noon the next day I met the Major according to our appointment, and we called upon the Abbe Grimani. He received me with the air of a guilty man begging for mercy, and I was astounded at his stupidity when he entreated me to forgive Rosetta and his companion. He told me that the bishop was expected very soon, and that he had ordered a room to be ready for me, and that I could take my meals with him. Then he introduced me to M. Valavero, a man of talent, who had just left the Ministry of War, his term of office having lasted the usual six months. I paid my duty to him, and we kept up a kind of desultory conversation until the departure of the Major. When he had left us, M. Valavero entreated me to confess that I had been the guilty party in the attack upon Rosetta. I candidly told him that the thrashing had been my handiwork, and I gave him all the particulars, which amused him immensely. He remarked that, as I had perpetrated the affair before midnight, the fools had made a mistake in their accusation, but that, after all, the mistake had not materially helped me in proving the alibi, because my sprained ankle, which everybody had supposed a real accident, would of itself have been sufficient. But I trust that my kind reader has not forgotten that I had a very heavy weight upon my conscience, of which I longed to get rid. I had to see the goddess of my fancy, to obtain my pardon or die at her feet. I found the house without difficulty. The Count was not at home. The Countess received me very kindly, but her appearance caused me so great a surprise that I did not know what to say to her. I had fancied that I was going to visit an angel, that I would find her in a lovely paradise, and I found myself in a large sitting-room furnished with four rickety chairs and a dirty old table. There was hardly any light in the room because the shutters were nearly closed. It might have been a precaution against the heat, but I judged that it was more probably for the purpose of concealing the windows, the glass of which was all broken. 
but this visible darkness did not prevent me from remarking that the countess was wrapped up in an old tattered gown, and that her chemise did not shine by its cleanliness. Seeing that I was ill at ease, she left the room, saying that she would send her daughter, who, a few minutes afterwards, came in with an easy and noble appearance, and told me that she had expected me with great impatience, but that I had surprised her at a time at which she was not in the habit of receiving any visits. I did not know what to answer, for she did not seem to me to be the same person. Her miserable dishabille made her look almost ugly, and I wondered at the impression she had produced upon me at the fortress. She saw my surprise, and partly guessed my thoughts, for she put on a look, not of vexation, but of sorrow which called forth all my pity. If she had been a philosopher, she might have rightly despised me as a man whose sympathy was enlisted only by her fine dress, her nobility, or her apparent wealth. But she endeavored to bring me round by her sincerity. She felt that if she could call a little sentiment into play, it would certainly plead in her favor. I see that you are astonished, Reverend Sir, and I know the reason of your surprise. You expected to see great splendor here, and you find only misery. The government allows my father but a small salary, and there are nine of us. As we must attend church on Sundays and holidays, in a style proper to our condition, we are often compelled to go without our dinner in order to get out of pledge the clothes which urgent need to often obliges us to part with, and which we pledge anew on the following day. If we did not attend Mass, the curate would strike our names off the list of those who share the alms of the confraternity of the poor, and those alms alone keep us afloat. What a sad tale! She had guessed rightly, I was touched, but rather with shame than true emotion. I was not rich myself, and, as I was no longer in love, I only heaved a deep sigh, and remained as cold as ice. Nevertheless, her position was painful, and I answered politely, speaking with kindness and assuring her of my sympathy. "'Were I wealthy,' I said, "'I would soon show you that your tale of woe is not fallen on unfeeling ears.' But I am poor, and being at the eve of my departure from Venice, even my friendship would be useless to you. Then, after some desultory talk, I expressed a hope that her beauty would yet win happiness for her. She seemed to consider for a few minutes, and said, That may happen some day, provided that the man who feels the power of my charms understands that they can be bestowed only with my heart and is willing to render me the justice I deserve. I am only looking for a lawful marriage, without dreaming of rank or fortune. I no longer believe in the first, and I know how to live without the second, for I have been accustomed to poverty, and even to abject need, but you cannot realize that. Come and see my drawings. You are very good, mademoiselle. Alas, I was not thinking of her drawings, and I could no longer feel interested in her Eve, but I followed her. We came to a chamber in which I saw a table, a chair, a small toilet glass, and a bed with the straw palias turned over, very likely for the purpose of allowing the looker-on to suppose that there were sheets underneath. But I was particularly disgusted by a certain smell— the cause of which was recent. I was thunderstruck, and if I had been still in love, this antidote would have been sufficiently powerful to cure me instantly. I wished for nothing but to make my escape, never to return, and I regretted that I could not throw on the table a handful of ducats, which I should have considered the price of my ransom. The poor girl showed me her drawings. They were fine, and I praised them, without alluding particularly to Eve, and without venturing a joke upon Adam. I asked her, for the sake of saying something, why she did not try to render her talent remunerative by learning pastel drawing. 
"'I wish I could,' she answered. "'But the box of chalks alone cost two sequins.' "'Will you forgive me if I am bold enough to offer you six? "'Alas, I accept them gratefully, "'and to be indebted to you for such a service makes me truly happy.' Unable to keep back her tears, she turned her head round to conceal them from me, and I took that opportunity of laying the money on the table, and out of politeness, wishing to spare her every unnecessary humiliation, I saluted her lips with a kiss, which she was at liberty to consider a loving one, as I wanted her to ascribe my reserve to the respect I felt for her. I then left her with a promise to call another day to see her father. I never kept my promise. The reader will see how I met her again after ten years. How many thoughts crowded upon my mind as I left that house! What a lesson! I compared reality with the imagination, and I had to give the preference to the last, as reality is always dependent on it. I then began to foresee a truth which has been clearly proved to me in my after-life, namely that love is only a feeling of curiosity, more or less intense, grafted upon the inclination placed in us by nature that the species may be preserved. And truly, woman is like a book, which, good or bad, must at first please us by the frontispiece. If this is not interesting, we do not feel any wish to read the book, and our wish is in direct proportion to the interest we feel. The frontispiece of woman runs from top to bottom like that of a book, and her feet, which are most important to every man who shares my taste, offer the same interest as the addition of the work. If it is true that most amateurs bestow little or no attention upon the feet of a woman, it is likewise a fact that most readers care little or nothing whether a book is of the first edition or the tenth. At all events, women are quite right to take the greatest care of their face, of their dress, of their general appearance, for it is only by that part of the frontispiece that they can call forth a wish to read them in those men who have not been endowed by nature with the privilege of blindness. And just in the same manner that men, who have read a great many books, are certain to feel at last a desire for perusing new works, even if they are bad, a man who has known many women, and all handsome women, feels at last a curiosity for ugly specimens when he meets with entirely new ones. It is all very well for his eye to discover the paint which conceals the reality, but his passion has become a vice, and suggests some argument in favor of the lying frontispiece. It is possible, at least he thinks so, that the work may prove better than the title page, and the reality more acceptable than the paint which hides it. He then tries to peruse the book, but the leaves have not been opened, he meets with some resistance. The living book must be read according to established rules, and the bookworm falls a victim to a coquetry, the monster which persecutes all those who make a business of love. As for thee, intelligent man, who hast read the few preceding lines, let me tell thee that, if they do not assist in opening thy eyes, thou art lost, I mean that thou art certain of being a victim to the fair sex, to the very last moment of thy life. If my candor does not displease thee, accept my congratulations. In the evening I called upon Madame Oreo, as I wanted to inform her charming nieces that, being an inmate of Grimani's house, I could not sleep out for the first night. I found there the faithful Rosa, who told me that the affair of the alibi was in every mouth, and that, as such celebrity was evidently caused by a very decided belief in the untruth of the alibi itself, I ought to fear a retaliation of the same sort on the part of Rosetta, and to keep on my guard, particularly at night. 
I felt all the importance of this advice, and I took care never to go out in the evening otherwise than in a gondola, or accompanied by some friends. Madame Manzoni told me that I was acting wisely, because, although the judges could not do otherwise than acquit me, everybody knew the real truth of the matter, and Rosetta could not fail to be my deadly foe. Three or four days afterwards M. Grimani announced the arrival of the bishop, who had put up at the convent of his order at St. Francois de Paul. He presented me himself to the prelate as a jewel highly prized by himself, and as if he had been the only person worthy of descanting upon its beauty. I saw a fine monk wearing his pectoral cross, he would have reminded me of Father Mancia if he had not looked stouter and less reserved. He was about thirty-four, and had been made a bishop by the grace of God, the Holy See, and my mother. After pronouncing over me a blessing, which I received kneeling, and giving me his hand to kiss, he embraced me warmly, calling me his dear son in the Latin language, in which he continued to address me. I thought that, being a Calabrian, he might feel ashamed of his Italian, but he undeceived me by speaking in, in that language to M. Grimani. He told me that, as he could not take me with him from Venice, I should have to proceed to Rome, where Grimani would take care to send me, and that I would procure his address at Ancona from one of his friends, called Lazari, a Minim monk would likewise supply me with the means of continuing my journey. When we meet in Rome, he added, we can go together to Martorano by way of Naples. Call upon me to-morrow morning and have your breakfast with me. I intend to leave the day after. As we were on our way back to his house, M. Grimani treated me to a long lecture on morals, which nearly caused me to burst into loud laughter. Amongst other things, he informed me that I ought not to study too hard, because the air in Calabria was very heavy, and I might become consumptive from too close application to my books. The next morning at daybreak I went to the bishop. After saying his mass, we took some chocolate, and for three hours he laid me under examination. I saw clearly that he was not pleased with me, but I was well enough pleased with him. He seemed to me a worthy man, and, as he was to lead me along the great highway of the church, I felt attracted towards him, for, at the time, although I entertained a good opinion of my personal appearance, I had no confidence whatever in my talents. After the departure of the good bishop, M. Grimani gave me a letter left by him, which I was to deliver to Father Lazari at the convent of the Minims in Ancona. M. Grimani informed me that he would send me to that city with the ambassador from Venice, who was on the point of sailing. I had, therefore, to keep myself in readiness, and, as I was anxious to be out of his hands, I approved all his arrangements." As soon as I had notice of the day on which the suite of the ambassador would embark, I went to pay my last farewell to all my acquaintances. I left my brother, Francois, in the school of M. Joly, a celebrated decorative painter. As the payata in which I was to sail would not leave before daybreak, I spent the short night in the arms of the two sisters, who, this time, entertained no hope of ever seeing me again. On my side I could not foresee what would happen, for I was abandoning myself to fate, and I thought it would be useless to think of the future. The night was therefore spent between joy and sadness, between pleasures and tears. As I bade them adieu, I returned the key which had opened so often for me the road to happiness." This, my first love affair, did not give me any experience of the world, for our intercourse was always a happy one, and was never disturbed by any quarrel or stained by any interested motive. We often felt, all three of us, 
as if we must raise our souls towards the eternal providence of God, to thank Him for having, by His particular protection, kept from us all the accidents which might have disturbed the sweet peace we were enjoying. I left in the hands of Madame Manzoni all my papers and all the forbidden books I possessed. The good woman, who was twenty years older than I, and who, believing in an immutable destiny, took pleasure in turning the leaves of the great book of fate, told me that she was certain of restoring to me all I left with her before the end of the following year at the latest. Her prediction caused me both surprise and pleasure, and feeling deep reverence for her, I thought myself bound to assist the realization of her foresight. After all, if she predicted the future, it was not through superstition or in consequence of some vain foreboding which reason must condemn, but through her knowledge of the world and of the nature of the person she was addressing. She used to laugh because she never made a mistake. I embarked from St. Mark's Landing. M. Grimani had given me ten sequins, which he thought would keep me during my stay in the lazaretto of Ancona for the necessary quarantine, after which it was not to be supposed that I could want any money. I shared Grimani's certainty on the subject, and with my natural thoughtlessness I cared nothing about it. Yet I must say that, unknown to everybody, I had in my purse forty bright sequins, which powerfully contributed to increase my cheerfulness, and I left Venice full of Chapter 8 of the Memoirs of Jack Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 2. Cleric in Naples. Chapter 8. The retinue of the ambassador, which was styled Grand, appeared to me very small. It was composed of a Milanese steward named Carcinelli, of a priest who fulfilled the duties of secretary because he could not write, of an old woman acting as housekeeper, of a man cook with his ugly wife, and eight or ten servants. We reached Kyoto about noon. Immediately after landing, I politely asked the steward where I should put up, and his answer was, Wherever you please, provided you let this man know where it is, so that he can give you notice when the peota is ready to sell. My duty, he added, is to leave you at the lazaretto of Ancona, free of expense from the moment we leave this place. Until then, enjoy yourself as well you can. The man to whom I was to give my address was the captain of the Piota. I asked him to recommend me a lodging. You may come to my house, he said, if you have no objection to share a large bed with the cook, whose wife remains on board. Unable to devise any better plan, I accepted the offer, and the sailor, carrying my trunk, accompanied me to the dwelling of the honest captain. My trunk had to be placed under the bed, which filled up the room. I was amused at this, for I was not in a position to be over-fastidious, and after partaking of some dinner at the inn, I went about the town. Piozza is a peninsula, a seaport belonging to Venice, with a population of ten thousand inhabitants, seamen, fishermen, merchants, lawyers, and government clerks. I entered a coffee-room, and I had scarcely taken a seat when a young doctor at law, with whom I had studied in Padua, 
came up to me and introduced me to a druggist whose shop was nearby, saying that his house was the rendezvous of all the literary men of the place. A few minutes afterwards, a tall Jacobin friar, blind of one eye, called Corsini, whom I had known in Venice, came in and paid me many compliments. He told me that I had arrived just in time to go to a picnic, got up by the macaronic academicians, for the next day, after a sitting of the academy in which every member was to recite something of his composition. He invited me to join them, and to gratify the meeting with the delivery of one of my productions. I accepted the invitation, and, after the reading of ten stanzas, which I had written for the occasion, I was unanimously elected a member. My success at the picnic was still greater, for I disposed of such a quantity of macaroni that I was found worthy of the title of Prince of the Academy. The young doctor, himself one of the academicians, introduced me to his family. His parents, who were in easy circumstances, received me very kindly. One of his sisters was very amiable, but the other, a professed nun, appeared to me a prodigy of beauty. I might have enjoyed myself in a very agreeable way in the midst of that charming family during my stay in Kyoto, but I suppose that it was my destiny to meet in that place with nothing but sorrows. The young doctor forewarned me that the monk Corsini was a very worthless fellow, despised by everybody, and advised me to avoid him. I thanked him for the information, but my thoughtlessness prevented me from profiting by it. Of a very easy disposition, and too giddy to fear any snares, I was foolish enough to believe that the monk would, on the contrary, be the very man to throw plenty of amusement in my way. On the third day, the worthless dog took me to a house of ill fame, where I might have gone without his introduction, and in order to shew my mettle, I obliged a low creature whose ugliness ought to have been a sufficient antidote against any fleshy desire. On leaving the place, he brought me for supper to an inn, where we met four scoundrels of his own stamp. After supper, one of them began a bank of faro, and I was invited to join in the game. I gave way to that feeling of false pride which so often causes the ruin of young men, and after losing four sequins, I expressed the wish to retire. But my honest friend, the Jacobin, contrived to make me risk four more sequins in partnership with him. He held the bank, and it was broken. I did not wish to play any more, but Corsini, feigning to pity me and to feel great sorrow at being the cause of my loss, induced me to try myself a bank of twenty-five sequins. My bank was likewise broken. The hope of winning back my money made me keep up the game, and I lost everything I had. Deeply grieved, I went away and laid myself down near the cook, who woke up and said I was a libertine. "'You're right,' was all I could answer. I was worn out with fatigue and sorrow, and I slept soundly. My vile tormentor, the monk, woke me at noon, and informed me, with a triumphant joy, that a very rich young man had been invited by his friends to supper, that he would be sure to play and lose, and that it would be a good opportunity for me to retrieve my losses. I have lost all my money. Lend me twenty sequins. When I lend the money, I am sure to lose. You may call it superstitious, but I have tried it too often. Try to find money somewhere else and come. Farewell. I felt ashamed to confess my position to my friend, and sending for a money lender, I emptied my trunk before him. We made an inventory of my clothes, and the honest broker gave me thirty sequins, with the understanding that if I did not redeem them within three days, all my things 
would become his property. I am bound to call him an honest man, for he advised me to keep three shirts, a few pair of stockings, and a few handkerchiefs. I was disposed to let him take everything, having a presentiment that I would win back all I had lost, a very common error. A few years later, I took my revenge by writing a diatribe against presentiments. I am of opinion that the only foreboding in which man can have of any sort of faith is the one which forebodes evil, because it comes from the mind, while a presentiment of happiness has its origin in the heart, and the heart is a fool worthy of reckoning foolishly upon fickle fortune. I did not lose any time in joining the honest company, which was alarmed at the thought of not seeing me. Supper went off without any allusion to gambling, but my admirable qualities were highly praised, and it was decided that a brilliant fortune awaited me in Rome. After supper there was no talk of play, but giving way to my evil genius, I loudly asked for my revenge. I was told that if I would take the bank, every one would punt. I took the bank, lost every sequin I had, and retired, begging the monk to pay what I owed to the landlord, which he promised to do. I was in despair, and to crown my misery, I found out, as I was going home, that I had met the day before with another living specimen of the Greek woman, less beautiful but as perfidious. I went to bed stunned by my grief, and I believe that I must have fainted into a heavy sleep, which lasted eleven hours. My awaking was that of a miserable being, hating the light of heaven, of which he felt himself unworthy, and I closed my eyes again, trying to sleep for a little while longer. I dreaded to rouse myself up entirely, knowing that I would then have to take some decision. But I never once thought of returning to Venice, which would have been the very best thing to do, and I would have destroyed myself rather than confide my sad position to the young doctor. I was weary of my existence, and I entertained vaguely some hope of starving where I was, without leaving my bed. It is certain that I should not have got up if Mr. Alban, the master of the Peota, had not roused me by calling upon me and informing me that the boat was ready to sail. The man who is delivered from great perplexity, no matter by what means, feels himself relieved. It seemed to me that Captain Alban had come to point out the only thing I could possibly do. I dressed myself in haste, and tying all my worldly possessions in a handkerchief, I went on board. Soon afterwards we left the shore, and in the morning we cast anchor in Orsara, a seaport of Istria. We all landed to visit the city, which would more properly be called a village. It belongs to the Pope, the Republic of Venice having abandoned it to the Holy See. A young monk of the Order of the Recollects, who called himself Friar Stefano of Belun, and had obtained a free passage from the devout Captain Alban, joined me as we landed and inquired whether I felt sick. Reverend Father, I am unhappy. You will forget all your sorrow if you will come and dine with me at the house of one of our devout friends. I had not broken my fast for thirty-six hours, and having suffered much from sea-sickness during the night, my stomach was quite empty. My erratic inconvenience made me very uncomfortable. My mind felt deeply the consciousness of my degradation, and I did not possess a groat. I was in such a miserable state that I had no strength to accept or to refuse anything. I was thoroughly torpid, and I followed the monk mechanically. He presented me to a lady, saying that he was accompanying me to Rome, where I intend to become a Franciscan. 
This untruth disgusted me, and under any other circumstance I would not have let it pass without protest. But in my actual position it struck me as rather comical. The good lady gave us a good dinner of fish cooked in oil, which in Orsara is delicious, and we drank some exquisite rufosco. During our meal, a priest happened to drop in, and after a short conversation, he told me that I ought not pass the night on board the tartan, and pressed me to accept a bed in his house and a good dinner for the next day, in case the wind should not allow us to sail. I accepted without hesitation. I offered my most sincere thanks to the good old lady, and the priest took me all over the town. In the evening, he brought me to his house, where we partook of an excellent supper prepared by his housekeeper, who sat down to the table with us, and with whom I was much pleased. The refusco, still better than that which I had drunk at dinner, scattered all my misery to the wind, and I conversed gaily with the priest. He offered to read to me a poem of his own composition, but feeling that my eyes would not keep open, I begged he would excuse me and postpone the reading until the following day. I went to bed, and in the morning, after ten hours of the most profound sleep, the housekeeper, who had been watching for my awakening, brought me some coffee. I thought her a charming woman, but alas, I was not in a fit state to prove to her the high estimation in which I held her beauty. Entertaining feelings of gratitude for my kind host, and disposed to listen attentively to his poem, I dismissed all sadness, and I paid his poetry such compliments that he was delighted, and, finding me much more talented than he had judged me to be at first, he insisted upon treating me to a reading of his idols, and I had to swallow them, bearing the inflection cheerfully. The day passed off very agreeably. The housekeeper surrounded me with the kindest attentions, approved that she was smitten with me, and giving way to that pleasing idea, I felt that, by a very natural system of reciprocity, she had made my conquest. The good priest thought that the day had passed like lightning, thanks to all the beauties that I had discovered in his poetry, which, to speak the truth, was below mediocrity. But time seemed to me to drag along very slowly, because the friendly glances of the housekeeper made me long for bedtime, in spite of the miserable condition in which I felt myself morally and physically. But such was my nature. I abandoned myself to joy and happiness, when, had I been more reasonable, I ought to have sunk under my grief and sadness. But the golden time came at last. I found the pretty housekeeper full of compliance, but only up to a certain point. And as she offered some resistance, when I shewed myself disposed to pay a full homage to her charms, I quietly gave up the undertaking, very well pleased for both of us that it had not been carried any further, and I sought my couch in peace. But I had not seen the end of the adventure, for the next morning, when she brought my coffee, her pretty, enticing manners allured me to bestow a few loving caresses upon her, and if she did not abandon herself entirely, it was only, as she said, because she was afraid of some surprise. The day passed off very pleasantly with the good priest, and at night, the housekeeper no longer fearing detection, and I having on my side taken every precaution necessary in the state in which I was, we passed two most delicious hours. I left Orsara the next morning. Friar Stefano amused me all day with his talk, which plainly showed me his ignorance combined with knavery under the veil of simplicity. He made me look at the alms he had received in Orsara, bread, wine, cheese, sausages, preserves, 
and chocolate. Every nook and cranny of his holy garment was full of provisions. "'Have you received money likewise?' I inquired. "'God forbid! In the first place, our glorious order does not permit me to touch money. And, in the second place, were I to be foolish enough to receive any when I am begging, people would think themselves quit of me with one or two sous, whilst they dive me ten times as much in eatables. Believe me, St. Francis was a very judicious man. I bethought myself that what this monk called wealth would be poverty to me. He offered to share with me, and seemed very proud at my consenting, to honour him so far. The tartan touched at the harbour of Pola, called Beruda, and we landed. After a walk up the hill of nearly a quarter of an hour, we entered the city, and I devoted a couple of hours to visiting the Roman antiquities, which are numerous, the town having been the metropolis of the empire. Yet I saw no other trace of grand buildings except the ruins of the arena. We returned to Veruda, and went again to sea. On the following day we sighted Ancona, but, the wind being against us, we were compelled to tack about, and we did not reach the port till the second day. The harbour of Ancona, although considered one of the great works of Trajan, would be very unsafe if it were not for a causeway which has cost a great deal of money, and which makes it somewhat better. I observed a fact worthy of notice, namely, that in the Adriatic the northern coast has many harbours, while the opposite coast can only boast one or two. It is evident that the sea is retiring by degrees towards the east, and what in three or four more centuries Venice must be joined to the land. We landed at the old lazaretto, where we received the pleasant information that we would go through a quarantine of twenty-eight days, because Venice had admitted, after a quarantine of three months, that the crew of two ships from Messina, where the plague had recently been raging. I requested a room for myself and for Brother Stefano, who thanked me very heartily. I hired from a Jew a bed, a table, and a few chairs, promising to pay for the hire at the expiration of our quarantine. The monk would have nothing but straw. If he had guessed that without him I might have starved, he would most likely not have felt so much vanity at sharing my room. A sailor, expecting to find in me a generous customer, came to inquire where my trunk was, and hearing from me that I did not know, he, as well as Captain Alban, went to a great deal of trouble to find it, and I could hardly keep down my merriment when the captain called, begging to be excused for having left it behind, and assuring me that he would take care to forward it to me in less than three weeks. The friar who had to remain with me four weeks, expected to live at my expense, while, on the contrary, he had been sent by Providence to keep me. He had provisions enough for one week, but it was necessary to think of the future. After supper, I drew a most affecting picture of my position, showing that I would be in need of everything until my arrival at Rome. Where I was going, I said, to fill the post of secretary of memorials, and my astonishment may be imagined when I saw the blockhead delighted at the recital of my misfortunes. I undertake to take care of you until we reach Rome. Only tell me whether you can write. What a question! Are you joking? Why should I? Look at me. I cannot write anything but my name. True, I can write it with either hand, and what else do I want to know? You astonish me greatly, for I thought you were a priest. I am a monk. I say the Mass, and, 
as a matter of course, I must know how to read. St. Francis, whose unworthy son I am, could not read, and that is the reason why he never said a mass. But as you can write, you will tomorrow pen a letter in my name to the person whose name I will give you, and I warrant you we shall have enough sent here to live like fighting cocks all through our quarantine. The next day he made me write eight letters, because, in the oral tradition of his order, it is said that when a monk has knocked at seven doors, and has met with a refusal at every one of them, he must apply to the eight with perfect confidence, because there he is certain of receiving alms. As he had already performed the pilgrimage to Rome, he knew every person in Ancona devoted to the cult of St. Francis, and was acquainted with the superiors of all the rich convents. I had to write to every person he named, and to set down all the lies he dictated to me. He likewise made me sign the letters for him, saying that, if he signed himself, his correspondents would see that the letters had not been written by him, which would injure him, for, he added, in this age of corruption, people will esteem only learned men. He compelled me to fill the letters with Latin passages and quotations, even those addressed to ladies, and I remonstrated in vain, for when I raised any objection, he threatened to leave me without anything to eat. I made up my mind to do exactly as he wished. He desired me to write to the superior of the Jesuits that he would not apply to the Capuchins, because they were no better than atheists, and that that was the reason of the great dislike of St. Francis for them. It was in vain that I reminded him of the fact that, in the time of St. Francis, there were neither Capuchins nor Recollets. His answer was that I had proved myself an ignoramus. I firmly believed that he would be thought a madman, and that we should not receive anything. But I was mistaken, for such a quantity of provisions came pouring in that I was amazed. Wine was sent from three or four different quarters, more than enough for us during all our stay, and yet I drank nothing but water. So great was my wish to recover my health. As for eatables, enough was sent in every day for six persons. We gave all our surplus to our keeper, who had a large family, but the monk felt no gratitude for the kind souls who bestowed their charity upon him, and all his thanks were reserved for St. Francis. He undertook to have my men washed by the keeper. I would not have dared to give it myself. And he said that he had nothing to fear, as everybody was well aware that the monks of his order never wear any kind of linen. I kept myself in bed nearly all day, and thus avoided showing myself to visitors. The persons who did not come wrote letters full of incongruities, cleverly worded, which I took good care not to point out to him. It was with great difficulty that I tried to persuade him that those letters did not require an answer. A fortnight of repose and severe diet brought me round towards complete recovery, and I began to walk in the yard of the lazaretto from morning till night. But the arrival of a Turk from Thessalonia with his family compelled me to suspend my walks, the ground floor having been given to him. The only pleasure left me was to spend my time on the balcony overlooking the yard. I soon saw a Greek slave, a girl of dazzling beauty, for whom I felt the deepest interest. She was in the habit of spending the whole day sitting near the door with a book or some embroidery in her hand. If she happened to raise her eyes and to meet mine, she modestly bent her head down, and sometimes she rose and went in slowly, as if she meant to say, I did not know that somebody was looking at me. Her figure was tall and slender. Her features proclaimed her to be very young. She had a very fair complexion, 
with beautiful black hair and eyes. She wore the Greek costume, which gave her person a certain air of very exciting voluptuousness. I was perfectly idle, and with the temperament which nature and habit had given me, was it likely that I could feast my eyes constantly upon such a charming object without falling desperately in love? I have heard her conversing in lingua franca with her master, a fine old man, who, like her, felt very weary of the quarantine, and used to come out but seldom, smoking his pipe, and remaining in the yard only a short time. I felt a great temptation to address a few words to the beautiful girl, but I was afraid she might run away and never come out again. However, unable to control myself any longer, I determined to write to her. I had no difficulty in conveying the letter, as I had only to let it fall from my balcony. But she might have refused to pick it up, and this is the plan I adopted in order not to risk any unpleasant result. Availing myself of a moment during which she was alone in the yard, I dropped from my balcony a small piece of paper folded like a letter, but had taken care not to write anything on it, and held the true letter in my hand. As soon as I saw her stooping down to pick up the first, I quickly let the second drop at her feet, and she put both into her pocket. A few minutes afterwards she left the yard. My letter was somewhat to this effect. Beautiful angel from the east, I worship you. I will remain all night on this balcony in the hope that you will come to me for a quarter of an hour and listen to my voice through the hole under my feet. We can speak softly, and in order to hear me, you can climb up to the top of the bale of goods which lies beneath the same hole. I begged from my keeper not to lock me in, as he did every night, and he consented on condition that he would watch me, for if I had jumped down in the yard his life might have been the penalty, and he promised not to disturb me on the balcony. At midnight, as I was beginning to give her up, she came forward. Then I laid myself flat on the floor of the balcony, and I placed my head against the hole, about six inches square. I saw her jump on the bell, and her hand reach within a foot from the balcony. She was compelled to steady herself with one hand against the wall for fear of falling, and in that position we talked of love, of ardent desires, of obstacles, of impossibilities, and of cunning artifices. I told her the reason for which I dared not jump down in the yard, and she observed that, even without that reason, it would bring ruin upon us, as it would be impossible to come up again, and that besides, God alone knew what her master would do if he were to find us together. Then, promising to visit me this way every night, she passed her hand through the hole. Alas, I could not leave off kissing it, for I thought that I had never in my life touched so soft, so delicate a hand. But what bliss when she begged for mine! I quickly thrust my arm through the hole, so that she could fasten her lips to the bend of the elbow. How many sweet liberties my hands ventured to take! But we were at last compelled by prudence to separate, and when I returned to my room, I saw with great pleasure that the keeper was fast asleep. Although I was delighted at having obtained every favor I could possibly wish for in the uncomfortable position we had been in, I raked my brain to contrive the means of securing more complete enjoyment for the following night. But I found during the afternoon that the feminine cunning of my beautiful Greek was more fertile than mine. Being alone in the yard with her master, she had a few words to him in Turkish, to which he seemed to give his approval, and soon after a servant, assisted by the keeper, brought under the balcony a large basket of goods. 
she overlooked the arrangement, and in order to secure the basket better, she made the servant place a bale of cotton across two others. Guessing at her purpose, I fairly leaped for joy, for she had found a way of raising herself two feet higher, but I thought that she would then find herself in the most inconvenient position, and that, forced to bend double, she would not be able to resist the fatigue. The hole was not wide enough for her head to pass through, otherwise she might have stood erect and been comfortable. It was necessary, at all events, to guard against that difficulty. The only way was to tear out one of the planks of the floor of the balcony, but it was not an easy undertaking. Yet I decided upon attempting it, regardless of the consequences, and I went to my room to provide myself with a large pair of pincers. Luckily, the keeper was absent, and availing myself of the opportunity, I succeeded in dragging out carefully the four large nails which fastened the plank. Finding that I could lift it at my will, I replaced the pincers and waited for the night with amorous impatience. The darling girl came exactly at midnight, noticing the difficulty she experienced in climbing up, and in getting a footing on the third bale of cotton. I lifted the plank, and, extending my arm as far as I could, I offered her a steady point of support. She stood straight, and found herself agreeably surprised, for she could pass her head and her arms through the hole. We wasted no time in empty compliments. We only congratulated each other upon having both worked for the same purpose. If the night before I had found myself master of her person more than she was of mine, this time the position was entirely reversed. Her hand roamed freely over every part of my body, but I had to stop halfway down hers. She cursed the man who had packed her bell for not having made it half a foot bigger, so as to get nearer to me. Very likely, even that would have not satisfied us, but she would have felt happier. Our pleasures were barren, yet we kept up our enjoyment until the first streak of light. I put back the plank carefully, and I lay down in my bed in great need of recruiting my strength. My dear mistress had informed me that the Turkish Bayram began that very morning, and would last three days, during which it would be impossible for her to see me. The night after Bayram, she did not fail to make her appearance, and, saying that she could not be happy without me, she told me that, as she was a Christian woman, I could buy her, if I waited for her after leaving the lazaretto. I was compelled to tell her that I did not possess the means of doing so, and my confession made her sigh. On the following night, she informed me that her master would sell her for two thousand piastres, that she would give me the amount, and that she was yet a virgin, and that I would be pleased with my bargain. She added that she would give me a casket full of diamonds, one of which was alone worth two thousand piastres, and that the sale of the others would place us beyond the reach of poverty for the remainder of our life. She assured me that her master would not notice the loss of the casket, and that, if he did, he would never think of accusing her. I was in love with that girl, and her proposal made me uncomfortable. But when I woke in the morning, I did not hesitate any longer. She brought the casket in the evening, but I told her that I never could make up my mind to be accessory to a robbery. She was very unhappy, and said that my love was not as deep as her own, but that she could not help Chapter 8, Part B 
of the Memoirs of Jack Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Memoirs of Jack Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Episode 2 Cleric in Naples Chapter 8 Part B This was the last night, probably we should never meet again. The flame of passion consumed us. She proposed that I should lift her up to the balcony through the open space. Where is the lover who would have objected to so attractive a proposal? I rose, and without being a Milo, I placed my hands under her arms. I drew her up towards me, and my desires are on the point of being fulfilled. Suddenly, I felt two hands upon my shoulders, and the voice of the keeper explained, What are you about? I let my precious burden drop. She regains her chamber, and I, giving vent to my rage, throw myself flat on the floor of the balcony, and remain there without a movement, in spite of the shaking of the keeper, whom I was sorely tempted to strangle. At last I rose from the floor, and went to bed without uttering one word, and not even caring to replace the plank. In the morning... The governor informed us that we were free. As I left the lazaretto with a breaking heart, I caught a glimpse of the Greek slave drowned in tears. I agreed to meet Friar Stefano at the exchange, and I took the Jew from whom I had hired the furniture to the convent of the Minims, where I received from Father Lazari ten sequins and the address of the bishop, who, after performing quarantine on the frontiers of Tuscany, had proceeded to Rome, where he would expect me to meet him. I paid the Jew, and made a poor dinner at an inn. As I was leaving it to join the monk, I was so unlucky as to meet Captain Alban, who reproached me bitterly for having led him to believe that my trunk had been left behind. I contrived to appease his anger by telling him all my misfortunes, and I signed a paper in which I declared that I had no claim whatsoever upon him. I then purchased a pair of shoes and an overcoat, and met Stefano, whom I informed of my decision to make a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Loreto. I said I would wait there for him, and that we would afterwards travel together as far as Rome. He answered that he did not wish to go through Loreto, and that I would repent of my contempt for the grace of St. Francis. He did not alter my mind, and I left for Loreto the next day in the enjoyment of perfect health. I reached the holy city, tired almost to death, for it was the first time in my life that I had walked fifteen miles, drinking nothing but water, although the weather was very warm because the dry wine used in that part of the country parched me too much. I must observe that, in spite of my poverty, I did not look like a beggar. As I was entering the city, I saw coming towards me an elderly priest of very respectable appearance, and, as he was evidently taking notice of me, as soon as he drew near, I saluted him, and inquired, where I could find a comfortable inn. I cannot doubt, he said, that a person like you, travelling on foot, must come here from devout motives. Come with me. He turned back. I followed him, and he took me to a fine-looking house. After whispering a few words to a man who appeared to be a steward, he left me, saying very affably, You shall be well attended to. My first impression was that I had been mistaken for some other person, but I said nothing. 
I was led to a suit of three rooms. The chamber was decorated with damask hangings. The bedstead had a canopy, and the table was supplied with all materials necessary for writing. A servant brought me a light dressing gown, and another came in with linen and a large tub full of water, which he placed before me. My shoes and stockings were taken off, and my feet washed. A very decent-looking woman, followed by a servant girl, came in a few minutes later, and curtsying very low, she proceeded to make my bed. At that moment the Angelus bell was heard. Everyone knelt down, and I followed their example. After the prayer, a small table was neatly laid out, and I was asked what sort of wine I wished to drink, and I was provided with newspapers and two silver candlesticks. An hour afterwards I had a delicious fish supper, and before I retired to bed, a servant came to inquire whether I would take chocolate in the morning before or after Mass. As soon as I was in bed, the servant brought me a night lamp with a dial, and I remained alone. Except in France, I have never had such a good bed as I had that night. It would have cured the most chronic insomnia, but I was not laboring under such a disease, and I slept for ten hours. This sort of treatment easily led me to believe that I was not in any kind of hostelry. But where was I? How was I to suppose that I was in a hospital? When I had taken my chocolate, a hairdresser, quite a fashionable, dapper fellow, made his appearance, dying to give vent to his chattering propensities. Guessing that I did not wish to be shaved, he offered to clip my soft down with the scissors saying that I would look younger. Why do you suppose that I want to conceal my age? It is very natural, because, if your lordship did not wish to do so, your lordship would have shaved long ago. Countess Marcolini is here. Does your lordship know her? I must go to her at noon to dress her hair. I did not feel interested in the Countess Marcolini, and seeing it, the gossip changed the subject. Is this your lordship's first visit to this house? It is the finest hospital throughout the Papal States. I quite agree with you, and I shall compliment His Holiness on the establishment. Oh, His Holiness knows all about it. He resided here before he became Pope. If Monsignor Carraffa had not been well acquainted with you, he would not have introduced you here. Such is the use of barbers throughout Europe. But you must not put any questions to them, for, if you do, they are sure to threat you to an impudent mixture of truth and falsehood, and instead of you pumping them, they will worm everything out of you. Thinking that it was my duty to present my respectful compliments to Monsignor Carafa, I desired to be taken to his apartment. He gave me a pleasant welcome, showed me his library, and entrusted me to the care of one of his abbés, a man of parts, who acted as my cicerone everywhere. Twenty years afterwards, this same abbé was of great service to me in Rome, and, if still alive, he is a canon of St. John Lateran. On the following day, I took the communion in the Santa Casa. The third day, was entirely employed in examining the exterior of this truly wonderful sanctuary, and early the next day I resumed my journey, having spent nothing except three paoli for the barber. Halfway to Marserata, I overtook Brother Stefano, walking on at very slow rate. He was delighted to see me again, and told me that he had left Ancona two hours after me, but that he never walked more than three miles a day, being quite satisfied to take two months for a journey which, even on foot, can easily be accomplished in a week. I want, he said, to reach Rome without fatigue and in good health, and in no hurry. And if you feel disposed 
to travel with me, and in the same quiet way, St. Francis will not find it difficult to keep us both during the journey. This lazy fellow was a man about thirty, red-haired, very strong and healthy, a true peasant who had turned himself into a monk only for the sake of living in idle comfort. I answered that, as I was in a hurry to reach Rome, I could not be his travelling companion. "'I undertake to walk six miles instead of three today,' he said, "'if you carry my cloak, which I find very heavy.' The proposal struck me as a rather funny one. I put on his cloak, and he took my greatcoat, but, after the exchange, we cut such a comical figure that every peasant we met laughed at us. His cloak would truly have proved a load for a mule. There were twelve pockets quite full, without taking into account a pocket behind, which he called Il Baticulo, and which contained, alone, twice as much as all the others. Bread, wine, fresh and salt meat, fowls, eggs, cheese, ham, sausages, everything was to be found in those pockets, which contained provisions enough for a fortnight. I told him how well I had been treated in Loretto, and he assured me that I might have asked Monsignor Caraffa to give me letters for all the hospitals on my road to Rome, and that everywhere I would have met with the same reception. The hospitals, he added, are all under the curse of St. Francis, because the mendicant friars are not admitted in them. But we do not mind their gates being shut against us, because they are too far apart from each other. We prefer the homes of the persons attached to our order. These we find everywhere. Why do you not ask hospitality in the convents of your order? I am not so foolish. In the first place, I should not be admitted, because, being a fugitive, I have not the written obedience which must be shown at every convent, and I should even run the risk of being thrown into prison. Your monks are a cursed bad lot. In the second place, I should not be half so comfortable in the commons as I am with our devout benefactors. Why and how are you a fugitive? He answered my question by the narrative of his imprisonment and flight, the whole story being a tissue of absurdities and lies. The fugitive recollet friar was a fool, with something of the wit of Harlequin, and he thought that every man listening to him was a greater fool than himself. Yet, with all his folly, he was not bent in a certain species of cunning. His religious principles were singular. As he did not wish to be taken for a bigoted man, he was scandalous, and for the sake of making people laugh, he would often make use of the most disgusting expressions. He had no taste whatsoever for women, and no inclination towards the pleasures of the flesh, but this was only owing to a deficiency in his natural temperament, and yet he claimed for himself the virtue of continence. On that score, everything appeared to him food for merriment, and when he had drunk rather too much, he would ask questions of such an indecent character that it would bring blushes on everybody's countenance. Yet the brute would only laugh. As we were getting within one hundred yards from the house of the devout friend whom he intended to honor with his visit, he took back his heavy cloak. On entering the house, he gave his blessing to everybody, and every one in the family came to kiss his hand. The mistress of the house requested him to say mass for them, and the compliant monk asked to be taken to the vestry. But when I whispered in his ear, "'Have you forgotten that we have already broken our fast today?' he answered dryly, "'Mind your own business.' I dared not make any further remark, but during the Mass I was indeed surprised, for I saw that he did not understand 
what he was doing. I could not help being amused at his awkwardness, but I had not yet seen the best part of the comedy. As soon as he had somehow or other finished his mass, he went to the confessional, and after hearing in confession every member of the family, he took it into his head to refuse absolution to the daughter of his hostess, a girl of twelve or thirteen, pretty and quite charming. He gave his refusal publicly, scolding her and threatening her with the torments of hell. The poor girl, overwhelmed with shame, left the church crying bitterly, and I, feeling real sympathy for her, could not help saying aloud to Stefano that he was a madman. I ran after the girl to offer her my consolations, but she had disappeared, and could not be induced to join us at dinner. This piece of extravagance on the part of the monk exasperated me to such an extent that I felt a very strong inclination to thrash him. In the presence of all the family, I told him that he was an impostor and the infamous destroyer of the poor child's honor. I challenged him to explain his reasons for refusing to give her absolution. But he closed my lips by answering very coolly that he could not betray the secrets of the confessional. I could eat nothing, and was fully determined to leave the scoundrel. As we left the house, I was compelled to accept Juan Paolo as the price of the mock mass he had said. I had to fulfill the sorry duty of his treasurer. The moment we were on the road, I told him that I was going to part company, because I was afraid of being sent as a felon to the galleys if I continued my journeys with him. He exchanged high words. I called him an ignorant scoundrel. He styled me a beggar. I struck him a violent slap on the face, which he returned with a blow from his stick, but I quickly snatched it from him, and leaving him, I hastened toward Maserata. A carrier who was going to Tolentino took me with him for two paoli, and for six more I might have reached Foglino in a wagon, but unfortunately a wish for economy made me refuse the offer. I felt well, and I thought I could easily walk as far as Valsimare, but I arrived there only after five hours of hard walking, and thoroughly beaten with fatigue. I was strong and healthy, but a walk of five hours was more than I could bear, because in my infancy I had never gone a league on foot. Young people cannot practice too much the art of walking. The next day, refreshed by a good night's rest, and ready to resume my journey, I wanted to pay the innkeeper. But alas, a new misfortune was in store for me. Let the reader imagine my sad position. I recollected that I had forgotten my purse, containing seven sequins, on the table of the inn at Tolentino. What a thunderbolt! I was in despair, but I gave up the idea of going back, as it was very doubtful whether I would find my money. Yet... It contained all I possessed, save a few copper coins I had in my pocket. I paid my small bill, and, deeply grieved at my loss, continued my journey towards Seravo. I was within three miles of that place when, in jumping over a ditch, I sprained my ankle, and was compelled to sit down on one side of the road, and to wait until someone should come to my assistance. In the course of an hour, a peasant happened to pass with his donkey, and he agreed to carry me to Seravol for one paolo. As I wanted to spend as little as possible, the peasant took me to an ill-looking fellow who, for two paoli paid in advance, consented to give me a lodging. I asked him to send for a surgeon, but I did not obtain one until the following morning. I had a wretched supper, after which I lay down in a filthy bed. I was in hope that sleep 
would bring me some relief, but my evil genius was preparing for a night of torments. Three men, armed with guns and looking like banditti, came in shortly after I had gone to bed, speaking in a kind of slang which I could not make out, swearing, raging, and paying no attention to me. They drank and sang until midnight, after which they threw themselves down on bundles of straw brought for them, and my host, who was drunk, came, greatly to my dismay, to lie down near me. Disgusted at the idea of having such a fellow for my bad companion, I refused to let him come, but he answered, with fearful blasphemies, that all the devils in hell could not prevent him from taking possession of his own bed. I was forced to make room for him, and exclaimed, Heavens, where am I? He told me that I was in the house of the most honest constable in all the papal states. Could I possibly have supposed that the peasant would have brought me amongst those accursed enemies of humankind? He laid himself down near me, but the filthy scoundrel soon compelled me to give him, for certain reasons, such a blow in his chest that he rolled out of bed. He picked himself up, and he renewed his beastly attempt. Being well aware that I could not master him without great danger, I got out of bed, thinking myself lucky that he did not oppose my wish, and crawling along as well as I could, found a chair on which I passed the night. At daybreak, my tormentor, caught up by his honest comrades, joined them in drinking and shouting, and the three strangers, taking their guns, departed. Left alone by the departure of the vile rabble, I passed another unpleasant hour, calling in vain for someone. At last a young boy came in. I gave him some money, and he went for a surgeon. The doctor examined my foot, and assured me that three or four days would set me to rights. He advised me to be removed to an inn, and I most willingly followed his counsel. As soon as I was brought to the inn, I went to bed, and was well cared for. But my position was such that I dreaded the moment of my recovery. I feared that I should be compelled to sell my coat to pay the innkeeper and the very thought made me feel ashamed. I began to consider that if I had controlled my sympathy for the young girl so ill-treated by Stefano, I should not have fallen into this sad predicament, and I felt conscious that my sympathy had been a mistake. If I had put up with the faults of the friar, if this and if that, and every other if was conjured up to torment my restless and wretched brain, Yet I must confess that the thoughts which have their origin in misfortune are not without advantage to a young man, for they give him the habit of thinking, and the man who does not think never does anything right. The moment of the fourth day came, and I was able to walk, as the surgeon had predicted. I made up my mind, although reluctantly, to beg the worthy man to sell my great coat for me, a most unpleasant necessity, for rain had begun to fall. I owed fifteen paoli to the innkeeper and four to the surgeon. Just as I was going to proffer my painful request, Brother Stefano made his appearance in my room, and burst into loud laughter, inquiring whether I had forgotten the blow from his stick. I was struck with amazement. I begged the surgeon to leave me with the monk, and he immediately complied. I must ask my readers whether it is possible, in the face of such extraordinary circumstances, not to feel superstitious. What is truly miraculous in this case is the precise minute at which the event took place, for the friar entered the room as the word was hanging on my lips. What surprised me most was the force of providence, of fortune, of chance, 
whatever name is given to it, of that very necessary combination which compelled me to find no hope but in that fatal monk, who had begun to be my protective genius in Chiozza at the moment my distress had likewise commenced. And yet, a singular guardian angel, this Stefano, I felt that the mysterious force which threw me in his hands was a punishment rather than a favor. Nevertheless, he was welcome, because I had no doubt of his relieving me from my difficulties, and whatever be the power that sent him to me, I felt that I could not do better than to submit to its influence. The destiny of that monk was to escort me to Rome. Che va piano va sano, said the friar, as soon as we were alone. He had taken five days to traverse the road over which I had travelled in one day. But he was in good health, and he had met with no misfortune. He told me that, as he was passing, he heard that an abbe, secretary to the Venetian ambassador at Rome, was lying ill at the inn after having been robbed in Bansimara. I came to see you, he added, and as I find you recovered from your illness, we can start again together. I agree to walk six miles every day to please you. Come, let us forget the past, and let us be at once on our way. I cannot go. I have lost my purse, and I owe twenty paoli. I will go, and find the amount in the name of St. Francis. He returned within an hour, but he was accompanied by the infamous constable, who told me that, if I had let him know who I was, he would have been happy to keep me in his house. I will give you, he continued, forty paoli, if you will promise me the protection of your ambassador. But if you do not succeed in obtaining it for me in Rome, you will undertake to repay me, Therefore, you must give me an acknowledgment of the debt. I have no objection. Every arrangement was speedily completed. I received the money, paid my debts, and left Serravol with Stefano. At one o'clock in the afternoon, we saw a wretched-looking house at a short distance from the road, and the friar said, It is a good distance from here to Colifiorito. We had better put up there for the night. It was in vain that I objected. Remonstraining that we were certain of having very poor accommodation, I had to submit to his will. We found a decrepit old man lying on a pallet, two ugly women of thirty or forty, three children entirely naked, a cow, an accursed dog, which barked continually. It was a picture of squalid misery. But the niggardly monk, instead of giving alms to the poor people, asked them to entertain us to supper in the name of St. Francis. You must boil the hen, said the dying man to the females, and bring out of the cellar the bottle of wine, which I have kept now for twenty years. As he uttered those words, he was seized with such a fit of coughing that I thought he would die. The friar went near him, and promised him that, by the grace of St. Francis, he would get young and well. Moved by the sight of such misery, I wanted to continue my journey as far as Colifiorito, and wait there for Stefano. But the women would not let me go, and I remained. After boiling for four hours, the hen set the strongest teeth at defiance, and the bottle which I uncorked proved to be nothing but sour vinegar. Losing patience, I got hold of the monk's batticaslo, and took out of it enough for a plentiful supper, and I saw the two women opening their eyes very wide at the sight of our provisions. We all ate with good appetite, and after our supper, the women made us for two large beds of fresh straw, and we lay down in the dark, 
as the last bit of candle to be found in the miserable dwelling was burnt out. We had not been lying on the straw five minutes, when Stefano called out to me that one of the women had just placed herself near him, and at the same instant the other one takes me in her arms and kisses me. I push her away, and the monk defends himself against the other, but mine, nothing daunted, insists upon laying herself near me. I get up, the dog springs at my neck, and fear compels me to remain quiet on my straw bed. The monk screams, swears, struggles, the dog barks furiously, the old man coughs, all is noise and confusion. At last, Stefano, protected by his heavy garments, shakes off the too loving shrew, and, braving the dog, manages to find his stick. Then he lays about to right and left, striking in every direction. One of the women exclaims, Oh, God! The friar answers, She has her quietus. Calm reigns again in the house. The dog, most likely dead, is silent. The old man, who perhaps has received his death blow, coughs no more. The children sleep, and the women, afraid of the singular caresses of the monk, sheer off into a corner. The remainder of the night passed off quietly. At daybreak I rose. Stefano was likewise soon up. I looked all around, and my surprise was great when I found that the women had gone out, and seeing that the old man gave no sign of life, and had a bruise on his forehead, I showed it to Stefano, remarking that very likely he had killed him. It is possible, he answered, but I have not done it intentionally. Then, taking up his baticulo and finding it empty, he flew into a violent passion. But I was much pleased, for I had been afraid that the women had gone out to get assistance and to have us arrested. And... The robbery of our provisions reassured me, as I felt certain that the poor wretches had gone out of the way so as to secure impunity for their theft. But I laid great stress upon the danger we should run by remaining any longer, and I succeeded in frightening the fire out of the house. We soon met a wagoner going to Foligno. I persuaded Stefano to take the opportunity of putting a good distance between us and the scene of our last adventures. And as we were eating our breakfast at Foligno, we saw another wagon, quite empty, got a lift in it for a trifle, and thus wrote to Pisignano, where a devout person gave us a charitable welcome, and I slept soundly through the night without the dread of being arrested. Early the next day we reached Spoleti, where Brother Stepano had two benefactors, and careful not to give either of them a cause of jealousy, he favoured both. We dined with the first, who entertained us like princes, and we had supper and lodging in the house of the second, a wealthy wine merchant, and the father of a large and delightful family. He gave us a delicious supper, and everything would have gone on pleasantly, had not the friar, already excited by his good dinner, made himself quite drunk. In that state, thinking to please his new host, he began to abuse the other, greatly to my annoyance. He said the wine he had given us to drink was adulterated, and that the man was a thief. I gave him to lie to his face, and called him a scoundrel. The host and his wife pacified me, saying that they were well acquainted with their neighbor, and knew what to think of him. But the monk threw his napkin at my face, and the host took him very quietly by the arm, and put him to bed in a room in which he locked him up. I slept in another room. In the morning I rose early, and was considering 
whether it would not be better to go alone, when the friar, who had slept himself sober, made his appearance, and told me that we ought for the future live together like good friends, and not give way to angry feelings. I followed my destiny once more. We resumed our journey, and at Soma, the innkeeper, a woman of rare beauty, gave us a good dinner, and some excellent Cyprus wine, which the Venetian couriers exchanged with her against delicious truffles found in the vicinity of Soma, which sold for a good price in Venice. I did not leave the handsome innkeeper without losing a part of my heart. It would be difficult to draw a picture of the indignation which overpowered me when, as we were about two miles from Terni, the infamous friar showed me a small bag full of truffles which the scoundrel had stolen from the amiable woman by way of thanks for her generous hospitality. The truffles were worth two sequins at last. In my indignation, I snatched the bag from him, saying that I would certainly return it to his lawful owner. But, as he had not committed the robbery to give himself the pleasure of making restitution, he threw himself upon me, and we came to a regular fight. But victory did not remain long in abeyance. I forced his stick out of his hands, knocked him into a ditch, and went off. On reaching Turney, I wrote a letter of apology to our beautiful hostess of Soma, and sent back the truffles. From Turney, I went on foot to Odricoli, where I only stayed long enough to examine the fine old bridge, and from there I paid four paoli to a wagoner who carried me to Castelnuovo, from which place I walked to Rome. I reached the celebrated city on the 1st of September, at nine in the morning. I must not forget to mention here a rather peculiar circumstance, which, however ridiculous it may be in reality, will place money Chapter 8, Part C of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 2, Cleric in Naples, Chapter 8, Part C An hour after I had left Castelnuovo, the atmosphere being calm and the sky clear, I perceived on my right, and within ten paces of me, a pyramidal flame about two feet long and four or five feet above the ground. This apparition surprised me, because it seemed to accompany me, Anxious to examine it, I endeavored to get nearer to it, but the more I advanced towards it, the further it went from me. It would stop when I stood still, and when the road along which I was traveling happened to be lined with trees, I no longer saw it. But it was sure to reappear as soon as I reached a portion of the road without trees. I several times retraced my steps purposely, but every time I did so, the flame disappeared, and would not show itself again until I proceeded towards Rome. This extraordinary beacon left me when daylight chased darkness from the sky. What a splendid field for ignorant superstition, if there had been any witnesses to that phenomenon, and if I had chanced to make a great name in Rome. History is full of such trifles, and the world is full of people who attach great importance to them, in spite of the so-called light of science. I must candidly confess that, 
Although somewhat versed in physics, the sight of that small meteor gave me singular ideas. But I was prudent enough not to mention the circumstance to anyone. When I reached the ancient capital of the world, I possessed only seven paoli, and consequently I did not loiter about. I paid no attention to the splendid entrance through the gate of the polar trees, which is by mistake pompously called of the people, or to the beautiful square of the same name, or to the portals of the magnificent churches, or to all the stately buildings which generally strike the traveller as he enters the city. I went straight towards Monte Magnanopoli, where, according to the address given to me, I was to find the bishop. There I was informed that he had left Rome ten days before, leaving instructions to send me to Naples free of expense. A coach was to start for Naples the next day, not caring to see Rome. I went to bed until the time for the departure of the coach. I travelled with three low fellows to whom I did not address one word through the whole of the journey. I entered Naples on the sixth day of September. I went immediately to the address which had been given to me in Rome. The bishop was not there. I called at the convent of the Minims, and I found that he had left Naples to proceed to Martorano. I inquired whether he had left any instructions for me, but in vain. No one could give me any information. And there I was, alone in a large city, without a friend, with eight Carlini in my pocket, and not knowing what to do. But never mind. Fate calls me to Martorano, and to Martorano I must go. The distance, after all, is only two hundred miles. I found several drivers starting for Consenza, but when they heard that I had no luggage, they refused to take me unless I paid in advance. They were quite right, but their prudence placed me under the necessity of going on foot. Yet I felt I must reach Martorano, and I made up my mind to walk the distance, begging food and lodging like the very reverend Bar Stefano. First of all, I made a light meal for one-fourth of my money, and having been informed that I had to follow the Salerno road, I went towards Portici, where I arrived in an hour and a half. I already felt rather fatigued. My legs, if not my head, took me to an inn, where I ordered a room and some supper. I was served in good style. My appetite was excellent, and I passed a quiet right in a comfortable bed. In the morning, I told the innkeeper that I would return for my dinner, and went out to visit the royal palace. As I passed through the gate, I was met by a man of prepossessing appearance, dressed in the eastern fashion, who offered to shew me all over the place, saying that I would thus save my money. I was in a position to accept any offer. I thanked him for his kindness. Happening during the conversation to state that I was a Venetian, he told me that he was my subject, since he came from Zante. I acknowledged his polite compliment with a reference. I have, he said, some very excellent muscatel wine, grown in the East, which I could sell you cheap. I might buy some, but I warn you, I am a good judge. So much the better. Which do you prefer? The Serrigo wine. You are right. I have some rare Serrigo muscatel, and we can taste it if you have no objection to dine with me. None whatsoever. I can likewise give you the wines of Samos and Cephalonia. I have also a quantity of minerals, plenty of vitriol, cinnabar, and timony, and one hundred kindles of mercury. Are all these goods here? No, they are in Naples. Here I have only the muscatel wine and the mercury. It is quite naturally, and without any intention to deceive, that a young man accustomed to poverty 
and ashamed of it when he speaks to a rich stranger, boasts of his means, of his fortune. As I was talking with my new acquaintance, I recollected an amalgam of mercury with lead and bismuth, by which the mercury increases one-fourth in weight. I said nothing, but I besought myself that if the mystery should be unknown to the Greek, I might profit by it. I felt that some cunning was necessary, and that he would not care for my secret if I proposed to sell it to him without preparing the way. The best plan was to astonish my man with the miracle of the augmentation of mercury, treat it as a jest, and see what his intentions would be. Cheating is a crime, but honest cunning may be considered as a species of prudence. True, it is a quality which is near akin to roguery, but that cannot be helped, and the man who, in time of need, does not know how to exercise his cunning nobly, is a fool. The Greeks call this sort of wisdom serdaleophion, from the word serdo, fox, and it might be translated by foxdom, if there were such a word in English. After we had visited the place, we returned to the inn, and the Greek took me to his room, in which he ordered the table to be laid for two. In the next room, I saw several large vessels of muscatel wine, and four flagons of mercury, each containing about ten pounds. My plans were laid out, and I asked him to let me have one of the flagons of mercury at the current price, and took it to my room. The Greek went out to attend to his business, reminding me that he expected me to dinner. I went out likewise, and bought two pounds and a half of lead, and an equal quantity of bismuth. The druggist had no more. When I came back to the inn, asked for some large empty bottles, and made the amalgam. We dined very pleasantly, and the Greek was delighted, because I pronounced his serigo excellent. In the course of conversation, he inquired laughingly why I had bought one of his flagons of mercury. "'You can find out, if you come to my room,' I said. After dinner, we repaired to my room, and he found his mercury divided in two vessels. I asked for a piece of chamois, strained the liquid through it, filled his own flagon, and the Greek stood astonished at the sight of the fine mercury, about one-fourth of a flagon, which remained over, with an equal quantity of a powder unknown to him. It was the bismuth. My merry laugh kept company with his astonishment, and calling one of the servants of the inn, I sent him to the druggist to sell the mercury that was left. He returned in a few minutes, and handed me fifteen carlini. The Greek, whose surprise was complete, asked me to give him back his own flagon, which was uh, quite full, and worth sixty carlini. I handed it to him with a smile, thanking him for the opportunity he had afforded me of earning fifteen carlini, and took care to add that I should leave for Salerno early the next morning. "'Then we must have supper tonight this evening,' he said. During the afternoon we took a walk towards Mount Vesuvius. Our conversation went from one subject to another, but no allusion was made to the mercury, though I could see that the Greek had something on his mind. At supper he told me, jestingly, that I ought to stop in Portici the next day to make forty-five carlini out of the three other flagons of mercury. I answered gravely that I did not want the money, and that I had augmented the first flagon only for the sake of procuring him an agreeable surprise. But, he said, you must be very wealthy. No, I am not, because I am in search of the secret of the augmentation of gold, and it is a very expensive study for us. How many are there in your company? Only my uncle and myself. What do you want to augment gold for? The augmentation of mercury 
ought to be enough for you. Pray tell me whether the mercury augmented by you to-day is again susceptible of a similar increase. No, if it were so, it would be an immense source of wealth for us. I am much pleased with your sincerity. Supper over, I paid my bill, and asked the landlord to get me a carriage and pair of horses to take me to Salerno early the next morning. I thanked the Greek for his delicious muscatel wine, and, requesting his address in Naples, I assured him that he would see me within a fortnight, as I was determined to secure a cask of his serigo. We embraced each other, and I retired to bed well pleased with my day's work, and in no way astonished at the Greeks not offering to purchase my secret, for I was certain that he would not sleep for anxiety, and that I should see him early in the next morning. At all events, I had enough money to reach the Tour du Grec, and there Providence would take care of me. Yet it seemed to me very difficult to travel as far as Martorano, begging like a mendicant friar, because my outward appearance did not excite pity. People would feel interested in me only from a conviction that I needed nothing. A very unfortunate conviction, when the object of it is truly poor. As I had foreseen, the Greek was in my room at daybreak. I received him in a friendly way, saying that we could take coffee together. Willingly, but tell me, Brevin Abbe, whether you would feel disposed to sell me your secret. Why not, when we meet in Naples? But why not now? I am expected in Salerno. Besides, I would only sell the secret for a large sum of money and I am not acquainted with you. That does not matter, as I am sufficiently known here to pay you in cash. How much would you want? Two thousand ounces. I agree to pay you that sum, provided that I succeed in making the augmentation myself with such matter as you name to me, which I will purchase. It is impossible, because the necessary ingredients cannot be got here but they are common enough in Naples. If it is any sort of metal, we can get it at the Tour du Grec. We could go there together. Can you tell me what is the expense of the augmentation? One and a half percent. But you are likewise known at the Tour du Grec, for I should not like to lose my time. Your doubts grieve me. Saying which, he took a pen wrote a few words, and handed to me this order. At sight, pay to bearer the sum of fifty gold ounces, on account of Panagioti. He told me that the banker resided within two hundred yards of the inn, and he pressed me to go there myself. I did not stand upon ceremony, but went to the banker, who paid me the amount. I returned to my room, in which he was waiting for me, and placed the gold on the table, saying that we could now proceed together to the Tour du Grec, where we would complete our arrangements after the signature of a deed of agreement. The Greek had his own carriage and horses. He gave orders for them to be got ready, and we left the inn, but he had nobly insisted upon my taking possession of the fifty ounces. When we arrived at the Tour du Grec, he signed a document by which he promised to pay me two thousand ounces as soon as I should have discovered to him the process of augmenting mercury by one-fourth without injuring its quality, the amalgam to be equal to the mercury which I had sold in his present at Portici. He then gave me a bill of exchange payable at sight, in eight days, on Mr. Gennaro de Carlo. I told him that the ingredients were lead and bismuth, the first combining with mercury, and the second giving to the whole the perfect fluidity necessary to strain it through the chamois leather. The Greek went out to try the amalgam. I did not know where, and I dined alone, but toward evening, 
he came back, looking very disconsolate, as I had expected. I have made the amalgam, he said, but the mercury is not perfect. It is equal to that which I have sold in Portici, and that is the very letter of your engagement. But my engagement says likewise, without injury to the quality. You must agree that the quality is injured, because it is no longer susceptible of further augmentation. You knew that to be the case. The point is its equality with the mercury I sold in Portici. But we shall have to go to law, and you will lose. I am sorry the secret should become public. Congratulate yourself, sir, for if you should gain the lawsuit, you will have obtained my secret for nothing. I would never have believed you capable of deceiving me in such a manner. Reverend sir, I can assure you that I would not willingly deceive any one. Do you know the secret, or do you not? Do you suppose I would have given it to you without the agreement we entered into? Well, there will be some fun over this affair in Naples, and the lawyers will make money out of it. But I am much grieved at this turn of affairs, and I am very sorry that I allowed myself to be so easily deceived by your fine talk. In the meantime, here are your fifty ounces." As I was taking the money out of my pocket, frightened to death lest he should accept it, he left the room, saying that he would not have it. He soon returned. We had supper in the same room, but at separate tables. War had been openly declared, but I felt certain that a treaty of peace would soon be signed. We did not exchange one word during the evening, but in the morning... He came to me as I was getting ready to go. I again offered to return the money I received, but he told me to keep it, and proposed to give me fifty ounces more if I would give him back his bill of exchange for two thousand. We began to argue the matter quietly, and after two hours of discussion I gave in. I received fifty ounces more. We dined together like old friends and embraced each other cordially. As I was bidding him adieu, he gave me an order on his house at Naples for a barrel of muscatel wine, and he presented me with a splendid box containing twelve brazers with silver handles, manufactured in the Tour du Grec. We parted, the best friends in the world, and well pleased with each other. I remained two days in Salerno, to provide myself with linen and other necessaries, possessing about one hundred sequins, and enjoying good health, I was very proud of my success, in which I could not see any cause to reproach to myself, for the cunning I had brought into play to ensure the sale of my secret could not be found fault with, except by the most intolerant of moralists, and such men have no authority to speak on matters of business. At all events, free, rich, and certain of presenting myself before the bishop with a respectable appearance, and not like a beggar, I soon recovered my natural spirits, and congratulated myself upon having brought sufficient experience to ensure me against falling a second time an easy prey to a father Corsini, to thieving gamblers, to mercenary women, and particularly to the impudent scoundrels who barefacedly praise so well those they intend to dupe, a species of knaves very common in the world, even amongst people who form what is called good society. I left Salerno with two priests who were going to Consenta, on business, and we traversed the distance of one hundred and forty-two miles in twenty-two hours, the day after my arrival in the capital of Calabria, I took a small carriage and drove to Martorano. During the journey, fixing my eyes upon the famous Mare Ausonum, I felt delighted at finding myself in the middle of Magna Grecia, rendered so celebrated for twenty-four centuries by its connection with Pythagoras. I looked with astonishment 
upon a country renowned for its fertility, and in which, in spite of nature's prodigality, my eyes met everywhere the aspect of terrible misery, the complete absence of that pleasant superfluity which helps man to enjoy life, and the degradation of the inhabitants sparsely scattered on the soil where they ought to be so numerous. I felt ashamed to acknowledge them as originating from the same stock as myself. Such is, however, the terra di lavoro, where labor seems to be execrated, where everything is cheap, where the miserable inhabitants consider that they have made a good bargain when they have found any one disposed to take care of the fruit which the ground supplies almost spontaneously in too great abundance, and for which there is no market. I felt compelled to admit the justice of the Romans who had called them brutes instead of Beutians. The good priest with whom I had been travelling laughed at my dread of the tarantula and of the crassidra, for the disease brought on by the bite of those insects appeared to me more fearful even than a certain disease with which I was already too well acquainted. They assured me that all the stories relating to those creatures were fables. They laughed at the lines which Virgil had devoted to them in the Georgics, as well as at all those I quoted to justify my fears. I found Bishop Bernard de Bernardis occupying a hard chair near an old table on which he was writing. I fell on my knees, as it is customary to do before a prelate, but instead of giving me his blessing, he raised me up from the floor, and, folding me in his arms, embraced me tenderly. He expressed his deep sorrow when I told him that in Naples I had not been able to find any instructions to enable me to join him, but his face lighted up again when I added that I was indebted to no one for money, and that I was in good health. He bade me take a seat, and with a heavy sigh he began to talk of his poverty, and ordered a servant to lay the cloths for three persons. Besides this servant, his lordship's suit consisted of a most devout-looking housekeeper, and of a priest whom I judged to be very ignorant from the few words he uttered during our meal. The house inhabited by his lordship was large, but badly built and poorly kept. The furniture was so miserable that, in order to make up a bed for me in the room adjoining his chamber, the poor bishop had to give up one of his two mattresses. His dinner, not to say any more about it, frightened me, for he was very strict in keeping the rules of his order, and this being a fast day, he did not eat any meat, and the oil was very bad. Nevertheless, Monsignor was an intelligent man, and, what is still better, an honest man. He told me, much to my surprise, that his bishopric, although not one of little importance, brought him only five hundred ducat di regno yearly, and that, unfortunately, he had contracted debts to the amount of six hundred. He added, with a sigh, that his only happiness was to feel himself out of the clutches of the monks, who had persecuted him, and made his life perfectly purgatory for fifteen years. All these confidences caused me sorrow and mortification, because they proved to me not only that I was not in the promised land where a mature could be picked up, but also that I would be a heavy charge for him. I felt that he was grieved himself at the sorry present his patronage seemed likely to prove. I inquired whether he had a good library, whether there were any literary men, or any good society in which one could spend a few agreeable hours. He smiled and answered that throughout his diocese there was not one man who could boast of writing decently, and still less of any taste or knowledge in literature, that there was not a single bookseller, nor any person caring even for the newspapers. But he promised me 
that we would follow our literary tastes together, as soon as he received the books he had ordered from Naples. That was all very well, but was this the place for a young man of eighteen to live in, without a good library, without good society, without emulation and literary intercourse? The good bishop, seeing me full of sad thoughts, and almost astounded at the prospect of the miserable life I should have to lead with him, tried to give me courage by promising to do everything in his power to secure my happiness. The next day, the bishop, having to officiate in his pontifical robes, I had an opportunity of seeing all the clergy, and all the faithful of the diocese, men and women, of whom the cathedral was full. The sight made me resolve at once to leave Martorano. I thought I was gazing upon a troop of brutes, for whom my external appearance was a cause of scandal. How ugly were the women! What a look of stupidity and coarseness in the men! When I returned to the bishop's house, I told the prelate that I did not feel in me the vocation to die within a few months, a martyr in this miserable city. Give me your blessing, I said, and let me go, or rather come with me. I promise you that we shall make a fortune somewhere else. The proposal made him laugh repeatedly during the day. Had he agreed to it, he would not have died two years afterwards in the prime of manhood. The worthy man, feeling how natural was my repugnance, begged me to forgive him for having summoned me to him, and, considering it his duty to send me back to Venice, having no money himself, and not being aware that I had any, he told me that he would give me an introduction to a worthy citizen of Naples, who would lend me sixty ducati di regno, to enable me to reach my native city. I accepted his offer with gratitude, and going to my room, I took out of my trunk the case of fine razors which the Greek had given me, and begged his acceptance of it as a souvenir of me. I had great difficulty in forcing it upon him, for it was worth the sixty ducats, and to conquer his resistance I had to threaten to remain with him if he refused my present. He gave me a very flattering letter of recommendation for the Archbishop of Cosenza, in which he requested him to forward me as far as Naples, without any expense to myself. It was thus I left Martorano, sixty hours after my arrival, pitying the bishop whom I was leaving behind, and who wept as he was pouring heartfelt blessings upon me. The Archbishop of Cosenza, a man of wealth and of intelligence, offered me a room in his palace. During the dinner I made, with an overflowing heart, the eulogy of the Bishop of Martorano. But I railed mercilessly at his diocese, and at the whole of Calabria, in so cutting a manner that I greatly amused the bishop and all his guests, among whom were two ladies, his relatives, who did the honors of the dinner-table. The youngest, however, objected to the satirical style in which I had depicted her country, and declared war against me. But I contrived to obtain peace again by telling her that Calabria would be a delightful country if one-fourth only of its inhabitants were like her. Perhaps it was the idea of proving to me that I had been wrong in my opinion that the archbishop gave on the following day a splendid supper. Costanza is a city in which a gentleman can find plenty of amusement. The nobility are wealthy, the women are pretty, and men generally well informed, because they have been educated in Naples or in Rome. I left Crescenza on the third day with a letter from the archbishop for the far-famed Genovese. I had five travelling companions, whom I judged, from their appearance, to be either pirates or banditti, and I took very good care not to let them see or guess 
that I had a well-filled purse. Likewise, I thought it prudent to go to bed without undressing during the whole journey, an excellent measure of prudence for a young man traveling in that part of the country. I reached Naples on the 16th of September, 1743, and I lost no time in presenting the letter of the Bishop of Martorano. It was addressed to a Mr. Gennaro Polo at St. Anne's, this excellent man, whose duty was only to give me the sum of sixty ducats, insisted, after perusing the bishop's letter, upon receiving me in his house, because he wished me to make the acquaintance of his son, who was a poet like myself. The bishop had represented my poetry as sublime. After the usual ceremonies, I accepted this kind invitation. My trunk was sent for, and I was a guest in the house of Mr. Gennaro Polo. Chapter 9 of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 2, Cleric in Naples. Chapter 9, Part 1. I had no difficulty in answering the various questions which Dr. Gennaro addressed me, but I was surprised and even displeased at the constant peals of laughter with which he received my answers. The piteous description of miserable Calabria and the picture of the sad situation of the Bishop of Martorano appeared to me more likely to call forth tears than to excite hilarity, and, suspecting that some mystification was being played upon me, I was very near getting angry when, becoming more composed, he told me with feeling that I must kindly excuse him, that his laughter was a disease which seemed to be endemic in his family, for one of his uncles died of it. What? I exclaimed. Died of laughing? Yes, this disease, which was not known to Hippocrates, is called Liflati. What do you mean? Does an hypochondriac affection, which causes sadness and lowness in all those who suffer from it, render you cheerful? Yes, because most likely my flatti, instead of influencing the hypochondrium, affects my spleen, which my physician asserts to be the organ of laughter. It is quite a discovery. You are mistaken. It is a very ancient notion, and it is the only function which is ascribed to the spleen in our animal organization. Well, we must discuss the matter at length, for I hope you will remain with us a few weeks. I wish I could, but I must leave Naples tomorrow or the day after. Have you got any money? I rely upon the sixty ducats you have to give me. At these words, his peals of laughter began again, and as he could see that I was annoyed, he said, I am amused at the idea that I can keep you here as long as I like, but be good enough to see my son. He writes pretty verses enough. And truly his son, although only fourteen, was already a great poet. A servant took me to the apartment of the young man, whom I found possessed of a pleasing countenance and engaging manners. He gave me a polite welcome, and begged to be excused if he could not attend to me altogether for the present, as he had to finish a song which he was composing for a relative of the Duchess de Rovino, who was taking the veil at the Comet of St. Clair and the printer was waiting for the manuscript. I told him that his excuse was a very good one, and I offered to assist him. He then read his song, and I found it so full of enthusiasm, and so truly in the style of Guidi, that I advised him to call it an ode, but as I had praised all the truly beautiful passages, I thought I could venture to point out the weak ones, and I replaced them by verses of my own composition. He was delighted and thanked me warmly, inquiring whether I was Apollo. As he was writing his ode, I composed a sonnet on the same subject, and, expressing his admiration for it, he begged me to sign it, and to allow him to send it with his poetry. While I was correcting and recopying my manuscript, 
he went to his father to find out who I was, which made the old man laugh until supper time. In the evening I had the pleasure of seeing that my bed had been prepared in the young man's chamber. Dr. Gennaro's family was composed of this son, and of a daughter unfortunately very plain, and of his wife, and of two elderly devout sisters. Amongst the guests at the supper-table I met several literary men, and the Marquis Galliani, who was at that time annotating Vitruvius. He had a brother, an abbe whose acquaintance I made twenty years after, in Paris, when he was secretary of embassy to Count Cantilana. The next day, at supper, I was presented to the celebrated Genovesi. I had already sent him the letter of the Archbishop of Cosenza. He spoke to me of Apostolo Zeno and of the Abbe Conti. He remarked that it was considered a very venial sin for regular priests to say two masses in one day for the sake of earning two carlini more, but that for the same sin a secular priest would deserve to be burnt at the stake. The nun took the veil on the following day, and Gennaro's ode and my sonnet had the greatest success. A Neapolitan gentleman, whose name was the same as mine, expressed a wish to know me, and, hearing that I resided at the doctor's, he called to congratulate him on the occasion of his feast day, which happened to fall on the day following the ceremony at St. Clair. Don Antonio Casanova, informing me of his name, inquired whether my family was originally from Venice. I am, sir, I answered modestly, the great-grandson of the unfortunate Marco Antonio Casanova, secretary to Cardinal Pompeo Colonna, who died of the plague in Rome in the year 1528, under the pontificate of Clement Seven. The words were scarcely out of my lips when he embraced me, calling me his cousin, but we all thought that Dr. Gennaro would actually die with laughter, for it seemed impossible to laugh so immoderately with risk of life. Madame Gennaro was very angry and told my newly found cousin that he might have avoided enacting such a scene before her husband, knowing his disease, but he answered that he never thought the circumstance likely to provoke mirth. I said nothing, for, in reality, I felt that the recognition was very comic. Our poor laughter having recovered his composure, Casanova, who had remained very serious, invited me to dinner for the next day with my young friend Paul Gennaro, who had already become my alter ego. When we called at his house, my worthy cousin showed me his family tree, beginning with a Don Francisco, brother of Don Juan. In my pedigree, which I knew by heart, Don Juan, my direct ancestor, was a posthumous child. It was possible that there might have been a brother of Marco Antonio's, but when he heard that my genealogy began with Don Francisco from Aragon, who had lived in the fourteenth century, and that consequently all the pedigree of the illustrious house of the Casanovas of Zaragoza belonged to him, his joy knew no bounds. He did not know what to do to convince me that the same blood was flowing in his veins and in mine. He expressed some curiosity to know what lucky accident had brought me to Naples. I told him that, having embraced the ecclesiastical profession, I was going to Rome to seek my fortune. He then presented me to his family, and I thought that I could read on the countenance of my cousin, his dearly beloved wife, that she was not much pleased with the newly found relationship, but his pretty daughter and a still prettier niece of his might very easily have given me faith in the doctrine that blood is thicker than water, however fabulous it may be. After dinner, Don Antonio informed me that the Duchess de Bovino had expressed a wish to know the Abbe Casanova, who had written the sonnet in honor of her relative, and that he would be very happy to introduce me to her as his own cousin. As we were alone at that moment, I begged he would not insist on presenting me, as I was only provided with traveling suits and had to be careful of my purse so as not to arrive in Rome without money. Delighted at my confidence and approving my economy, he said, I am rich, and you must not scruple to come with me to my tailor. And he accompanied his offer with an assurance that the circumstance would not be known to anyone, and that he would feel deeply mortified if I denied him the pleasure of serving me. I shook him warmly by the hand, and answered that I was ready to do anything he pleased. We went to a tailor who took my measure, and who brought me on the following day everything necessary to the toilet of the most elegant abbey. Don Antonio called on me and remained to dine with Don Gennaro, after which he took me and my friend Paul to the Duchess. 
This lady, according to the Neapolitan fashion, called me thou in her very first compliment of welcome. Her daughter, then only ten or twelve years old, and a few years later became Duchess de Matalona. The Duchess presented me with a snuff-box in pale tortoiseshell, with arabesque and crustaceans in gold, and she invited us to dine with her on the morrow, promising to take us after dinner to the convent of St. Clair to pay a visit to the new nun. As we came out of the palace of the Duchess, I left my friends and went alone to Panagiotti's to claim the barrel of muscatel wine. The manager was kind enough to have the barrel divided into two smaller casks of equal capacity, and I sent one to Don Antonio and the other to Don Gennaro. As I was leaving the shop, I met the worthy Panagiotti, who was glad to see me. Was I to blush at the sight of the good man I had at first deceived? No, for in his opinion I had acted very nobly towards him. Don Gennaro, as I returned home, managed to thank me for my handsome present without laughing, and the next day Don Antonio, to make up for the muscatel wine I had sent him, offered me a gold-headed cane worth at least fifteen ounces, and his tailor brought me a travelling suit and a blue great coat with the buttonholes and gold lace. I therefore found myself splendidly equipped. At the Duchess de Bovino's dinner I made the acquaintance of the wisest and most learned man in Naples, the illustrious Don Lelio Caraffa, who belonged to the ducal family of Matalona, and whom King Carlos honored with the title of friend. I spent two delightful hours in the convent parlor, coping successfully with the curiosity of all the nuns who were pressing against the grating. Had destiny allowed me to remain in Naples, my fortune would have been made. But, although I had no fixed plan, the voice of fate summoned me to Rome, and therefore I resisted all the entreaties of my cousin Antonio to accept the honorable position of tutor in several houses of the highest order. Don Antonio gave a splendid dinner in my honor, but he was annoyed and angry because he saw that his wife looked daggers at her new cousin. I thought that, more than once, she cast a glance at my new costume and then whispered to the guest next to her. Very likely she knew what had taken place. There are some positions in life to which I could never be reconciled. If, in the most brilliant circle, there is one person who affects to stare at me, I lose all presence of mind. Self-dignity feels outraged. My wit dies away, and I play the part of adult. It is a weakness on my part, but a weakness I cannot overcome. Don Lelio Caraffa offered me a very liberal salary if I would undertake the education of his nephew, the Duke de Matalona, then ten years of age. I expressed my gratitude and begged him to be my true benefactor in a different manner, namely by giving me a few good letters of introduction for Rome, a favor which he granted at once. He gave me one for Cardinal Acquaviva and another for Father Giorgi. I found out that the interest felt towards me by my friends had induced them to obtain for me the honor of kissing the hand of Her Majesty the Queen, and I hastened my preparations to leave Naples, for the Queen would certainly have asked me some questions, and I could not have avoided telling her that I had just left Martorano and the poor bishop whom she had sent there. The Queen likewise knew my mother. She would very likely have alluded to my mother's profession in Dresden, it would have mortified Don Antonio, and my pedigree would have been covered with ridicule. I knew the force of prejudice. I should have been ruined, and I felt I should do well to withdraw in good time. As I took leave of him, Don Antonio presented me with a fine gold watch, and gave me a letter for Don Gaspar Vivaldi, whom he called his best friend. Don Gennaro paid me the sixty ducats, and his son, swearing eternal friendship, asked me to write to him. They all accompanied me to the coach, blending their tears with mine, and loading me with good wishes and blessings. From my landing in Chiozza up to my arrival in Naples, fortune had seemed bent upon frowning on me. In Naples it began to shew itself less adverse, and on my return to that city it entirely smiled upon me. Naples has always been a fortunate place for me, as the reader of my memoirs will discover. My readers must not forget that in Pochi I was on the point of disgracing myself, and there is no remedy against the degradation of the mind, for nothing can restore it to its former standard. It is a case of disheartening atony for which there is no possible cure. 
I was not ungrateful to the good bishop of Martorano, for if he had unwittingly injured me by summoning me to his diocese, I felt that to his letter from Mr. Naro I was indebted for all the good fortune which had just befallen me. I wrote to him from Rome. I was wholly engaged in drying my tears as we were driving through the beautiful street of Toledo, and it was only after we had left Naples that I could find time to examine the countenance of my traveling companions. Next to me I saw a man of from forty to fifty, with a pleasing face and a lively air, but opposite to me two charming faces delighted my eyes. They belonged to two ladies, young and pretty, very well dressed, with a look of candor and modesty. This discovery was most agreeable, but I felt sad and I wanted calm and silence. We reached Avesa without one word being exchanged, and as the Vetturino stopped there only to water his mules, we did not get out of the coach. From Avesa to Capua, my companions conversed almost without interruption, and, wonderful to relate, I did not open my lips once. I was amused by the Neapolitan jargon of the gentlemen, and by the pretty accent of the ladies, who were evidently Romans. It was a most wonderful feat for me to remain five hours before two charming women without addressing one word to them, without paying them one compliment. At Capua, where we were to spend the night, we put up at an inn, and we were shown into a room with two beds, a very usual thing in Italy. The Neapolitan, addressing himself to me, said, Am I to have the honor of sleeping with the reverend gentleman? I answered in a very serious tone that it was for him to choose or to arrange it otherwise if he liked. The answer made the two ladies smile, particularly the one whom I preferred, and it seemed to me a good omen. We were five at supper, for it is usual for the Vitturino to supply his travelers with their meals, unless some private agreement is made otherwise and to sit down at table with them. In the desultory talk which went on during the supper, I found in my traveling companions decorum, propriety, wit, and the manners of persons accustomed to good society. I became curious to know who they were, and going down with the driver after supper, I asked him. The gentleman, he told me, is an advocate, and one of the ladies is his wife, but I do not know which of the two. I went back to our room, and I was polite enough to go to bed first, in order to make it easier for the ladies to undress themselves with freedom. I likewise got up first in the morning, left the room, and only returned when I was called for breakfast. The coffee was delicious. I praised it highly, and the lady, the one who was my favorite, promised that I should have the same every morning during our journey. The barber came in after breakfast. The advocate was shaved and the barber offered me his services, which I declined, but the rogue declared that it was slovenly to wear one's beard. When we had resumed our seats in the coach, the advocate made some remark upon the impudence of barbers in general. But we ought to decide first, said the lady, whether or not it is slovenly to go bearded. Of course it is, said the advocate. Beard is nothing but a dirty excrescence. You may think so, I answered, but everybody does not share your opinion. Do we consider as a dirty expression the hair of which we take so much care, and which is of the same nature as the beard? Far from it. We admire the length and the beauty of the hair. Then, remarked the lady, the barber is a fool. But after all, I asked, have I any beard? I thought you had, she answered. In that case, I will begin to shave as soon as I reach Rome, for this is the first time that I have been convicted of having a beard. "'My dear wife,' exclaimed the advocate, "'you should have held your tongue. "'Perhaps the Reverend Abbe is going to Rome "'with the intention of becoming a Capuchin friar.' "'The pleasantry made me laugh, "'but unwilling that he should have the last word. "'I answered that he had guessed rightly, "'that such had been my intention, "'but that I had entirely altered my mind "'since I had seen his wife. "'Oh, you are wrong,' said the joyous Neapolitan. For my wife is very fond of capuchins, and if you wish to please her, you had better follow your original vocation. Our conversation continued in the same tone of pleasantry, and the day passed off in an agreeable manner. In the evening we had a very poor supper at Garrelin, but we made up for it by cheerfulness and witty conversation. My dawning inclination for the advocate's wife borrowed strength from the affectionate manner she displayed towards me. 
The next day she asked me, after we had resumed our journey, whether I intended to make a long stay in Rome before returning to Venice. I answered that, having no acquaintances in Rome, I was afraid my life there might be very dull. Strangers are liked in Rome, she said. I feel certain that you will be pleased with your residence in that city. May I hope, madam, that you will allow me to pay you my respects? We shall be honored by your calling on us, said the advocate. My eyes were fixed upon his charming wife. She blushed, but I did not appear to notice it. I kept up the conversation, and the day passed as pleasantly as the previous one. We stopped at Terracina, where they gave us a room with three beds, two single beds, and a larger one between the two others. It was natural that the two sisters should take the large bed. They did so, and undressed themselves while the advocate and I went on talking at the table, with our backs turned to them. As soon as they had gone to rest, the advocate took the bed on which he found his nightcap, and I the other, which was only about one foot distant from the large bed. I remarked that the lady by whom I was captivated was on the side nearest my couch, and, without much vanity, I could suppose that it was not owing only to chance. I put the light out and laid down, revolving in my mind a project which I could not abandon and yet durst not execute. In vain did I court sleep. A very faint light enabled me to perceive the bed in which the pretty woman was lying, and my eyes would, in spite of myself, remain open. It would be difficult to guess what I might have done at last. I had already fought a hard battle with myself for more than an hour. When I saw her rise, get out of her bed, and go and lay herself down near her husband, who, most likely, did not wake up, and continued to sleep in peace, for I did not hear any noise. Vexed, disgusted, I tried to compose myself to sleep, and I woke only at daybreak. Seeing the beautiful wandering star in her own bed, I got up, dressed myself in haste, and went out, leaving all my companions fast asleep. I returned to the inn only at the time fixed for our departure, and I found the advocate and the two ladies already in the coach, waiting for me. The lady complained, in a very obliging manner, of my not having cared for her coffee. I pleaded as an excuse a desire for an early walk, and I took care not to honor her even with a look. I feigned to be suffering from the toothache, and remained in my corner, dull and silent. At Piperno she managed to whisper to me that my toothache was all sham. I was pleased with the reproach, because it heralded an explanation which I craved for, in spite of my vexation. I was morose and silent until we reached Serinoneta, where we were to pass the night. We arrived early, and the weather being fine, the lady said that she could enjoy a walk, and asked me politely to offer her my arm. I did so, for it would have been rude to refuse. Besides, I had had enough of my sulking fit. An explanation could alone bring matters back to their original standing, but I did not know how to force it upon the lady. Her husband followed us at some distance with the sister. When we were far enough in advance, I ventured to ask her why she had supposed my toothache to have been feigned. I am very candid, she said. It is because the difference in your manner was so marked, and because you were so careful to avoid looking at me through the whole day. A toothache would not have prevented you from being polite, and therefore I thought it had been feigned for some purpose. But I am certain that not one of us can possibly have given you any grounds for such a rapid change in your manner. Yet something must have caused the change, and you, madam, are only half sincere. You are mistaken, sir. I am entirely sincere. If I have given you any motive for anger, I am and must remain ignorant of it. Be good enough to tell me what I have done. Nothing, for I have no right to complain. Yes, you have. You have a right. The same that I have myself. The right which good society grants to every one of its members. Speak, and show yourself as sincere as I am. You are certainly bound not to know, or to pretend not to know the real cause, but you must acknowledge that my duty is to remain silent. Very well. Now it is all over. But your duty bids you to conceal the cause of your bad humor. It also bids you not to show it. Delicacy sometimes enforces upon a polite gentleman the necessity of concealing certain feelings, which might implicate either himself or others. It is a restraint for the mind, I confess. 
but it has some advantage when its effect is to render more amiable the man who forces himself to accept that restraint. Her close argument made me blush for shame, and carrying her beautiful hand to my lips, I confessed myself in the wrong. You would see me at your feet, I exclaimed, in token of my repentance, were I not afraid of injuring you. Do not let us allude to the matter any more, she answered. And pleased with my repentance, she gave me a look so excessive of forgiveness that, without being afraid of augmenting my guilt, I took my lips off her hand, and I raised them to her half-open, smiling mouth. Intoxicated with rapture, I passed so rapidly from a state of sadness to one of overwhelming cheerfulness, that during our supper the advocate enjoyed a thousand jokes upon my toothache, so quickly cured by the simple remedy of a walk. On the following day we dined at Velletri and slept in Marino, where, although the town was full of troops, we had two small rooms and a good supper. I could not have been on better terms with my charming Roman, for, although I had received but a rapid proof of our regard, it had been such a true one, such a tender one. In the coach our eyes could not say much, but I was opposite to her, and our feet spoke a very eloquent language. The advocate had told me that he was going to Rome on some ecclesiastical business, and that he intended to reside in the house of mother-in-law, whom his wife had not seen since her marriage two years ago, and her sister hoped to remain in Rome, where she expected to marry a clerk at the Spirito Santo Bank. He gave me their address, with a pressing invitation to call upon them, and I promised to devote all my spare time to them. We were enjoying our dessert when my beautiful lady love, admiring my snuff-box, told her husband that she wished she had one like it. I will buy you one, dear. Then buy mine, I said. I will let you have it for twenty ounces, and you can give me a note of hand payable to bearer in payment. I owe that amount to an Englishman, and I will give it him to redeem my debt. Your snuff-box, my dear Abby, is worth twenty ounces, but I cannot buy it unless you agree to receive payment in cash. I should be delighted to see it in my wife's possession, and she would keep it as a remembrance of you. His wife, thinking that I would not accept his offer, said that she had no objection to give me the note of hand. But, exclaimed the advocate, can you not guess the Englishman exists only in our friend's imagination? He would never enter an appearance, and we would have the snuff-box for nothing. Do not trust the abbey, my dear. He is a great cheat." I had no idea, answered his wife, looking at me, that the world contained rogues of this species. I affected a melancholy air, and said that I only wished myself rich enough to be often guilty of such cheating. When a man is in love, very little is enough to throw him into despair, and as little to enhance his joy to the utmost. There was but one bed in the room where supper had been served, and another in a small closet leading out of the room, but without a door. The ladies chose the closet, and the advocate retired to rest before me. I bid the ladies good night as soon as they had gone to bed. I looked at my dear mistress, and after undressing myself I went to bed, intending not to sleep through the night. But the reader may imagine my rage when I found, as I got into the bed, that it creaked loud enough to wake the dead. I waited, however, quite motionless until my companion should be fast asleep, and as soon as his snoring told me that he was entirely under the influence of Morpheus, I tried to slip out of the bed. But the infernal creaking which took place whenever I moved woke my companion, who felt about with his hand, and, finding me near him, went to sleep again. Half an hour after, I tried a second time, but with the same result. I had to give up in despair. Love is the most cunning of gods. In the midst of obstacles, he seems to be in his own element. But as his very existence depends upon the enjoyment of those who ardently worship him, the shrewd, all-seeing, little blind God contrives to bring success out of the most desperate case. I had given up all hope for the night, and had nearly gone to sleep, when suddenly we hear a dreadful noise. Guns are fired in the street, people screaming and howling are running up and down the stairs. At last there is loud knocking at our door. The advocate, frightened out of his slumbers, asks me what it can all mean. I pretend to be very indifferent and beg to be allowed to sleep. But the ladies are trembling with fear and loudly calling for a light. I remain very quiet, 
The advocate jumps out of bed and runs out of the room to obtain a candle. I rise at once. I follow him to shut the door, but I slam it rather too hard. The double spring of the lock gives way, and the door cannot be reopened without the key. I approach the ladies in order to calm their anxiety, telling them that the advocate would soon return with light, and that we should then know the cause of the tumult. But I am not losing my time, and I am at work while I am speaking. I meet with very little opposition, but, leaning rather too heavily upon my fair lady, I break through the bottom of the bedstead, and we suddenly find ourselves, the two ladies and myself, all together in a heap on the floor. The advocate comes back and knocks at the door. The sister gets up. I obey the prayers of my charming friend, and, feeling my way, reach the door, and tell the advocate that I cannot open it, and that he must get the key. The two sisters are behind me. I extend my hand, but I am abruptly repulsed, and judge that I have addressed myself to the wrong quarter. I go to the other side, and there I am better received. But the husband returns. The noise of the key in the lock announces the door is going to be opened, and we return to our respective beds. The advocate hurries to the bed of the two frightened ladies, thinking of relieving their anxiety. But when he sees them buried in their broken-down bedstead, he bursts into a loud laugh. He tells me to come and have a look at them, but I am very modest and decline the invitation. He then tells us that the alarm has been caused by a German detachment attacking suddenly the Spanish troops in the city, and that the Spaniards are running away. In a quarter of an hour the noise has ceased, and quiet is entirely re-established. The advocate complimented me upon my coolness, got into bed again, and was soon asleep. As for me, I was careful not to close my eyes, and as soon as I saw daylight, I got up in order to perform certain ablutions and to change my shirt. It was an absolute necessity. I returned for breakfast, and while we were drinking the delicious coffee which Donna Lucrezia had made, as I thought, better than ever, I remarked that her sister frowned on me. But how little I cared for her anger when I saw the cheerful, happy countenance and the approving looks of my adored Lucreta. I felt a delightful sensation run through the whole of my body. End of chapter 9